Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Hi, Moisey. Hi, good morning. Oh, yeah, good morning. Sorry, we're coordinating uh, to, to see who is missing or not. <laughs> no worries. How are you? Um, excited. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you so much for being with us today. Yeah, it, it, Hi, Miss. Uh, how are you? Hi, good morning. It's really nice to good see morning. you. Good <laughs> morning. Yeah, we're getting ready. Yeah, I'm just wondering that, can you see me or not? No, because, not we can see okay. yet. Yeah, because I tried to turn on my camera, but because of unknown reasons, it's just not let me to do that, but I will figure it out okay. in the meantime. <laughs> All right. The joys of a uh, virtual, uh, you know, <laughs> of digital world. <laughs> yeah. Unless if we have to, can we? No, I think it has to do with your laptop. Yeah, to, to be honest, it says that I'm unable to start a video because of the host not let me ah. to do that. Yeah, you need to give okay, let me check that. Yeah, let me check that. Uh, let me check that. Uh... Oh. Ah, you never got a last novel, son, and D. Oh, cut it, you got it, you Όντως, όλοι οι κοινές έχουν πει. Ακούγεσαι. Σωστά, λοιπόν. Uh, I can't figure it out, Emese, but I made you a co-host, so you can uh, open your camera. Okay, thank you. Yes, hey. <laughs> <laughs> it works. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Technology sometimes works. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> okay. Hi, how are you? Good to see you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's my pleasure to be with you today. All right. Okay, people are joining, so we could start in about uh, five, six minutes. Yeah. And it, may I have a question? Yes, yeah. of course. Thank you. Uh, so the first uh, speaker will be the Little Architecture Lab, right? So I will be the second presenter. Yes. I'm right. <clears throat> yeah, this is old.
Uh, good morning, everyone. I think uh, we're ready to start. Um, welcome to the Echo Week Hybrid Event in Aegina, History, Tourism, Sustainable Design, aiming towards sustainability vision in practice. We hope you're all safe and healthy. Echo Week returns to the place of its birth and celebrates its 15 years of activity, of sustainability, promotion of sustainable living and design based, in, based on circular models. At the same time, Echo Week joins national celebrations of the, of the 200th year anniversary of the establishment of the modern Greek state, with Aegina as its first capital. Echo Week joined with the sustainability message, the past meeting, a sustainable future. After a series of online events due to the pandemic, today we are opening our very first hybrid event. The program is rich and aimed to deliver a high quality and tangible results to the island. Online lectures and sustainable design workshops and in situ activities in Aegina will explore the historical context and combine innovative and traditional design techniques and methodologies in an attempt to put Aegina Island in the map of the sustainable touristic destinations, while at the same time will seek to empower the local community. Place making, destination assessment, materiality, parametric design, circular economy are few of the topics that will be discussed among our expert panels and tutors who join the forces with us from different parts of the world. By the end of the day, instruction will be given regarding the workshops that will take place the rest of the week. We're very glad to have you all on board and I want to thank you all for joining us today. I want to thank our amazing speakers and workshop leaders. I want to thank our partners for the successful collaboration and our media partners who helped to get the word out. I want to thank our fantastic team, Pablo, Seleni, Spiros, Vicky, Jenny, Thanos, Panagiotas, Spiros, Maria Irini, Maria Efi, Georgis, and our past team members, Sofia, Navsika, Theodora, and Dina, who helped uh, throughout the process. And of course, Elias for the amazing collaboration, their enthusiasm and ideas, and for their patience throughout this organization who lasted for, I think, more than a year, and faced many difficulties due to the global situation. Most importantly, I would like to thank Elias for the amazing collaboration the past eight years, and in some cases, under really hard circumstances, for the trust he put on me and the team, and all the guidance and valuable lessons he taught us, and of course, his vision and dream uh, to start a week here in Aegina 15 years ago. I now am delighted to give the microphone to Elias Messinas. Elias, besides being the creator of Echo Week, he's a practicing architect and urban planner expert in public participation processes, and a senior lecturer who teaches architecture and design in Israel and Greece. Elias is the editor of the Echo Week catalog and book, in addition to books and numerous articles, and the driving force of 15 years of Echo Week around the world. Elias, the microphone is yours. Thank you very much and enjoy this event. Thank you, Vespina. <clears throat> Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> Thank you, Despina. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. And good afternoon to our friends from China. Uh, I know it's late for you. It's later than it's for us, but uh, we hope that you have a great uh, uh, attendance and a great uh, um, experience uh, joining us today. Uh, I would like to thank, first of all, Despina for the introduction. And uh, I would like to also introduce Despina because uh, Despina didn't introduce herself. So Despina is a landscape architect. She's based in London and she's an associate with Echo Week for over a decade. Despina coordinates the Echo Week online team and has organized a lot of uh, design activities, workshops, uh, both online and on site. And uh, uh, in Greece, in Italy, Netherlands and other places. And I would like uh, really to thank also uh, Despina for the collaboration for almost a decade. And, uh, and to join Despina also to thank our, uh, our partners uh, who uh, support this event, uh, to thank our speakers, our amazing speakers, our amazing workshop leaders, um, and also to thank the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the ministries that have given their, their auspices for the event, like the Ministry of uh, Culture, the Ministry of Tourism, Ministry of, uh, of uh, Shipping, and the Ministry of uh, Agriculture and also, of course, the municipality of Egina. Uh, I would like to uh, also join the Espina to welcome you all, to thank you for joining, 
and uh, and uh, we hope we'll have a great week again this year although it's a really strange arrangement where we are both online and on site in Egina and and uh, it's the first time we're trying this kind of model usually we're, we're either physical or online so this is the first time and it's really after 15 years of experience it's it's really a, a refreshing uh, change to to see where the limits are um this year it's a, it's a very special year uh, echo week like uh, this been said is marking 15 years of activity and uh, we're also marking uh, uh, 15 years of activity starting from egina and we're joining egina this year to celebrate with egina the 200 years of uh, from greek in greek independence uh, where egina as probably not everybody knows egina was the first capital of modern greece just before Navplio and before Athens. So it's uh, it's great to be back to Egina to celebrate this very special event, this very special occasion, but also a special occasion for us. Uh, this week we'll uh, discuss and develop sustainable design ideas and solutions, and uh, we will really have Egina as the base so that we can speak about tourism, about sustainable practices, about sustainable design, so that the ideas that we will develop will go back to Egina, and uh, we hope that the, uh, either the individuals or professionals or the municipality would like to adopt and implement. Um, every year we, we ask ourselves, why, why do we have to uh, uh, do another Echo Week? Oops. For some reason, I'm not getting a response. Okay. Why do, we, why, why do we have to do egg, uh, again a neck week this year? Unfortunately, again this year, the fires have left a very painful mark all over Greece, uh, mostly in Evia, in Attica, in Peloponnese, but also in other parts of the country. We all understand by now that by burning fossil fuels, we have changed the balance of the atmosphere. And this, really cha and this change has led to extreme weather events. But the problem is, when these weather events start to happen more often and become more extreme, uh, the problem is when they start to take place closer where we live. So uh, this year we had, uh, before the fires, we saw destructive uh, floods and we saw fires and we saw really changes that take place not only in, in, uh, in remote areas uh, of the world, but actually very close to our neighborhood. Uh, so it should not be a surprise to us that uh, things are happening here because we also, as Greeks in Greece, we have affected the weather. How? Well, with our lifestyle, with air conditioners, with the use of the private car, with the use of disposable plastics, with the relentless production of dump and dumping of garbage. And eventually we have uh, affected nature and the nature really reacts at some point. Nature's react can be extremely destructive. Um, destruction in nature can take uh, that, that we cause as human beings and uh, and as people who live and work and and function and travel on the earth can take place in a big scale, but it can also take place in very small scale. And I'm talking about plastics at sea and about microplastics. The problem with plastics is that when we throw it away. Uh, even if we put it in the right bin, in the right place, it doesn't always reach, reach a factory to become new plastics. Very often plastics uh, may, may be shipped to other countries. Our Chinese friends know that uh, their, their, their country has been the recipient of the world's plastics for many years. And only it's about a year now or a year and a half that China said to the world, enough, I'm not taking your plastics anymore. So the plastics are now traveling to Malaysia, to Africa, to India, to different countries where the governments are willing to accept it for, of course, for a fee. But the problem is that the plastics don't reach uh, uh, organized factories. They usually reach uh, villages. They reach uh, uh, natural areas where they flood them with plastics. The problem with plastics is that uh, it's, it doesn't really just stay there. Animals, birds, fish, and it's also the fish that we eat, uh, eat the plastic, and they it can cause a lot of damage and a lot of destruction. Um, you can see the plastic on the beach. 
I mean, you can see the waves bringing out the plastics to where you go to enjoy the sea. And it can be in the form of uh, straws, of pieces of plastic, of bags, cups, different things that with time, they break up into smaller pieces. Uh, unfortunately, this year I, I took pictures of our shores in Egina. And if you notice very closely, the little dots, the little white dots are actually pieces, little small pieces of, of uh, uh, insulating material, uh, which has broken up into very small pieces and now uh, it has dispersed all over the sea. So when the fish find it, they may think that it's food. So they're going to bite it and eat it. And the problem is that the, the food chain is directly connected with uh, pollution, directly connected with plastics. Calimera. Calimera, se sacume. And, um, okay. and, um, and uh, it's directly uh, connected also to the uh, food chain of human beings. We, we buy a fish, eat fish, a small fish eats plastics or eat uh, pollution. And then when the fish reach the fish market and we put them on our plate, the pollution actually ends up in our plate. And that's pretty scary and pretty... Um, disturbing and should worry us very much. Now, what do we do? Basically, we have to be informed, we have to be active. Sometimes we have to come out of our uh, safety zone or our uh, comfort zone to be active, to, to respond, to, to speak out, okay? Uh, and then we can also do things uh, with other organizations or, or with our community so that our voice is amplified and it's better heard. Uh, what happens during COVID, uh, despite, you know, besides all the, 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 the difficulty and the, the people getting sick and people dying and being to the hospital and suffering, it also taught us that uh, we can respond to crisis and we can find creative solution to make this response also uh, cultural and also fun sometimes, even, even though we are isolated in our own home. Uh, it also shows us that we can change our lifestyle if we have to uh, in order to uh, respond to crisis. And these are good uh, things because it shows that us human beings, we can still respond to crisis. And climate change is a crisis and we have to respond. How? Well, there are things we can do which can be fun and sometimes they're more fun than using a car. When you use your bike, it can be more fun. It can be a family thing. Uh, it can be exercise. You can deal with health problems when you exercise. So, so using a bike is not only good for the city and for the environment, it's also good for our health. So, so it's really better to ride a bike than drive a car. Uh, we can uh, compost our waste. We don't have to throw our waste, your organic waste into the garbage bin, but actually put it into a composter in our garden and it will become a fertilizer for our crops, for our garden, for anything. We can also uh, insulate our home. Instead of using an air conditioner, we can use a, a ceiling vent so we don't have to uh, consume a lot of energy to make our home uh, a more uh, um, uh, comfort uh, uh, space to live. And we can take responsibility. I like to show this picture. These are my daughters and their friends and their nieces. and. Many summers, uh, even today, we spend a day or more uh, collecting waste from the from the sea. Where we where we swim, we collect the waste so that the sea is clean not only for us but also for the fish. And and then of course the fish we buy at the fish market and we eat it. So we want to make sure that the fish is healthy and clean. Um, so there's a lot of things we can do, and there's a lot of things we can discuss about, and there's a lot of things we can do as designers and as architects, as professionals in business and economics and in design and in graphics and anything. We can really take our profession and become uh, advocates of, of, uh, of good practices for, uh, to, to, to address climate change. And this is what we'll discuss today, and this is what we'll be doing the whole week. Today, we will speak about group practices, about sustainable design, about in innovation, and about social design. We will speak about solutions, and, uh, and starting tomorrow, we will also develop ideas and solutions 
during the Echo Week workshops. Before we move on to the first panel, and uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, amazing speakers today and a lot of great uh, uh, lectures to hear, uh, I would like to uh, introduce very shortly Echo Week to those of you who don't uh, know us very well. Uh, so I would like to give you a very short uh, introduction about what Echo Week is. Uh, first of all, Echo Week is an NGO. It's an international uh, nonprofit organization with a passion to change people's habits, the mission to raise environmental awareness and to promote the principles of sustainability, environmental and social through design. Echo Week was founded in Greece, in Egina, actually, in 2005. And uh, we have developed events in 17 countries around the world and a big network of 56 countries. Uh, these are some pictures of our activities, of our workshops. <clears throat> uh, we we uh, have developed a model of uh, sustainable design workshops, which is the main activity. People work together <clears throat> in collaborative formats. And we also do public participation of the stakeholders, which could be kids, which could be professionals, could be the local community. But these are the people who can give us ideas about the place that they know best how to make it better. Also, we, <clears throat> we make the design workshop, uh, uh, although it's short in time, it's only five days, but we make it in a scale that we can also collect materials and build things. So during the Echo Week workshops, we design and construct things and uh, uh, fix, uh, redesign schoolyards, <clears throat> public space, uh, hospital gardens, different sites, different countries, different cities. Each place has a different uh, reality. This is a park in, uh, in Kosovo where we designed uh, and built a tree house. Uh, these are outdoor libraries in Israel, in Holon. <clears throat> this is a park bench in London built of newspapers. Um, this is a structure for bicycles in, uh, in Rome with uh, wood that was recycled and reused. Another park in Rome many, many different sites, many different projects. And we uh, have published all this in catalogs, in books, in, in uh, different formats so that all this information can become available and can inspire others to, to also use uh, materials which are not uh, bought or conventional, like wood, pallets, uh, newspapers, plastics, and more. Our first book was uh, published in 2016. It's called 50 Voices for Sustainability. And it features architects and designers such as Ken Gokuma, Bjarke Ingels, Francis Kerr, and others who share their work, their ideas, their, their methodologies, and inspire uh, others to uh, explore sustainable design. Our new book, which is uh, edited by Despin and myself, it's entitled 50 road, 15 Roads to Sustainability from Innovation to Social Design and will be released uh, before the end of this year. We would like to thank Galenica, which is for its general support, generous support of the book. You're welcome to uh, visit our website, echoweek.org, and uh, to join, of course, our events, to know more of what we do and also to get more of the content of what we offer, which, because the content is important, not the organization. So thank you very much for joining. And I would like to uh, move on now to introduce our first panel speakers. Um, throughout the lectures, you're welcome to uh, share your questions, comments, uh, remarks in the chat, and we will address them during the, the discussion because uh, we will uh, have uh, a nice uh, discussion also with our speakers. Not only they will give an, a brief introduction, but we will also have uh, questions and discussions. So you're welcome to join into this discussion with your own questions. So feel free to uh, use the chat to uh, share your questions. Okay, so let's start with our first speakers, uh, Little Architecture. Um, Maria Anastasiadou and Eli Petridi, you're welcome to open your uh, screen. If you cannot, I will make you co-hosts so you can do that. Good morning, okay. can you hear us? Good morning, we can hear you. 
now you can also turn on your camera. Hi. Hi. <laughs> now we can see you as well. How are you? Fine, thank you. Um, okay, I think we can share. Uh, before you share, yeah. I will uh, give a short introduction about you so people know who you are and what you do. And then you will share your screen. And you will uh, uh, give your presentation. Mariana Saciado uh, is an architect uh, of Thessaly University and a graduate of the Empowerment Encouragement Program of the National Capital District University of Athens. Eli Petridi is also an architect from the University of Thessaly. I can guess where you met, but I won't, I won't say. <laughs> and currently a student at the postgraduate program uh, research in architecture, design space culture at the National Technical University of Athens. In 2020, they created the team Little Architecture. They have carried out participatory design workshops with children and adolescents. And they have uh, attended numerous conferences and seminars and they have been recently invited as presenters at the 10th International Child and City Conference in Dublin, which takes place in 2021. The lecture is titled Design as a Tool for Post-Pandemic Sustainability, Playing, Learning and Social Distancing. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome to share your screen and we look forward to your lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, we try to share now. Um, there is a question who can share, who can start sharing and all panelists is um, chosen, but we can proceed. Maybe it's something needs to be done by US host. Let's see if I can change something. Let's see if I can change something with it. Oh, wait. First of all, I have to turn off my sharing because you cannot share with me. Maybe that's a problem. Okay. Now try to share. I think that would work. Okay. No. Can you see our presentation? Yes. Yes. Okay, so we're uh, okay. When we were invited by Balikovic to present a topic of our choice under the general theme history, tourism, sustainable design, aiming towards sustainability vision and practice, we immediately thought of discussing the current situation we have been facing globally during the past 18 months that is current that is the COVID-19 pandemic. Contemplating on the COVID motto, habit change, climate change, we decided to trace the changes the pandemic brought upon our everyday lives. During the past months, there were extending periods of time when we forgot what it's like to eat in a restaurant, to have our relatives or to hang out with lots of our friends at the same time. As soon as we snapped out of the initial shock, we started tracing the changes we observed regarding the new usage of public space. As researchers interested in different aspects of the space that surround us, we try to outline our, our, our observation, observations and use them as catalysts for our future design endeavors. In this short presentation, we would like to share some of our findings and thoughts on this matter. First of all, we would like to share some examples that illustrate social distancing practices in public space. Located in Brooklyn's Williamsburg neighborhood, Domino Park is one of the first in New York City to devise a way for implementing social distancing, but 1.8 meters. There are approximately 30 circles arranged, arranged symmetrically in rows. In total, it took a few cans of white uh, paint from the local store to people in four hours to implement this strategic tactical urbanism. Another example is this design called Here Comes the Sun. The blanket has been designed for a post-lockdown future to make sure people maintain the suggested two meter distance while in social situations, while social situations such, as, such as picnicking or some bathing with friends. The open source design consists of a material in the shape of a circle and four separate pieces of fabric cut, cut into circles, which can be placed around the outline or two meters uh, apart. The blanking sunlight design allows it to be wrapped around the tree if, you, if, if the users want some shade. 
moving uh, from parks to schoolyards. In this photograph, we can see spread the uh, side nuts that marks safe distance spots for primary school pupils. On another schoolyard in France, these chalk painted rectangles ensure that children only play in their designated area during races, a concept that we find uh, quite controversial. Finally, here we can see primary school pupils perform air hugs while standing in tires and mark the two meters distance again. As far as the topic of learning during the pandemic is concerned, on this slide we have put together two photographs that sum up the practices we've come across in the past months. Either using typical classroom equipment or haystacks, uh, for instance, a lot of teachers around the globe have chosen to conduct their lessons in operator classrooms. Of course, education that is based outdoors is not a new idea. Indicative of this are these photographs of the early 20th century demonstrating operator classrooms during other pandemics. So we have been so far how public space had transformed during the lockdown. Then one day, in mid-February 2021, all of a sudden Athens became a vast inclusive playground for 18 hours. A massive snowstorm caused a lot of problems, but also transformed the city. A cars were not able to move around, people of all, of all ages, and especially children, flooded the streets. Due to an extreme weather event, the way we use and experience public space ultimately changed. Now, before we share some further thoughts, we would like to point out some transitional marks. As long as it is clear that all the aforementioned examples are substitutes for human interactions as we knew them so far, we believe that good practices are helpful and should be shared. In fact, they illustrate very clearly the lack of spaces where people are able to interact and spend time, or loiter, as Jane Jacobs would put it. As we gathered more and more examples, we noticed a lot of circles. A circle is a form in which people gather together. We could say that it is the symbol of togetherness and equality. There are lessons to be learned from this observation. During the rest of the presentation, we will try to address these questions. How observing the way we use public space during the COVID-19 pandemic can influence design? And also, what is the role of design in the concept of caring for our surroundings and community? In our view, sustainability is inextricably linked to the care for the environment, natural as well as built, and participation is a form of care. In general terms, care consists of all the actions we perform daily in order to maintain, continue, and repair our world, as a means to live in it in the best way possible. Care is also linked to sustainability in the economic and environmental realms through the way we manage resources. In this diagram, we illustrate the basic directions of care towards space. It can be traced in a number of spontaneous social practices in the form of participation, or in institutional decisions arising from democratic processes in the form of pluralism. Between the two dominant directions, the bottom up and the top down, we propose a third direction, the role of design. Care as approached in our research may also relate to the design strategies of architects and designers collectively. Our choices, both in regards of the materials of our projects, as well as the inclusive and participative production of space, have the potential to shape a more sustainable future. In this proposal, we lay the framework for design towards a playful, plural usage of public space. We aim to detect playful practices embedded in everyday life that occur in spite of the dense, car-oriented structure of most cities, and enhance them with new interventions. We propose the schematic approach of play syntax that welcomes and encourages loitering, provides stimuli to citizens of all ages, and shapes common spaces of inclusiveness and togetherness. Minimum changes diffused in the urban space can trigger a major, a major shift in the ways we perceive and experience the city, individually as well as collectively. In the first type, traces. We conduct field research in order to document and collect practices of randomly initiated play. For example, during the lockdown, some structural elements of the Olympic Stadium in Athens doubled as non-typical slides. 
a formerly abandoned space, became a playground out of nowhere. In the second type, events, our research focuses on creating events of organized play. In the same spirit, in these two examples, we can see streets and empty lots being claimed back and used as areas of meeting and playing together. In the third type of work, we introduce new design strategies for focal, linear, or superficial interventions scattered over the urban landscape. So, how can design be a tool for post-pandemic sustainability? Our response to this particular question is by implementing participatory design strategies. We often think about this within the frame produced by two inspiring quotes. The modernistic form follows function, and Form Follows Fiction by Susan Hoffman. In the intersection point of these two, we try to transform imaginary structures into functional and stimulating architectural interventions. Uh, for this purpose, we strongly believe that public participation in certain moments of the design process has the potential to accelerate it and make it more relevant. In fact, we endorse the view that the expertise of users is similar to that of architects, as it is an acquired knowledge that arises through the experiential relationship with space. On our projects, we try to focus on public input in order to produce more relevant, sustainable and resilient proposals that reflect the common vision for the future. Participation can take many forms and include uh, different stages of the design process. We cannot actually elaborate on that in the context of this presentation, but we would like to share a glimpse of what it could look like. In the early stages of the design, we work with collages that depict different atmospheres and functions for the future of spaces. In this case, a school, a schoolyard. These outlooks created by the users of the space can be translated into design proposals in the next steps. Also, we frequently use scale models as a means of expressing the user's vision. In this slide, all the scale models depicted were created by eight-year-old students and are made of recycled materials. In conclusion, we are urged to observe these photographs, a collection under the general title, Dead Toy Society. Looking at those images, we always wondered if we can imagine and then design a future in which we play more, but produce less waste. For us, the course of pursuing a more sustainable future includes designing differently as to what we used to do in the past. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question and uh, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions. Let's see if uh, we had any response. No, not yet, but I will, I have a few questions. Okay, my first question was, um, <clears throat> My first question is about uh, materials. <clears throat> Let's say that, uh, you know, it's like the pandemic came at the minute when many countries were trying to cope with one, uh, one uh, use as uh, single use plastics. And then the pandemic came and, and all those initiatives stopped. And then the, the masks came and the bottles for uh, alcohol gel came and, and, and gloves came and then millions of other things of single use came into the picture that were not even thought of before or were used only in hospitals or were used only in laboratories. Suddenly, you know, everybody was using masks. Everybody was using uh, uh, one single use uh, gloves and everything. So that produced a lot of waste. So the question is, when when we start to, to create a new language of design, that uh, this language uh, responds to the COVID and creates and starts to organize the public space in different ways. It may be just a, a piece of cloth, it may be just a paint, but, but still it's, it's material, we're using new materials. So is there, is there a way that we can, or, or from your experience from what you saw in the examples, is, is the idea of reusing materials or, or being very specific about what materials to use and what materials not to use? Um, uh, in, in that context, do, do you see uh, uh, all these new ideas that come up in design to be also escorted by guidelines saying that 
you're not supposed to use new more waste or you're supposed to, to it should be zero waste solutions or or you can only use materials that have been waste and now you're reusing them so that they don't end up in the landfill etc so basically if if uh, if these ideas design ideas are are not adding to the problem but actually giving a solution to the space but also giving a solution to the waste problem uh, thank you very much for your question. Uh, it is very interesting and you give us the opportunity to elaborate on an aspect that uh, we did not address in our presentation before. Uh, most of uh, the examples uh, we shared in our proposal um, utilize recyclable or reusable materials. For instance, we are inspired by the work of uh, junk playgrounds which are an exemplary implementation of upcycling uh, practice. And moreover, part of our research also focuses on um, revive, reviving uh, neighborhood uh, games from the past century as a form of sustainable playing alternative. A zero waste one. A my, zero waste my one. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I think that during uh, participatory workshops, uh, we try to focus on the um, on the value of care, as uh, Lee referred, uh, for not only for the community but also for the environment. And uh, thus, we hope to give a glimpse, yes, to inspire, to make more conscious uh, choices in general, all of us. Thank you. I was I was in mute. Uh, let's see if we have any questions. Um, I have another question. Looking at the pictures from uh, <clears throat> older pandemics, uh, where you see the schools actually being exactly, you know, uh, taking the school and copying it outdoors only without the walls, you know, it's the same structure, you know, the teacher is at the same place, the, the seating is at the same arrangement, only there's no walls, you know, it's, it's really funny to look at it. But then when you look at the, the solutions that they did in the most recent examples you showed that they used uh, 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 straw bales for seating, etc., which means that they didn't take the furniture of the school outdoors, but they actually created a new outdoor space for the school. So I think there are two questions there. One is, again, the reusing exactly what you have uh, and not bringing in new materials. Actually, the students in the past Took their, their, each one took their chair and desks, put it out outdoors. And so the, then when the pandemic finished, they just put it back into the classroom. Uh, here we have the tendency to, to recreate things, not to, to use the same things, the desks indoor, but actually bring straw bale, uh, bring new seating, create new seating, build new seating. Um, maybe, maybe we... Maybe it's 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 a it's a response to to our to our generation where materials are are you know there's a there's a there's an abundance of materials abundance of resources you know we can abundance of money to to build new things you know there's no thinking of rethinking or or just thinking twice of doing a new thing but actually just take the, the existing thing outdoors, um, but on the other hand th this is one one thing that, that stands out, you know, the, the fact that we're very easy in creating new things, you know, the IKEA mindset, instead of using the old chair, I'll buy an IKEA new chair, you know, because it's cheap, it's, uh, you know, I can find it easily, it's, you know, it's nice design, etc. So, so one thing is this, you know, to consider, you know, the, the, the reuse of things rather than creating new things all the time. And the second is the opportunity of using the outdoors more. Um, we can see a lot of schools in many countries that the building and the outdoors are disconnected. There, there are almost no doors leading to outdoors except for one door. You know, from one door you can go to the to the schoolyard, and not many doors from classrooms leading out to the yard, so that kids can go in and out all the time. So maybe there's a good opportunity here to reconnect the outdoors to the indoors, and and bring this into the design as well so that the kids can move outdoors easily uh, from the indoors so that the classroom can also take place outdoors 
uh, as easily as indoors, you not know, through a corridor and a, and a and a one opening, but actually the, the classroom is is designed to be outdoors and indoors at the same time. This is just a thought, you know, to throw for you, you know, as architects and who are dealing with these things and with education, you know, throw out these two sort of things that stand out. Um, your, your question comes in the very point of uh, where all of our, uh, all the aspects of our research uh, come together. Um, because we wanted to keep this uh, presentation short, we left out a lot of things, but um, uh, the, the two questions, the dual questions, might I say, that uh, you just uh, posed um, is, in fact, what, um, what do we think about uh, for the future of, um, of learning and playing environments in general? Um, uh, it's another thing to say a learning environment and another thing to say a school, because a school is something very fixed in our minds, but we're trying to think of it in a new and um, quite alternate way than, the, than what we're used to do right now. So uh, even coming back to the material part uh, of the discussion, our aim is to bring out the chair from the classroom, but not set it in the um, predefined setup from the indoors, but use it in, in another way. So we have a chair, we can use it outside, but we can jump on it, uh, climb on it, yeah. or uh, yeah. lie on it. Uh, this is what um, influences our design, and we use it as a cure to think of the, um, of the materials we have in hand, but in a different uh, way, and enhance the learning process, process with many more activities that are, are abandoned. Uh, right now, we have forgotten what it's like to have an outdoors classroom or to go in and walk in the nature uh, in the in the time schedule of uh, the schooling process. Um, so we're trying to uh, find a way to uh, propose the, a structure of different alternatives that people can see and share with their students or with their peers and create a community where we use the same materials we have in hand, but in a very, very different way than the one we used to. I don't know if it answers most of the, um, most of the, the great part of the question, but um, we, I also want to mention a small example uh, of this um, concept of uh, the indoors-outdoors uh, boundary, boundary. Uh, we are very inspired by the work of Alta Van Nijn, who had an exemplary example uh, of uh, a learning environment in uh, the Netherlands, where the inside and the outside of the, of the school were interconnected uh, very fluidly. Alta Van Nijn is, is a great example because uh, for many reasons, actually, I'm I'm teaching a, a studio with uh, with a partner who's uh, who's an expert in in uh, in uh, Reggio Emilia and Aldo Van Eyck, and uh, <laughs> she's done me a lot of brain brainwashing about all this. Uh, but it's quite amazing that Aldo Van Eyck uh, rebuilt uh, playgrounds throughout the cities with with very little materials. That's what's beautiful about his work. Both the space is really like the bombed Europe and then really big holes of, of, of buildings that were destroyed. And this place has become really pocket parks and pocket playgrounds with uh, very few materials, you know, like it could be like a, a metal tube. It could be like just a swing. It could be just, it's, it's quite amazing with the, 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 the sparse resources he's using and the brilliant way of the, of the space and the, and the little, elements that he's adding, many of which today, by the way, would not be, would not be uh, uh, possible to do because of, uh, of, uh, of sec not security, but, uh, but um, uh, how do you call it? Uh, they're not uh, safety, safety, safety. They're not safe. Like they would do like huge, very, very tall places where kids can climb, uh, you know, like five or six meters high. And, and today you wouldn't do this thing without a rail or without all kind of protective nets, and etc. But and kids would just climb it, you know. Some could fall, you know. Okay, 
it happens. <laughs> but most of them were up there, you know, having a great time. <laughs> so, so, but, but it's again, it's all this concept of our society, you know, everything has to be constructed with safety rules instead of using old wood, you know, with maybe some nails in it. But today it's dangerous, you know, you can't do that. But, uh, but then they would use it, you know, they would use the wood, they would make sure they don't step on the nails and, and you know, play with the wood. Uh, today we've become too, too hysterical about safety and everything that uh, we've missed a lot of the pleasures of, of, of experimentation, basically, you know. Um, yeah, but, um, yeah, but Van Eyck is definitely a very good uh, example. I would like to ask you just to type, uh, you said something about jump, jump rounds, uh, in the Jump beginning, playground. Jump ah, it's called. It's can you type it? Can you type it? Because uh, it, it's some people, you know, we're, we're not all, all, all familiar with the terminology, and some of our people in the audience would like to um, do some more reading or check some things. Uh, more of them were in Denmark, it's where it started, and it's actually one mm -hmm. of your last, um, uh, your last mentions that you did um they were they are using um wood and the children are part of the construction process actually uh with uh, risk taking uh, of course into consideration but uh, there are adults um, overseeing the whole process and they only use specific materials but it's part of uh, a wider learning process where you try to be more um um, you can make things on your own, a DIY process of the yeah. play, playing landscapes. Yeah. Great. Thank you. I mean, it, it's it's a very long discussion. We could sit here talking yeah. about these <laughs> things for <laughs> hours. It's, it's, no, uh, it's brilliant. For it's it's really brilliant. And thank you for, uh, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think you're touching upon a, an area which is, um, which we take it for granted, but I think there's a lot of, uh, you're going to find a lot of things and maybe you'll be able to also change some things and that'll be great. I believe in that. <laughs> so good luck. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much and thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Um, okay. Now we'll move on to MS. MS. Hi. <laughs> MS Panska of uh, CompuCity uh, from Hungary connecting directly to Echoic, <laughs> all the way from Hungary. How's in Hungary? Is it hot now or is it cold? Uh, unfortunately, it switched to cold. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, so okay. we just we just uh, say goodbye to summer two days before and now it's an average 20 uh, Celsius. So it's, a, it's another check. Oh, okay. <laughs> But, it, but it's also good news because it means that you're not in the middle of climate change, uh, extreme temperatures. Yeah, yeah, so you there's are also right. a good side yeah. to that. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the switch <laughs> it's a natural was temperature. Best, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so MS, I'll give a short introduction, is an architect dedicated to creating supportive solutions that help communities become more self sustaining and improve life. Uh, MS is a graduate of uh, Budapest uh, 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 Metropolitan University with degrees on tourism and economy, applied science and environmental design, and of Hansa University of Applied Sciences um, on product design. She's a doctor in architecture from Marcel Breuer Doctoral School of Architecture. As a doctoral student in architecture, she re uh, MS researched the field of sustainability pedagogy. Uh, and uh, with her former mentor, founded a company around a playful urban composting system based on sustainability education called Com City. Com City is a, a gamified community composting system of urban everyday life. In 1920, in uh, 2019 and 2020, it received a design uh, terminal mentor program for most developed startup award. And the lecture title is Scalability, Ancient Techniques for Future Cities. Mess, the microphone is yours. Thank you for joining us again. Thank you. It's, it's an honor to be here. Uh, could you please give me a feedback on that my presentation is on full screen and you can see this? Yes, yes, we can okay, see and we you. can I, hear I, you. I see the yes. screen, so it's always confused me. <laughs> 
Thanks a lot. So uh, the aim of this presentation is to give you an overview with some examples, how we can use our heritage in upscaling or downscaling uh, to find a more uh, self-sustaining uh, routine for our livable future. Uh, let's take a look at uh, an urban construction. Uh, yet the raw material is used in a giant quantities in construction and manufacturing. In uh, the building sector alone, 40 to 50 tons of sand is used around the world annually. This is led by the production of concrete, which is typically made of about 25% of sand. The problem with supply is that most desert or beach sand is unsuitable. This means that sand is typically uh, dredged uh, from rivers. Uh, the volume uh, being extracted has a significant impact on rivers, deltas and coastals and marine ecosystems. Sand mining results in loss of land uh, through river or coastal erosions, lowering the water table and decreasing sediment supply based on the BBC News articles. Uh, could you see that I switched to the second slide because... Uh, that we don't see yet. Yeah, 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 that's what I can see on uh, the st uh, streaming. Mm -mm. Ah, you're using the PDF. Uh, yes. Maybe just scroll down. Uh, you know, you know what? Click, click on the screen. Yes, now it's moving. Yeah, now it moved. Okay, so if it's not full screen, then at least we can follow the presentation. You, you can do full screen. I think uh, you don't see the menu on top. Okay, I don't know exactly. It's uh, uh, let's see. I'll check for you one second. A view full screen. You can do Control L. Control L. Yeah, but when I did the full screen, then it's just started to... Yeah, okay, so don't worry. No, no, it's, it's good. I mean, if, if, you, if you don't mind, then we can... No, no, it's fine. It's fine. In this size. Okay. It's fine. It's fine. Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay. So that was just basically a, 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 a picture to give you an overview about how we use SEND right now. And what I wanted to share with you is a research uh, from the Cambridge University. They have found that plastic waste can be sorted, cleaned, uh, shredded and crashed into sand alternatives for use in concrete. Dr. Ott has explicitly looked at the potential impact of the solution in India. And uh, there is a cost of sand has skyrocketed while the exact time uh, 15,000 tons of plastic waste are dumped every day in the country. So basically uh, they have uh, a suggestion to using uh, the plastic waste is making concrete were adopted across uh, India. And the estimation is that with this uh, new way of thinking about combining the materials and recycle plastic waste in concrete usage could save more than 800 million tons of sand every year only in India. Uh, then this initiative of replacement and fulfilling with waste material is grounded in our history. Uh, the reason why I wanted to start with this is when I was uh, looking for um, the history of waste material, I found this title that uh, recycling all it began with uh, Greeks discovered landfills. The history of rubbish uh, states that the first rules relating to waste management date back to the ancient Greece. Even before then, the first landfills for uh, trash were dug in the city of Knossos. 5,000 years ago. And as uh, you already uh, kind of presented me, uh, may you all know that how uh, deeply I'm uh, committed to, to waste management. So this example uh, was very important for me to share with you. Uh, a bigger overview of transition presented in uh, the Totons uh, Energy Decent Action Plan from 2010, the United Kingdom first transition initiative with the city of more than 8,000 people involved. It has been designed for and by local communities. They said that they interviewed uh, their word 2.0. On the topic of food security, they looked at land use patterns, the quality of agricultural land and food zones, and conclude that while it uh, may be possible to provide enough fruit and vegetable for local population, supplying cereals and meat would be more difficult Concerning energy, 
the plan addressed the question of whether totems can power down the reduced demand by 50% uh, and go renewable by 2030. And the result is presented in the figure. So you can see that uh, they are uh, above 40% with the, with the concept. Uh, and about uh, what is really uh, not hidden, but unfortunately a bit uh, forgotten uh, about uh, Asian techniques. Uh, indigenous culture have practiced permaculture methods for tens of thousands of years. Their culture hold, hold uh, tons of place-based polycultural knowledge and uh, agroforestry techniques within their oral traditions attained over thousands of years of observation, trials, and errors as well. Permaculture is a way of thinking. It is a set of principles taken from nature and applied to our everyday lives. Permaculture aims to design sustainable communities in line with nature principles. Food, uh, being a critical part of any community, becomes an essential part of uh, permaculture, but we can also uh, use it to design shelters, buildings, economies, businesses, education, decision-making uh, processes and relationships. I was as uh, inspired by this whole approach that I just uh, finished my first permaculture design course during this summer. Um, and uh, I just wanted to highlight how many um, new perspective uh, I learned from, uh, from something that was in front of us every time just to, we have to recap uh, as soon as possible to implement as, as creators. And some examples that can be also inspiring for you. The transition town movement brings neighbors uh, to, together uh, to, to prepare their uh, communities for a post-carbon world. The essence of the concept uh, is building resilience at the community level. During the Second World War, Victory Gardens were an essential part of the food supply. At the time, growing food in the backyard was not a significant challenge. Most people were uh, a generation aware, uh, away from uh, some sort of home food production skills that uh, were commonplace less than 100 years ago have disappeared. Uh, what we have lost is resilience. One uh, key to the movement success has been that invites uh, people in a journey of change. And if you are curious about how you can uh, uh, pointing them or compare them, you can find more details on a good public space index, how different morphological patterns influence community spaces. Another example that has more uh, relevance, uh, hopefully for, the, for this uh, Echo Week, uh, especially is the Corinthia Garden, an entirely volunteer run effort to clean up and improve an exterior grounds of a historic prison. The vision uh, was establish uh, community gardens plots at the heart of the space to be surrounded by food forests and community orchards, uh, areas for environmental education and nature play uh, for children were integrated into the food forest itself. They introduced educational components early on the process, including honeybees, hives, butterfly gardens, and birds' habitats aroused to areas to offer immediate improvements and programming to engage neighbors. Over time, the beds of fruits and nuts, trees, berries, bushes, herbs, and nitrogen fixing and wildlife attracting uh, perennials were integrated with surrounding the natural landscape. And this is the perfect example for this year because it, in, in my understanding, it's in the triangle of history, tourism, and sustainability. And I took with me one more picture just to show you how it looks like right now. So this is a living food forest in a crowded city. And they also uh, listed uh, the impact that is proven uh, prove the feasibility itself. Our other example uh, regarding community building is what Mark Lakeman, as an architect, uh, could reach. Uh, he visited different indigenous societies and started to learn a lot about the settlement patterns they have. Uh, not 
condiment the city as it exists, but we need to figure out strategies where people work together right in the places where they live to identify their problems and then undertake design-based methods for making their communities better and stronger. Bordening the understanding of streets can enable a city population to accommodate many more activities than we were doing in the 15th century. That mindset shift is significant innovation. So far, they have done over 300 public space projects using the permaculture approach. So I highly recommend having a closer view of uh, his project on public spaces. Another initiative that I would like to highlight uh, is what Mara Mincer, the professor of uh, University of Colorado could reach. Uh, she's a researcher, a researcher and architect and uh, dealing with community engagement. One of her publication is the Handbook of Designing Public Spaces for Young People. A child-friendly city is more hospitable for, uh, for not just children, but for the whole family. And it raises the question, shouldn't we include the end users in the design of uh, the actual spaces that uh, they will use? And she is encouraged people to let's think about children as future citizens and instead of value them as young citizens that they are right now. I also have a Dutch uh, example for, for you. Uh, the Blue City Lab, it's uh, placed in Rotterdam. It's an international icon of circular economy. It's a national platform for circular entrepreneurs uh, housed in a former subtropical swimming park and the well-known building that fell out of use to save the building from demolition, innovative, sustainable, and circular entrepreneurs have taken over another bottom-up uh, practice that uh, uh, fulfilled the building with educative, uh, educative uh, activities for urban communities and established a platform uh, for co-working, brainstorming, and innovation. For instance, they organize works, workshops such as material experiments with coffee grounds based uh, planting pots, which is a high nitrogen boost for flowers. Um, that is a mind shifting activity for the full, whole family and think about how they can deal with organic waste in a different way. And basically this uh, place is a, is a knowledge center in the city that started with, uh, with the fact that the old building was saved and uh, taken over by the architects. So it's also an inspiring um, uh, example that hopefully can be uh, scalable enough to, to find more uh, of this uh, all around the world. And uh, just to, to, to continue with Dutch examples, uh, the founder of the Blue City Lab, Amma van der Liest, uh, become my, uh, one of my friends and she wrote this book that I wanted to share with you, The Form Follow Organism. In this book, she asked what production will look like in the future. She's originally a product designer who started her research on interdisciplinary connections toward bioengineering. And her book is Let Me To Think About Creating Unique Circumstances to Literally Ask Nature to Find the Best Design. So this book is, uh, is a milestone in, in my design life as well. And what she's talking about uh, has a lot of different um, useful, different scale um, uh, adv advantage or, uh, or message for, for hopefully all of us. Uh, so Emma spoke about uh, the cities in motion, how slime mold can redraw our rail and road maps. Uh, researchers uh, use organism uh, search for food to work out efficient transport routes, uh, divert around floods and even imitate rush hours. The use of naturally occurring living organisms to solve uh, spatial design problems uh, in this area variously uh, been explored. The University of Hokkaido in Japan uh, successfully grew a slime mold model of the Tokyo rail system in 2010. Since then, slime has mapped numerous city uh, optimum transport network, the Silk Road and the complete global trade route. For example, problems in the systems such as uh, road crash or flooding can be simulated by simply adding salt at the relevant point of the map. Uh, salt is uh, toxic to the plasmodium and the organism will react from it, uh, retract from it, uh, strengthening other lines and opening new routes across the net network, which can thus provide information for traffic planning. 
so it's also very uh, inspiring and very fundamental um, example how you can ask nature to help your design and be as simple as it's possible without uh, without waste. And that's the point when I would like to uh, uh, shortly share with you where we are right now in uh, in adopting Asian techniques and how you how we can ask nature to support our sustainable vision. Uh, Composity uh, is our project. Last year, when I was honored to be here as a speaker, we were at that stage that we had uh, uh, a not fully workable prototype, and we were looking for for uh, funding to to start this project. And less less than a year, uh, we are honored to mention that we have ten fully workable uh, prototypes of an indoor composting solution. So basically, Composity is uh, automating a traditional uh, Asian Japanese uh, composting technique, which uh, needs a lot of handwork and daily treatment because you have to uh, keep up uh, every day the, the circumstances that uh, requires in an indoor conditions to do the composting. But a lot of people are willing to do the compost, but they don't have uh, a garden or even a balcony to join to this uh, to, to this mission. So we created this um, product and it's not just a product, basically a system to, to support city dwellers on this journey. And this is how it looks like right uh, now. And this is the system that we imagined for this solution. So on the product scale, uh, that's how we can uh, take part in the nutrient cycle. Hopefully Composity can close the loop. And every time when people use our solution, uh, on, a, on a community scale, because it's designed for communities, uh, they will just put their uh, organic waste in the bin. Uh, it will measure uh, the weight of the waste. Uh, it can award you if you are willing to play with us, because we truly think that uh, gamification can keep up a long-term engagement for uh, sustainably uh, aware um, daily habits. And the bin will create the compost within two weeks without odors and without daily maintenance instead of the traditional composting process that requires um, at least eight to six months to, to make the compost. So it's also a very fast uh, solution to enrich the soil. And in a lot of areas of the world, it's uh, already a very important need to, to, to fulfill the, the soil as soon as possible with nutrition. Uh, so this this is the loop that we are uh, try to to fulfill with uh, with value and uh, it's also a bottom up approach and based on the community uh, who willing to willing to play with us uh, as I as I mentioned to you the bin can measure the weight of the waste and if we need uh, sensors first and foremost to give the users feedback on. Uh, how the compost quality looks like. It uh, gives them uh, a safety environment because most of the people, of course, in cities uh, don't know how what they can do with the compost. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we, we forget a lot of, or we are not using most of our heritage in the past uh, 100 year. And Compost City uh, has one solution for that in a way that we are uh, we, we can give you feedbacks on, on the usage. We can tell you for what kind of plants uh, uh, we recommend to use the compost that you created, what type of uh, bushes, trees will be happy with that. And also you can uh, track your uh, personal uh, environmental footprint reduction. And you can also give your points to different community challenges so you can join uh, a bigger uh, bigger goal than uh, just tracking your, your personal data. And this is the, the key factor in our point of view uh, in the engagement. So I would like to uh, just uh, quickly summarize with, with a kind of uh, message to you that uh, I would really uh, encourage you to, to look up uh, the very basics of how nature works and what inspiring uh, elements of it uh, can can uh, encourage you to find your your solution nowadays and how you can help 
uh, nature to recover as, as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Mesa. Uh, <laughs> wow, it's a, it's a great project. Um, let's see if we have any questions. Uh, can you please wait? We have a question, the title of the book. Uh, which title of the book? Vaidu uh, Kosadena, if you can write which, which book uh, so we can write it for you. Um, let's see if we have any questions here. No, we don't. Okay. Um, well, I have a lot of questions. Actually, I was, uh, <clears throat> I was very surprised about what you said about Knossos in Greece and Crete. Uh, it's, a, it's an ancient site of about uh, 2500 BC. And, uh, and I can tell you that Greeks have learned a lot from that uh, landfill because they can still, uh, they're still using a lot of landfills all over the country. <laughs> so I can tell you that <laughs> Greeks are, are still hanging on to our history with, uh, with landfills. It would be very interesting actually to see what kind of waste was uh, dumped in that, um, in that site because for 2,500 2, years, not a lot of it may have survived. So it's very interesting to see what kind of waste was there. And maybe we can learn a little bit about uh, what, what was it that they couldn't reuse? Uh, was it broken, uh, broken uh, ceramic pots or was it um, metal pieces or was it, um, it's very interesting. I, I, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll really check that uh, information because I didn't know about it. And I think it's fascinating to see that uh, landfills started in Greece and they're still going very strong here. And the, now that Europe is requesting, uh, demanding actually from the whole of Europe to, to be new, uh, carbon neutral in, in, the, in the user uh, circular practices by 2050. Uh, I think, you know, it would be a good uh, thing to learn from Knossos and see how we can avoid it now. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, the the practicalities of the composter? Uh, that what like you just put it in that big uh, big sphere, or you have to put uh, dry stuff with it, or like can you tell us a little bit about the process? How how uh, demanding? You, you said it's a, it's an ancient uh, Japanese uh, technique, and you said that it needs some daily attendance or you know care. Can you, Tell us a little bit about it. I mean, what, because, you know, I know, I know the traditional, you know, the compost bins, I throw my organic stuff, I put some dry leaves and I let the worms do the work, you know, and usually they're, they're doing a lot of work and ants come in and, and little, uh, 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 what do you call them, uh, beetles and other, you know, a lot of, you know, really a composter is like a big supermarket, you know, it's a mega supermarket for, <laughs> for ants and 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 the uh, and, uh, little animals to come in and, and take food, you know, it's for them. It's like wow, it's party time. Uh, but what happens, you know, what happens in the in the in the house, you know, it, what what happens if the ants discover it, you know, do they just start taking stuff from there, <laughs> you know, because ants go all over the place, you know, I'm sure they're gonna find this little hole in the in the in the sphere, and they then they bring their friends to to start taking stuff from there. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about the process. How, what does it mean? You know, I have one of these. What does it mean for me to, to take care of it? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, thanks for the lovely explanation of how the, the garden composting looks like. Uh, our indoor composting solution try to keep this type of party outside. And uh, the, 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 the basic difference uh, is... Uh, the, the technology itself. So as, as you mentioned, the, the traditional composting is uh, dealing with air. So basically it's an uh, aerobic uh, process uh, that you have to also mix uh, because the temperature can also go high. So most of the time you have to uh, turn it over and also deal with it quite often um, because yeah, the temperature can goes up to 90 uh, Celsius, so it can easily burn as well. Um, and yeah, it, it invites uh, a lot of animals and it has a specific list of food waste that you can put in. For instance, the, uh, 
the, the citruses are not really friends of the worms uh, and other things not really allowed to go in. And what we are uh, doing right now uh, with this Japanese uh, technique is, uh, is a fermented uh, process. So basically it's anaerobic uh, without any air. So what composite uh, does is every time it's measured the weight of the waste and it will add a special microorganism to, to the weight. Uh, to the uh, to the waste and then uh, uh, basically creating layers uh, in that two weeks while the the compost will be down and the food waste what you can uh, allow to put in is wider so you can put in everything except uh, liquids basically you are allowed to put in uh, uh, stable dairy products basically cheese as well uh, a little bit of meat uh, and uh, and fish. And this fermented manner uh, will be created while the liquid uh, will be led to one of the legs to the composite. So we also had to solve the, the challenge of, uh, of liquids because uh, in outdoor conditions, the liquids, the compost tea, uh, as they call it, uh, it will uh, drain in the, in the soil. But in indoor conditions, we have to uh, collect it in another uh, spot of the bins. So every two weeks, you can take out this uh, fermented composted manner and the comp and beside that the compost tea as well uh, from the bin. And because of the, the fermented process, it has no odor, so it won't invite uh, any little animals in it. And you don't need to uh, store even soil in the bin. So basically, if you would like to move the worms inside, you have to first create their living environment. So the half of the bin, bin will be uh, uh, loaded with, with soil, their, their living environment, and then only the half of the bin can be full filled with uh, waste. So in our solution, you can put only the raw material in it. So it has uh, a better um, uh, scale to use. You can, you can fulfill only with, with the waste material. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting. You, you probably know that there's um, there are compost bins for the balcony. They call them the the worm worm tray or or tray of worms mm -hmm. or something like that, where where they have uh, uh, like uh, layers where you have uh, uh, worms and then you put the the stuff and then uh, layers of worms and so that it's uh, and and it works uh, very well in the in the balcony and it doesn't take a lot of space. But yours is really more. Uh, takes another step and brings it into the house, which is uh, <laughs> something that I haven't seen yet. And, and it's, I think it's brilliant. Um, tell me, um, one thing that uh, a lot of homes have to deal with, and that probably would be the last, uh, actually, there was a question uh, about, you spoke before about the cities in motion. Uh, you spoke about a book. If you can tell us the title of the book so we can type it. Yeah, sure, I will do that. Yeah, can you type it in the chat? Yeah. Great, yeah, okay. Uh, great. And then the, the, the other, wait, let's see if there's another question. Was a question here? Oh, there was no question here. Q&A, okay. Um, motion, okay, done. Uh, can you please repeat the title of the book? Okay, done. All right. Um, so my question was about ah, about the space. Uh, modern homes sometimes tend to be very small and, and uh, floor space tends to be very limited. Have you thought about uh, making this object uh, be more adaptive to the available space and not to have to stand on the, on the floor? maybe to be on the counter, maybe to be hanging, maybe to be part of something that, so that it doesn't take space where homes usually today are, you know, uh, lacking, basically. Uh, yes, yes, of course. And thanks for, uh, thanks for the question. It's, uh, it was also a part of our uh, service design process to think about uh, uh, the size and the skill and, uh, to be honest, we have figured out that most of the, the composter that are available on the market uh, won't be used after the first year. So people start to use their indoor composting for supporting their 
their indoor plants and really enjoying the process, but it won't uh, engage them in a long term. And because of other uh, reasons as well, uh, the community engagement um, and the gamification parts and also a lot of people willing to compost, but they cannot use the end uh, material, the compost itself. So they also would like to ask uh, a support, a service to, to use it in a, in, a, in a right way, led us to the, to the final conclusion that the community usage uh, would be the first step. So the Composity right now designed for communities, it's uh, supporting a community with 25, 30 people for two years. So now we are uh, installed them in different uh, kindergartens, uh, schools, and other co-working offices. And this is how we can promote the most, the sustainably aware uh, approach. Um, so we had requests for different kind of scaling up and down versions, but first we would like to, uh, to explore the possibilities on the, on the community level because all the, all the gamification elements works well if uh, we can reach people in, uh, in community spaces so far. Great. Yeah, the community is very important, actually. Uh, the community engagement and, the, and I've seen a lot of uh, people unexpectedly becoming intensely involved in uh, composting and, and all they need is to share with other people so that they can keep going with it because, you know, sometimes it can become a hustle to keep your composter. So it's very important that people help each other and feed upon the experience of each other and, you know, help... Uh, with the uh, with the solutions or questions and so it's a uh, yeah the community is definitely the first step in every such uh, yeah and if i can add know. one more thing is on a community level what we really uh, appreciate or made us uh, uh, proud is that uh, because of that fact that we have this uh, gamified application basically we can uh, keep a kind of communication line with these communities and just imagine that uh, you really would like to feel that you have an impact on the environment uh, and you put your just just your banana peel in the composite and after three weeks you will get a pop-up message on your phone that someone started to use for instance the, the in the neighborhood a kindergarten uh, use this compost for planting a tree then you will get that feedback that we all really really require mm. to feel that we had a hands-on experience so that's why we think that Every composting process is very, very useful. So we don't want to compete with anyone. Sustainability cannot be in a competitive landscape, uh, but uh, our USP or uh, what we uh, can uh, add as, an, as a value to this whole uh, com uh, composting movement is uh, the, the feedback on what you did has happened here. And you will know that uh, every effort matters matter and you will get this feedback quite fast so you can be an urban hero very fast with, with <laughs> great thank you Mesa. that was really fantastic i mean we can sit here and speak about composting for hours <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's definitely you. an amazing theme and uh and very very relevant especially if we speak about waste and how we can reduce our waste and uh, we should know that uh, organic waste is about 30 or 40 percent of our waste so once we reduce organic waste, we already can reduce our landfills very, 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 uh, in a very extreme way. Okay, thank you, Ms. And uh, we'll move on now to our next speaker. And you can see that Arthur has just joined us. Arthur, you're a co-host, so you can turn on your camera if you want. Hi, great, we can see you. We can't hear you, but we can see you. And now? Yes, now we can ah, hear you. Amazing. Cool. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, are you in I'm, Paris? I'm are in, you in Paris now? No, London. In London. London. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Great. How's the weather? Oh, actually, it's not too bad. I, uh, it's still early here. <laughs> I think we're two okay. hours behind you. 
Um, okay. It, it, it's not too bad. It's, I mean, for London, for you, probably from Greece, it'd be like freezing cold, but. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Okay. So climate change is not so bad in London at the moment. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Maybe, you know, the, the Brexit had a good, uh, had a good effect on the climate. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think if you can uh, Brexit the climate. <laughs> <laughs> no, I guess yeah. it's not connected at all. <laughs> hmm. Okay, Arthur, thank you for joining us. And I'll give a short introduction My about pleasure. you before you can share your screen. Yeah. Arthur Manumani is an architect. He's based in uh, London. He's the director of the award-winning architecture practice Manumani, specializing in new kind of digitally designed and fabricated architecture. Arthur is a lecturer at the University of Westminster and has given numerous talks about the world, the world of eco-parametric architectural practice, including two TEDx conferences in the US and France. A fellow of the Royal Society of the, for Encouragement of the Arts, Manufacturing and Commerce. He has won the American Architecture Prize, the Reba Rising Star Award, and has recently been awarded the prestigious Pierre Cardin Prize for Architecture from the, Acad from the Académie de Beaux-Arts in France. In 2020, the Architects uh, Journal named Mamoumani one of the 100 disturber, dis disruptor <laughs> practices who are challenging the norms of traditional architecture practice in their drive to bring about sustainable alternatives. Alongside his architectural practice, Arthur founded the Digital Fabrication Laboratory, FabPab. I can see here some connection with the Fab Lab, right? <laughs> mm, yeah. Game in words. Yes. Yeah. Nice. British nice, style. Very nice. The pub. <laughs> nice. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and the Fab Lab is allowing the public to experiment with large scale laser cutting and 3D printing equipment in Hackney, London. Uh, Arthur's lecture is it's called Eco Parametric Design Towards a Circular Architecture. Arthur, thank you for joining us. The stage is yours. You can share your screen. Uh, thank you so much. Um, thank you very much. I am going to do that. And is it uh, accurate that I have a little bit less than an hour to to present some of the you, work? Yeah. Um, let's see, you have about an hour. Let's I want to make sure I don't... Uh... <laughs> I'm just checking the program to be exact. Um, uh, 11, 11.40. Yes, we have about 40, 40, minutes? 40 minutes. Brilliant, yeah. mm -hmm. brilliant. Okay, and you can see my screen? Yes. The good screen, right? Like the the this first. This is the this is Brilliant. the um, this is the Burning Man uh, project. Perfect. It? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Great, great. <laughs> yes. Wow. <laughs> cool, cool. So, um, super excited to 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 talk um, and to present, and most importantly, to take you on a little bit of a journey um, on on all the projects that we we work on and 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 the sort of ecosystem that we have uh, here in London. Um, which is very much um, oriented towards um, environmental design, but closely linked with technology. Um, so hence the term eco-parametric. Architects like to invent fancy words, but really it's just there is parametric design. But I, I really believe that technology is really a bit useless unless it, it helps the planet, uh, hence the, the, the ecology added to it. Um, so uh, let, me, let me take you on a, on a little... Uh, uh, detour through the desert uh, because really the, the process of, of learning how to do an environmental design is complex, involves many parameters and is really much a journey. And that project was uh, a, a big learning curve for us. Uh, one, we had to uh, um, fund it ourselves. <laughs> we had to uh, build it with volunteers. Uh, we had to uh, actually assemble it in 18 days with about uh, 180 people um, far away in, in the desert of Nevada in the USA. So um, I will show you that. But um, really, this was full of... Uh, of uh, errors, of uh, miscalculations, of, uh, and I, I'm here not to show you, um, you know, the finished things, the fancy things. But I, I'm here to show you all our mistakes and uh, and how important it is to to accept that nothing is really perfect and that um, the journey is full of uh, uh, of discoveries. And and that's the pleasure, and that's why I love, uh, you know, showing this journey. Um, so we have two companies, and it's important because one is a design studio, um, Mamumani, which obviously is, is the yin to the other yang, which is the, the FabPub. FabPub stands for Fabrication Public. 
um, and it's open to everyone and everyone can design and, and make and be empowered by the machines that we have. Um, I really wanted them to be two separate companies because I, I really believe that um, if we don't empower others, um, then all that happens is you put artists on a pedestal and, and people don't feel like they can have a share in the, 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 um, in the responsibility of, 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 of designing new things and they become passive consumerist people. So I really want to break that and I think digital fabrication can help doing that. Um, so that's our studio in Hackney. Um, before we moved, we just moved to a, a slightly larger hangar, but we're full of like objects that we make. And so it's very much, um, let's say, less about computers and more about um, uh, regaining the means of production of uh, what reconnects us with the final object. And so FabPub, for example, um, the, the ambition, and I talk about it because I think it'll probably outgrow Mamumani very soon. Uh, luckily, after uh, 10 years of Mamumani, uh, yesterday was the anniversary of, of our company, but this one is slightly younger, but it's um, what's been nice, it's grown with the community that comes and book our machines. Um, and also, for example, during the pandemic, we, we produce masks for the NHS with the bioplastics. Um, and that was a brilliant way to show why mini factories, urban mini factories, distributed manufacturing is so important. Um, simply because, I don't know if it's the same in Greece, but when came COVID, we didn't have enough protective equipment. So we had to sort of outsource to China, which is kind of crazy because the whole world was uh, blocked anyways. And so the ability to produce locally um, and to uh, actually uh, be a source of uh, things for the for the world around directly around us without having to travel crazy distance, be stuck in the Suez Canal, and all these things, is extremely important. Um, so I'm really lucky to have a, an incredible team, um, uh, extremely uh, diverse in their in their background, but also in their skills, and and everyone is sort of. Um, a little bit outside of the normal boundaries of what you'd expect as an architect or a fabricator. Um, I really do not like specialism. I think like uh, being a generalist um, helps you to think holistically. Uh, so this was with Arup, the, the, the engineering firm that gave us a grant to develop a, a new kind of robot that's called cable robotics. And I, the reason I show you that is not just because it, it's, a, it's a kind of interesting uh, robot, uh, but it's also because you see the tower on the right was an idea of assembling a tower that could also disassemble itself. And the reason I, uh, you know, in nature, uh, when, when a plant doesn't have enough sun or uh, when, when it doesn't have enough water, it, it sort of, it, it dies, right? And uh, it's then, it then sort of sends seeds around and reproduces itself and it's all good, it's all good. Um, we don't see, if, you know, in nature, in plants, we don't kind of, um, see that as a, as, a, as a sort of very sad thing. It's just what, what nature does. But when we build in architecture and, and we build something that, at, you know, like a giant tower in Dubai, and then it ends up empty, somehow there's no way to adapt to the economy. There's no way to sort of unbuild, ungrow. Um, and that's a strange thing, right? Um, because uh, we don't know what the economy is going to do. And we, we, we have to have the ability to, to adapt to it. And yet architecture is sort of stuck in the, maybe it's the ego of architect, you know, they see the, the, the Parthenon in Greece and they, <laughs> they all want to have the most beautiful ruins. Um, but um, it's a shame because if we thought of our buildings as, as things that couldn't build themselves, um, then we'd have the ability to think beyond us, beyond um, migration, beyond, you know, um, things that we know now are very common. I, you know, I didn't work on the Eiffel Tower, <laughs> but it's definitely my, my favorite building. Um, and what I find really stunning about it is, is just that it was built to be disassembled. Um, it wasn't meant to be permanent. And it was part of a fair that was, you know, showcasing technology. And it was just to excite people about what's possible, yet it was just going to be taken down. And it stayed. And, and I think this, this notion of temporary versus permanent is very much something that I've learned at, at Burning Man. Uh, Burning Man is, is a sort of a event, a city that, that happens for a week in the desert. And then uh, it sort of starts from nothing and then goes back to nothing at the end. Um, and these are some of the projects we built with the students um, at University of Westminster. And I very much learned how to uh, uh, use off the shelf um, uh, timber and, and other materials that we can disassemble um, very, very quick and, and, and that can interact with people and can have a certain meaning. 
um, and, and have a sense of playfulness to them. I think uh, architecture, we, we're so disconnected with, with, with our urban environment, with architecture. We just see it as this sort of concrete, cold, soulless, you know, most of the time, to be honest. I, I don't know if it's the same in Greece, but, uh, you know, in, in, in um, the kind of modern architecture in, in France, my, my, my dad grew up in a, in a suburb of Paris, which is a horrible modernist, uh, uh, you know, uh, city. And, and we just, um, I think, I don't know, when, when I studied architecture, I realized that people <laughs> don't like architects, <laughs> don't like contemporary architecture. And, uh, and that source of disconnection, I think, is very much because um, we lost track of trying to explain what it is that we do and provide things that are connected to the soul, not just to function. Um, and this, you know, when you see nature, when you go to a park, when you walk around and you see uh, beautiful flowers, beautiful things, there is you don't need to explain flowers and you don't <laughs> your people just love them and and how do we get inspired by by nature not just in terms of um the mechanism of nature but but also um how do we have this directness of interaction so these are some of the projects we did with the eco eco parametric workshop um which was a you know a sort of six week long workshop and 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 the students created uh, objects that were inspired by nature but in many ways i'll explain how how the process through that so we end up making a lot of our projects because we have now many fab up so we can actually fabricate uh things that are uh, done locally and can be installed locally and can be tested um and <clears throat> most importantly we get to experience with material very very um closely with the type of materials we use um, so we try and design systems rather than finished forms. And that, that's a really important concept. So this is a timber uh, office building that we were meant to do in, in, in Paris, in the suburbs of Paris. And it's basically the typical module of an office uh, that is then tested against different program, um, different constraints of structure, of environment, of um, you know, uh, requirements by the brief. Um, and so by having this, the clients, it wasn't about like a finished form, but he could play around with that module. The reason that uh, you know we started switching completely with wood is, as you probably know, concrete is responsible for about eight percent of all carbon emission in the world. It's the second most used substance after water, concrete. Or I could give you more stats like this. In the past year, concrete has used more. Uh, uh, um, China has used more concrete than uh, the entire U.S. for like a hundred years, for example. Like I don't know, it's just staggering what's going on. And and when you think about that. Um, wood timber is is the ultimate environmental material it's literally absorbed carbon um and so you know be able to work with wood is is so interesting but it also comes with constraint for example this is a hotel we're doing in in Bacalar in mexico and if you were to unfold each one of these lines you'd have straight lines and uh, and that's really important because um you don't want to waste. It's not because you're using an environmental material that you'd like to waste it. Things like plywood, chipboard, MDF, you know, are basically re-engineered wood. Uh, but when you actually get the wood in its purest form, it's like, a, you know, it's relatively good. But how do you deal with it? You know, how do you create three-dimensional shape from it so that you don't have to use like, you know, very cheap forms and, and, and CNC them and, and so on and so forth. And so learning how to use timber in its raw form also means you can use reclaimed timber. So for example, here for a tower we're doing in Bali, we have, uh, the client has bought a, a bridge, literally an old bridge that wasn't used. And, and, and timber is actually uh, really, really uh, long lasting. I don't know, I'm sure you know that the, the, we have the Tudor home here in, in, in the UK. It also teaches you about uh, sustainable forestry, um, how to make sure that, that we have enough wood. It goes hand in hand with a holistic thought process. Um, and I mean, obviously there's no timber everywhere. And so here is, for example, we used uh, sand. So we printed in sand um, and, and another resin um, uh, with, with uh, Chris Bresh, which was a really wonderful uh, experience, uh, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, and talking about sustainable forestry, you know, a lot of the problems in forests is that um, you need to build roads to access them. Access is a big, so we're we're developing, um, 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 sorry, hydrogen, uh, oh, sorry, helium-based, uh, not hydrogen, <laughs> those are bad, but helium-based uh, aircrafts um, uh, with a company called Flying Wells in, in France and developing 
uh, ways to to access remote uh, forests without destroying actually most of it. Um, and so this will be like um, a project of hangars for uh, flying uh, helium balloons, um, which obviously is also better than helicopters and, and planes. Um, and uh, just to finish on this general intro, um, 3D printing opened up uh, a whole kind of world for us because uh, we write software for it. And so things like food uh, is also somehow printable, but not, probably not the best application because uh, you end up with sort of weird foods. But it's funny how being an architect and being involved with robotics and so on meant that we, we sort of expanded what's the usual scope of works of an architect. That's what I meant by having a team that's open-minded because, you know, we are always out of our scope, but, you know, it's because we are redefining a certain scope. And, and so being, being um, curious and, and open and generalist help us sort of uh, think in that holistic fashion. So this is my diploma project uh, at the Architectural Association in London, 2008. And the idea was to link uh, a component with the sun um, and being able to show the, the, the array of possibilities from that component. Um, on a, this was a building by Oscar Niemeyer, which I loved and I was trying to pay homage uh, by, by actually showing the potential of it. Um, and, and so I, I graduated uh, um, and I joined an office and I was given the task to work on a, on a, on a biodome that would reproduce, mimic the ecosystem of, uh, um, of Congo in, uh, in Chester, in north of England. Quite a challenge, uh, but it's one of those really amazing projects where you get to think as a whole holistically because we had to think of the plants, of the, um, of the type of ecosystem of flora and fauna uh, that could be to develop inside these. Um, and you know, I don't know if you know about Biosphere 2 and all these initiatives, uh, the Eden project, um, initiatives to, um, to, to, to create greenhouses that are actually um, helping grow plants that wouldn't otherwise grow. Um, and so it all starts with a roof um, and this is called a geodesic um, curve. Uh, it's the shortest path between two points on a surface. Um, I won't geek up too much, uh, but the beauty is that the component that, that, that is applied, this sort of triangular equilateral component, gets denser where it's needed to be denser. And so you, you get a, a structure that is very much the result of the forces going through that, that structure. And so I think that's really interesting because uh, when I talked about algorithms being linked with uh, the natural environment or eco-parametric architecture. This is really a sort of um, exercise in, in, in that, in, in, in having something that um, uses technology towards having thinner beams or using less material, minimizing the use of material and so on and so forth. Um, these are simulations. So I graduated, it was the crisis, uh, you know, uh, 2008 crisis, big crisis in, in, in the world and in the UK. Didn't have any, uh, you know, any opportunity at all and started my own practice um, very much because also these parametric tools weren't really used um, in terms of fabrication and so on. Like no office really had a giant printer in their office as you, as you do. Um, and so I was lucky to be paired with uh, shop window uh, retailers and become, I started doing like experiential marketing, stuff like that. Um, and these are simulation using a physics engine to try and uh, reproduce what we call origamis. And this idea of joining like sort of um, traditional technique with technology was really nice because you can get three-dimensional out of planes, um, which is really efficient in terms of use of material. And when we do this, when we work parametrically, we work as systems. So therefore we develop uh, families of possibility rather than finished things. And I think that's really important to, to start thinking iteratively. So talking about nature and how nature creates mutations and each mutation is tested against, uh, you know, uh, against fitness criteria. Um, nature doesn't really, uh, I mean, it depends on your belief, but if you believe in evolution, um, which I, I hope you do, um, you basically, there are small mutation over billions of years um, and then each mutation is tested and nature doesn't think, oh, I should do that mutation. It just kind of does it. And in a way, if you design this way, you lose, you let go of preconceived ideas of, of the top down idea of a genius that comes up with a form. Um, and you actually just kind of slowly make your way towards um, what you're going to propose to the client, whatever is going to get built, you slowly make your ways towards that, thinking of all the different 
um, possibilities and, and, and the reasons why you do things. And I really enjoy this. It's very therapeutic. We, we hardly debate in the studio. We just do. And often the solution is sort of democratically um, preferred, um, which I really love as a process. Um, and so this is, for example, the wooden waves. It's a, it's a plywood sheet that is being laser cut to form a three-dimensional uh, wave. And then all these modules are then um, kind of repeated to dense around things like AC units and so on, uh, which gives us great freedom to, um, um, to sort of uh, use, um, you know, uh, this sort of cladding um, structure that, that actually provides acoustic uh, insulation and so on, but in a, in a, in a way that is a little bit more... Um, uh, inspiring for people uh, than the usual office uh, <laughs> suspended ceiling. This is for the uh, Orange Telecommunication Headquarters. As we used a similar technique for, for the entire wall. Um, this, is, this is like an origami uh, type of structure, giant uh, origami that, that uses very, very thin Zintec, uh, which is a, a material that, that, that doesn't ox oxidate. So th these are um, some of the sort of structures that I showed you that would unfold with straight lines and are steam bent, uh, which also bring a little bit of this natural um, approach uh, to design within the, the corporate environment, which I, I think will be more and more necessary and also proven to be much better for your mental health. Um, so switching to a little bit to 3D printing, which I think is a very important uh, technology for our days. Uh, this is called G-Code. Uh, it's what you send to a printer when you want a printer to, to, to do something, not just a printer, but a CNC machine, any kind of digital fabrication. Um, it has simple, simple instruction. Uh, F for speed, X, Y, Z is where you go, E for extrusion. Uh, and basically you send this information and then the printer sort of does its thing based on what you send which is a list of movements and actions. Uh, so it's really nice to be able to speak directly to the printer so that you can um, basically control the parameters as you print and therefore develop your own language uh, from these uh, and, and really control the amount of materials and so on, um, which often you know, third-party software used don't really tell you very precisely. Um, when we 3D print, and I, I'm sure you have little 3D printers, or some of you must have one, uh, we use PLA, polylactic acid. Polylactic acid is, uh, you know, it's basically a, a bioplastic made of uh, fermented sugar or starch, you know, uh, sugar canes, beetroot, uh, uh, it could be all kinds of, um, and even potatoes or any kind of uh, starchy or su sugary uh, vegetable or foods. Um, and, and, and basically this is a, a life cycle assessment that compares uh, PLA and, uh, and ABS. ABS is the, you know, is what's used in, I don't know, the Lego, for example. It's a very common uh, plastic like PET or PETG. And so you see that uh, when you compare two materials, um, there is like benefits and, 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 and pros and cons. Um, so it's, no, it's not really like, is it better? It's more like, where is it better? And where can we improve, right? And I think that's really important. Like, for example, um, you know, if you if you're uh, if you're like closer to the outside, it's better. If it's uh, closer to the inside, it's worse. So, for example, in terms of CO two emotion, is much better in terms of uh, being um, uh, being uh, um, car car non carcinogenous. It's much better, you know. Uh, but in terms of land use, it's not great because you obviously have to use uh, fields that were for food. And so, but but in a way, that's that's. We can sort that out, right? With vertical gardens, with with uh, vertical farming and stuff like that. And so, you know, this idea of thinking holistically, I think, is really important. When I show this to clients, some of them are like, "Oh, we'll build a vertical farm. Uh, we'll grow our own plastic, right?" And after, what happens to it? It composts. So it's really good. We talked about compost just before. Um, the, the speaker just before talked about the composting. You can compost this plastic it doesn't end up in the most plastic uh, to be honest is not recycled it ends up being burnt or in the landfill in the oceans and become microplastics um, and so imagine this if, if 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 all plastics were actually being grown in cities composted in cities uh, and then grow again and in a cradle to cradle fashion um, imagine if everyone had 3d printers in their home imagine if you didn't go to ikea but you would print your furnitures once you're done you either um, uh, recycle them in a crusher or you compost them and and then you grow them again 
um, you know, or you, you grow fruit out of it, or you, you, you print another design that is more efficient that you would download from some, from some kind of like, I don't know, uh, Facebook of designs or <laughs> stuff like that. I mean, the future could be really interesting if we kind of think like that uh, in a way. Uh, so these are some of the applications that we printed. Uh, we're printing a chandelier uh, in Scotland, for example, using a PLA mixed with uh, metals, uh, which is a possibility because you can use all kinds of additives. And when we print things, we usually don't send the object, we send the printer to the site. Um, and so that's really kind of great because, uh, well, G code, code doesn't have boundaries, doesn't have Brexit. <laughs> you don't pay VAT on code, um, you know, whereas you pay VAT on objects. But I mean, in this world that we're all like, you know, the highway of information, like it's, 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 it goes at the speed of light. Like, why would we send objects if we could send the code behind objects, you know? And that, it's kind of strange to use transportation and these very, very, uh, I don't know, air freight, like uh, even like sea freight, like all these methods of transportation should really be focused on, on raw materials. And then, I mean, even that, like we could learn to work with the local raw materials and link our technology with that. Uh, but we have to rethink a little bit this, um, this notion of transporting air, because when you transport objects, you mostly transport air. Um, so these are some of the patterns that one can do with, uh, with 3D printing. And this is, for example, a typical sequence uh, that we have. We're working on at Fortnum and Mason at the, at the moment, a shop in London. Um, and then we're working on, on about, I think there's 88 of these modules uh, that are um, flying across the, uh, the atrium. And, and really, the, we try to think in terms of circular economy. So repurpose, reuse, recycle, reduce. Um, and the general idea is that when we work on a project, we try and think of the afterlife. So here we will uh, set an auction for these pieces, which are actually using very little amount of bioplastic, but they're really nice. And so we thought people would want to buy them. And then all the proceeds will go to uh, pollinators uh, charity so that we're going to help Fortnum and Mason develop more beehives, um, which um, you know is, is something that they have actually suggested. And so we're really happy. And this is for the design museum um, in London. You'll see it in uh, October. Uh, this year as part of an exhibition on waste um, and we'll bring our uh, crusher so we have a we have a printer we have a crusher uh, and we tend to actually have no waste here uh, which is a, a way to uh, so this is our whole ecosystem here um, which actually more and more uh, brands uh, are buying into they want that uh, this was for Louis Vuitton for example using their famous monogram um, and we were trying to do a three-dimensional version of that um, and then not just like big brands and stuff. This is my home in London trying to, to actually make it happen. This is a visual, uh, you know, it's not that easy, but what we, what I realized is I wanted to use only environmental materials for this home and realize that most product that we use in our homes are full of plastic, full of epoxy of like, you name it, like Corian is plastic, quartz is plastic. It's like, it's crazy when you start looking into what, you know, plasterboards are bad, paint is toxic. Uh, I mean, it, it's mad, it's really mad. And it's so expensive if you wanna go for reclaimed timber, if you wanna, so this, this is like my realization that we really need to push for environmental products at home, not just for big buildings and so on. So for example, we started developing these uh, partition system, uh, which is made from bioplastics and wood. Um, and so uh, it's quite nice because like once you have them, you have the machines, you can actually like um, customize it to the people and you can actually give it a, a certain modularity, uh, which modularity is, is a crucial part of the, pro of the projects that we work on. And um, modularity is important because it, it can it can be flexible. For example, this is for COS, the fashion brand, and it was in Milan for the Milan Design Week. Uh, and we had about um, uh, 700 of these bio, we call them bio bricks, because they use very, very little amount of material. Uh, I mean, they use bioplastic, but that's not enough. We also want to show how to reduce, not just uh, use eco material or cradle to cradle material. So um, this was a, a geometry based on the size of our printer and also the, the, the palazzo. This was a palazzo and we wanted to show a, a way to fill it up with, uh, with these kind of eco bricks. Um, and on the right, we have the modules of the sand waves that we did in Riyadh, also a modular approach to design. Um, so you see, uh, we always try and think in that way that if there is a module, you can test a module, you can um, array the module in a way that is playful. And so people can, you know, if you design in a playful manner, people will want to play. 
um, and and I, I think this playfulness also reconnects people to 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 their build environment because they can relate this to when they were building things when they were kids. You know these these games of of, of little pieces, and and I, I think encouraging people to build um, will will also help us have less passive people. Like, and I think that's really important. This idea of passivity, and um, that's the kind of final role of my uh, presentation. I hope you're still with me. I, I'm not seeing you, so I hope it's all good. Um, you have um, this is Burning Man. So Burning Man is a very important place for uh, well for me, but also for a big community of seventy thousand people. Um, it, these are the 10 principles, radical inclusion, gifting, radical self-expression, radical self-reliance. Um, and, and a lot of companies actually send their staff there um, to, to learn about these concepts. This is the, the founder, the creator of, of Burning Man, which he says, I elevated pa passions into duty. Um, and so a very uh, engaged community. I mean, we see it as a, obviously a place where you party and, uh, and so on and so forth, but it, it's really beyond that. Um, instead of doing a, uh, art uh, um, about the state of a society, we do art that creates society around it, said Larry Harvey. See? The, the reason for this geometry is, is that it's, it, this community is around art, but not as a spectator. Every attendee has to bring something. There's no uh, lineup for DJs. There's no uh, performance and so on. Everyone has to kind of bring something to the table. And so uh, what's really amazing is everyone builds like uh, when you're when you arrive, there's nothing, and everyone starts building it. I don't know if you saw the the, the documentary of the 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 fire festival, the the the, the nightmare that that they the, you know this uh, documentary on Netflix. But this is the perfect opposite. Rather than come and have your ticket and and buy and then be there, the idea is that everyone takes part of it, and so we all build it together. And and there's a sense of communal effort that's really beautiful. So this is tangential dreams where people would write things, and it was all made up of the shelf timber cut with a circular saw and assembled as a sort of giant uh, algorithmic puzzle and people could write things on it. Writing things, taking part, uh, you know, in, in cities, street art, I mean, we have a strong street art community here in London, uh, but in most cities, it's, see, it's seen as vandalism, whereas it actually is a really great way to actually connect with fellow human beings. And this is the temple. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the Temple of Burning Man. You see, this is a, this this structure here is, is phenomenal by Greg Fleischmann. It's a giant CNC cut uh, structure without any fasteners, no connections. And that was like in 2013 when, in parallel, I was working on uh, a hotel for astronauts in, for Virgin Galactic. You know, Virgin Galactic is sending uh, people in space, and they wanted a hotel for people before they go to the the, the space travels. And this is, this is called recursion. This is based on uh, sending vectors in space and then recreating um, a movement from this vector. So it's like a kind of recursive loop. And the reason I worked on this because, well, one, it, it looks like galaxies, but, but also because then as it grows, the system could actually adapt to the sun and the environment. And the general idea behind this was to let the, the sunlight go through when it's cold and then diffuse the sunlight when it's hot. Also using things like, um, you know, uh, we call it thermal mass um, and venturi effects to bring the cold air and avoid having air conditioning. I mean, you know, air conditioning is 10 times worse than um, uh, than the gas, the potent than the, the CO2. So, so it's really important to think this way. But also I just, uh, you know, this was in the desert and uh, it had this sort of inverted dome geometry. And whenever you think of spiritual spaces, um, they, they somehow connect you to the sky or to the, 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 what's above, right? But often in the past, it was about showing a sense of ownership of that, of that space, right? Like a kind of dome geometry that encapsulates, reassures you in that sense. But now that we know that, and I'll, I'll take you far, far apart, but that there are black holes, there are uh, sort of uh, uh, an infinity. We don't even know the actual size of the universe. And there's something extremely humbling about it. Um, we know that there are different um, interconnections between space and time, and that if you have a point of gravity, then time has a tendency to dilute and expand, uh, contract and expand. So Galaxia was really a temple to show um, you know, a spirituality linked to the science that we currently know. Um, and, and so therefore, um, I tried to kind of create a, um, a sort of new kind of temple that can actually reconnect us with our current understanding of, of space. 
Um, and so, uh, you know, this is a sort of uh, a geometry that that has a, a central uh, quote unquote black hole and that skews space around it so that it bends um, sort of metaphorically space, space and time, but also those modules. The modules are slowly skewing to the sky as if they were attracted from above. Um, and so it starts as a sort of gateway for people and then ends as a, as a more spiritual gateway. Um, and it's, it's using, uh, you know, not that much timber because it's all intention. And, and we try to maximize tension in the system by orienting the cross bracing in the right direction. We used off the shelf timber. I mean, it's all self funded. So we had to like uh, fundraise a lot uh, to achieve that. Um, and then you can see that we had to actually build this with the community in a, in a really amazing way. We had about 600 applications for people coming to build this with us, which was a really, a really fantastic thing because the involvement of people um, coming to build something that they really believed in as part of a sort of giant village of uh, um, of builders, kind of in a way reminds us of the when you know when we were building the the cathedrals a while ago. There was this empirical loop between the the thing that you build, the uh, the collapsing of things, and the rebuilding. Um, and so these are some of these sort of IKEA manual that we were showing to the uh, to people, um, and these are some of the forces we had to deal with. So all those newtons are the forces going through the structure, and we were trying to use the exact amount of screws needed. Uh, for the forces, also using the exact amount of wood based on off-the-shelf timber, four by four inch, uh, two by four inch, um, and so every single piece had a role in that system, and uh, and 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 the team felt the same way. There wasn't a hierarchy in the structure, nor was there a, a hierarchy in the team, which I, I thought was a really really wonderful thing actually. Um, and um, and then it was used by people, and uh, it was um, given giving the ability to people that are not uh, religious to mourn a lost one, or in my case, get married to my wife, um, which was a, a really uh, uh, wonderful, like uh, amazing way to use that structure. Um, and, and remember when I said that we were disconnected with our structures, I think this was an ultimate sponge, something to actually get people involved, but also show them how fragile everything is. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I do not uh, recommend burning structures for sure. Um, but uh, this is a ritual at Burning Man. At um, the, temp the, the man is burned on a Saturday and the temple is burned on a Sunday. Um, extremely organized, you can imagine uh, fr from the Americans, like this is a very safe thing, but um, it's 70,000 people uh, in silence uh, looking at, a, at, at, at all the things they put in that structure go away, reminding them of the fragility and, and, and having this ability of letting go. And then we clean everything, recycle all the steel, um, but whilst we were building it, and I'll, I'll finish on that, um, we, we thought, okay, how do, how do we take that, that ritual or how do we take all the things that I've explained and, and try and do it without burning? And so this was going to be our next structure. We were going to create this uh, catharsis structure and it's all modular, but was going to be disassembled and reassembled elsewhere. And the disassembly process would be part of that ritual instead of burning the structure. And so we were going to bring it to the Somerset House in London. Obviously, COVID happened. And so we had to actually uh, put it in VR, which I think is a, a fantastic thing also about um, uh, the confinement is that we had to find other spaces that are not physical. Um, and so we put it in a game engine, uh, a metaverse called Altspace. I don't know if you have Oculus uh, goggles, but we were able to actually have an event uh, but, uh, but virtually, um, obviously not as close to good as what we, we did in, uh, uh, what you do in real life, but uh, you know, it sort of requestioned the notion of space. Like, do we really need to travel? Do, can we actually meet in that virtual space? Um, and so that will be a real challenge in the future, this idea of metaverses. And, and, um, but until then, you know, if you, if you wanna work uh, on, on some of these and if you wanna join the journey, uh, I'll leave it there. <laughs> And I hope there's some of that that you can take away. Um, thank you very much. I think it's been 40 minutes exactly, I hope, or? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Arthur, wow, you took us into a long trip. <laughs> All the way to the desert. <laughs> exactly, to space, land back. <laughs> space, land, yeah, yeah, with the, with the Virgin Galactic, we, mm -hmm. we even got to the space. <laughs> <laughs> wow, thank you. That was amazing. Amazing stuff. 
Um, Glad you're still here. <laughs> I'm here and uh, a lot of people are here and I'm sure they're very inspired by what you showed us. Um, I don't know where to start from. I mean, there's so much, so much, uh, I, so many ideas about where to take parametric design. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think what's what's amazing is is that you know you're taking the, the idea of a code, you know, which is parametric design, which is something that students learn to school, but yeah. then you take it to so many different ways of of expressing it. Uh, about you know uh, how material the material even I, I think that was amazing what you spoke about the um, the um, uh, uh, polymers that were actually uh, 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 biopolymers which means that they can be grown which means that the material that you're using to to create things in 3D is actually material that can be can return to nature yeah. and and I think that's that's amazing because we don't think about it I mean I see a lot of my students often use, you know, use regular plastics, then they burn things in order to give different form to things. And they don't understand that they're, they're breathing, you know, biotoxics, which, yeah. which can be, you know, very damaging for their own health. Yeah. And so it's, it's quite amazing how you saw this whole, I, I, I would like to hear from you. When, when did the click came when you start to connect things together, like the material that has to be bio-based the form that has to start involving community. Like everything sort of comes together in a way from a code. And, and that's, I think that's kind of brilliant. When did, when did, did actually happen? When did you say, tell yourself, what, 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 is it, what, what, what am I using here? How can I change this into something else? Or how can the building be produced by people and not by machines? You know, machines could do part and then people can do another part. Mm. I, I, it's it's really a process, um, but I think we are often we have a lot of buildup in our mind, a lot of buildup that you know architecture should be a certain way. That why would I focus on plastic when you know I should be doing buildings, and if I should be doing buildings, I should use the accepted um, you know uh, materials, and then I should be gaining the. I, I think there's a lot of. Um, mm, desire to be recognized and acknowledged when you're an architect or when you work in a certain industry and 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 i i think it's 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 kind of hard to do something that most of my career people said oh this guy doesn't do architecture like most of the time like i i, I don't think i you know this is like and I, to be honest i was like sure i mean why should i put walls in my profession or why should i you know why should i if i you know, if, if we can think in a holistic way and that holistic way connects me with people that are not architect and actually can help me understand how materials work, how, what can be done with materials, then I need to connect with, not with architect, with material scientist, with uh, roboticians, with uh, timber, exp with forestry management experts. Um, and so, you know, and, and they would love to connect with you, you know, like I, I, when I, I was at the uh, Architectural Association, when I, when I was doing my, my diploma, my fourth year diploma, I looked at volcanoes and, and how to prevent a new eruption in Congo uh, and, and how to. And so I, I think maybe, maybe the answer is like at school, I was encouraged to contact the UN, contact volcanologists. And, and I ended it up, you know, at 24 in Congo with the uh, Institute for Volcanology. And I, and I was just kind of looking around, I was like, oh, that's, how amazing that so little architects reach out to people, to scientists, that whenever a, an architect, in this case, a 24-year-old young student reaches out to the UN and to the, they're so happy. And I, I think that architects don't, don't understand the power they have because they stay within their world and, you know, they're obsessed with their colleagues and the, the Rem Kulhas and the Bjark Ingels, and they, they want to reach that status of Starkit. I don't know what it is, but we have this sort of, um, I don't know, maybe a closed mindset, I would say, and, and apologies to my peers. Uh, but I, I think you'll really enjoy seeing how appreciated you are by, um, uh, you know, what's outside there and, and, and how much impact you can have, you know. And since we're responsible for about 40% of all carbon footprint, I think the construction industry and so on, uh, it's so important we do so that we break these barriers, that we break these boundaries. Yeah, sorry. Wow, yeah, that's that's a great message, I think, that uh, architects have to become experimental again, at least in school, 
and, uh, and to break down barriers. Wow. Um, thank you very much, Arthur. I'm checking to see if, if we have any, any questions from the audience. Let's see. Trace your questions. Yeah. Uh, we don't have a question. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I see somebody's saved your contact details, so hopefully you join <laughs> your team next time. <laughs> Good. Fan fantastic work. So inspiring, amazing, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. yeah you get a lot of uh, cool. feedback well, you, here. You can always uh, send me your questions by email. And Super. So yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, I think I think it was a lot of material to absorb in 40 minutes. That's true. That's true. For you, it's several years of, of uh, doing things. But for, you know, most people here, it's 40 <laughs> minutes. It's very short to absorb all this. It's, uh, but it's very, very inspiring. Cool. Uh, oh, uh, it would be interesting to arrange a viewing at your office. I don't know if that's possible to maybe give us a tour, not now, but uh, maybe arrange a tour at the uh, Fab Pub or your office. Yeah, with pleasure. With to pleasure. see how things are, you know, what kind of machinery you're using, you know, how yeah. you're using it. I mean, mm -hmm. I have most of the stuff I showed is around me. Uh, <laughs> just, you know, I just happen to have most of it, you see. The wooden waves is behind me. I, the reason being is that it's so much easier to explain things by showing it than it is by kind of showing a representation of it but you know i would love to show you you know if, if you're around but yeah there's a lot also that i, I couldn't show. like you say it's it's already you know 40 minutes go really really fast so um but we have a lot of different projects that are happening at the moment that are quite exciting in, involving like earth printing or, or ceramics printing and stuff like that which is another material that i find is uh, revolutionary um so yeah i mean you know it's on hackney road you know, I'd be happy to receive you. <laughs> super, super. Maybe we can also do it uh, virtually. Maybe you can uh, give us a virtual tour sometime. We'll uh, speak about that. Thank pleasure, you so yeah. much, Arthur. Thank you very much for joining us. It was cool. quite amazing. Thank you. And uh, we hope to see you very, very soon again. <laughs> <laughs> see you soon. Uh, Thank yes, you. Yes, yes. Absolutely. Thank bye you bye so everyone. much. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, Elias. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, and now we can, uh, I think we have a, a short break. Um, looking at the program, we have a short break until uh, 12 o'clock. So we have about uh, 12 minutes and then we come back for the second panel, which uh, where we're going to have uh, amazing speakers from uh, Austria, from Greece and from Italy. Actually, Maria Luisa now is probably in the US, but originally Italy, but also the US. So um, let's take a break, 12 minutes, and uh, let's meet back at uh, 12 o'clock. Thank you all for joining. And I'm turning the speakers into co-hosts, so you can also turn on your camera later on. So if you cannot turn your camera, let me know. I'm doing it right now. Okay, 12 o'clock, we're turning back.
I welcome again to our second panel of speakers, Explore the Relationships among Sustainability, History and Social Interactions. This panel uh, seeks to present case studies from different parts of the world, and more specifically from Austria, Greece, and Italy. Uh, I would like to invite Mrs. Martina Hermann, Minister Plenipotentiary, uh, Deputy Head of Mission of the Austrian Embassy in Athens, uh, in Greece, to greet this session. Um, we would like to thank the Austrian Embassy in Greece for the collaboration and support of this event, and especially for making uh, Ulrike's uh, lecture happen. Thank you very much, and welcome to this session. Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm not sure whether you can see me. No, not really. Okay. Uh, Elias, may you might uh, need to change the setting. Yes, yes. Apologies. I, I did it. So you can you can turn on your camera. All right. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, everyone, again. Um, dear Mr. Messinas, dear Miss Kunioglu, I hope I said that right. No, dear no Miss uh, Mantika. Dear Ms. Ratner, dear panelists, dear ladies and gentlemen, Kiris Kikiria, Kalimera Sas, it's a great pleasure to uh, greet you on behalf of the Austrian Embassy today. Now, um, the Austrian uh, Foreign Ministry in 2006 uh, founded a program which we call Creative Austrians, uh, which basically wants to uh, support creative and innovative minds who work on socio-politically relevant topics and uh, also provide practical solutions for possible future developments, which can be applied both at the global and at the local level. In addition, it is also um, about sparking international interest in Austrians' uh, dynamic creative industries, particularly among a growing circle of what we call mobile creatives. Uh, when we refer to creatives today, usually we do so from an economic perspective. Um, but I think that the contribution that uh, creative individuals can and maybe also should make go far beyond that. Now, the main focus of the Creative Austrians approach is on those controversial areas, which apart from these purely economic considerations are about the major and important challenges of the present, which cannot be solved without some creative ideas and concepts. I also believe that Creativity and optimism are very, very much aligned and closely related. The most important driving force in the release of creativity is actually the belief and the confidence that you are able to actively and positively shape something, to create something and to make a difference through your own contribution. And this um, sense of agency I would say has been shattered in a number of ways recently. I mean, we have been going through the COVID crisis where many people felt helpless, they felt isolated, and also uh, the world uh, climate change has become much more tangible for us. Also in Europe, we've had some natural disasters further away, but they've also arrived on our doorsteps also for both our countries this uh, summer, both Austria and Greece. So it's more important than ever to have optimism if you're an, a creative person. Many challenges are also reflected on the UN Sustainable Development Goals of the uh, United Nations um, and I think it's important not just to think, you know, on a real big global plane, but to think about local solutions that might also be adapted to become, you know, a bigger thing. Uh, I think uh, initiatives like Eco Week, 
play a very important role in this because they not only raise awareness, but also want to change actually the day-to-day -day behavior, which is a very first important step in changing overall trends and phenomena. I'm very happy about the Austrian contribution. Hello, Ms. Schatner. Uh, she is, of course, a very famous Austrian architect whose work also has a social dimension. Um, for me also, architecture is uh, very interesting in that there's always a dialogue between what is private and what is public, because there's nothing more intimate than actually creating a living space for another person. On the other hand, architecture is also always a public statement. So I, I find this contrast also and these synergies also really interesting. Now, I've promised not to talk too much and leave uh, the space to the panelists. So let me quickly thank uh, the team of ECOWIC for organizing this great conference and also the panelists for uh, contributing and especially, of course, Ms. Schatner from Austria. Enjoy. Thank you very much, Kalidia Skedasi. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your contribution. And uh, you raised up uh, very important points uh, from uh, the local communities to the innovation. And uh, um, I think it's uh, something we, we, we have in common that if you don't change in a very small scale, how you can actually contribute in the much larger scale. So we really thank your contribution and the collaboration. And uh, not only now, we have, been, uh, we have worked together in the past, so we appreciate your, your support. Thank you so much. Um, now I would like to invite Mrs. Uh, Ulrike Sartner, um, who is not new to Echo Week. Uh, we had we had her we had her um, back in uh, October. Um, so welcome again, Ulrike. Yeah. Uh, Ulrike Hello. is an architect with a, a wide experience in academia and in the private sector. In 1999, she founded the Kappenrau uh, in Vienna together with Alexander Hartner. Um, her work in the field of architecture, urban planning and design um, is quite innovative. And uh, she also did for the TU Vienna, uh, the KTH Stockholm, TU Graz, uh, among others. Um, as said, uh, in, uh, 2000, in October of 2020, we became introduced us to the social aspect of architecture, and specifically in the topic of homelessness. homelessness. Today, um, the second uh, part on the edge, um, we will talk about how basically to get your ground under your feet. And uh, of course, it's still not easy to be homeless. It's uh, still a major issue. Um, and as we mentioned, the lecture was made possible through the support of the Austrian Embassy in Greece, and we really thank them for the collaboration. Um, Ulrike, welcome again. Nice to see you, and the yeah. stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you, all of us. Hello, everybody. Um, just a moment, I have to, yes. Uh, thank you for your nice uh, introduction. Thank you, Mrs. Uh, Herman, for your kind words. I'm really happy to be here uh, again, actually. And um, uh, well, I maybe I start with a few words about we have uh, started. Of course, we were not just making social projects uh, from from the beginning, but we are quite small office. Um, so we decided to make all pro kind of projects, but uh, we will not participate in um, open uh, competitions. And uh, why we will not do that is uh, we thought uh, there is so much time and actually it's just the winner who will uh, get the job and all the others uh, will just produce for the waste paper bin and this uh, we thought will not make so much uh, sense for us so we tried to give all our effort into social projects instead and uh, that's why we um, started to do this in the beginning actually voluntarily 
um, and uh, for homeless people uh, in the, for the main reason, but then followed by different kind of projects uh, for alcohol addicts or for um, even for refugees after 2015. Uh, we live and work in Vienna, and this is really a wealthy city, so you may uh, ask yourself why it's still possible that people have to live under the bridge. Uh, we have uh, investigated uh, a lot of places uh, where homeless people find a shelter, and uh, we find out that actually there are a lot of initiatives uh, in Vienna who are helping people, uh, but sometimes or yeah, sometimes they just offer sleeping places to conditions these people can't take, like uh, alcohol is not allowed or your dog is not welcome, the last uh, thing you have in the world, or it's difficult for couples to find a place over the night, or it's very um, difficult to bring your things with you. And in the most uh, places, you are just allowed to stay overnight and then you have uh, to go away in, in the morning. So um, living on the streets causes mental problems as well. Uh, so for some of the people, it's just not possible to live with other people in a dormitory because they have unlearned social behavior. So we wanted to expand the offers already existing. The starting point of our um, the starting point of our sorry, I just have a problem here. So the starting point of our project um, I would like to show in the first uh, run is um, actually uh, resulting out of student protests against the worsening of uh, the stu study conditions in 2009. Uh, the students occupied the auditorium of the University of Vienna over months. And uh, after a time, homeless people find out that there is a warm place where they can stay overnight and they joined them, which of course uh, starts a little uh, problems. But then the students um, managed to involve the homeless people in their campaigning. And after the protests were ended, some of the students still felt uh, responsible for them. So these, uh, this group of uh, students found an empty house close to the main university in the city center. Um, uh, it was empty for many years because it was not very interest, uh, interested for, for other developers. And actually, in the first case, they uh, wanted to occupy this property as well, but then they decided to try another quite smarter strategy. They know that the industrialist and philanthropist Hans-Peter Haselsteiner was supporting different social projects, and they asked him for financial support. And he arranged the contact to the association Vincent's Gemeinschaft St. Stephen, which was dealing with homes for uh, homeless people, and they started to discuss different uh, propositions. The resulting idea was to try a shared apartment house uh, with possibilities to work. Uh, this hasn't existed before, as the students and homeless people were never uh, living together in, 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 in a flat. So you may um, assume that these two groups are very different, but actually they share one thing in common and that's um, a lack of economical possibilities. It's hard for both groups to find inexpensive homes and jobs to finance their lives. Um, the project in mind should generate both jobs and living. Um, the old house, empty for many years, and as I said, quite unattractive for developers, was bought and donated by Mr. Haselsteiner to the association. And then in a very intense planning process over years between the students, our architecture firm and the member of St. Stephen um, began. And the final idea was to install this inclusive, inclusive living and um, working space. As long as possible, we uh, tried to uh, have the volunteers and the students and the homeless people there to rebuild the house. Uh, and uh, just the main construction work was done by professionals due to um, insurance questions, of course. Um, 
So then actually 2013, this project was um, ready and uh, uh, additional top floor could be generated uh, due to the building regulations. And um, today, 30 students and formerly homeless people live and work there together in 10 living communities. How does this look like? Uh, on every floor, you find uh, three apartments for three people. Also, there are students and uh, homeless people living together in these flats. They share a bathroom and a small kitchen. But um, additional to that, on every floor, there are common spaces like a big living, uh, living room and a big uh, kitchen and an outdoor place uh, where you can meet. So if you have a very small room for yourself, there has to be the possibility that you have other spaces as well, um, then, then you can deal with a small room. Um, a new access in form of a Laubengang leads to these common areas and uh, the open spaces have a deconflicting influence on this heterogenic inhabitants. Of course, um, there are con conflicts, but if you have uh, quite a, many possibilities to, to, to leave spaces or to, to come into spaces, uh, then it's easier for you to, to, you don't have to meet the people you are quarreling right now we found out. So um, on the other hand, it's quite nice if you're on this uh, pergola excesses, you, you even find out, oh, you look uh, downstairs, there's somebody sitting outdoors and uh, maybe I join them today and uh, I don't have to be in my own kitchen alone. So it's uh, the possibility to be alone, but it's not a must. Uh, under the roof, we could generate this new top floor and uh, Funny enough, uh, it was uh, first seen as a very unneeded luxury. So why have students or, or former homeless people have to have uh, uh, um, such a room and, and, and uh, which they don't can use as it's like a, a loft. Why do they have to have this? Um, but um, now actually it, it is the cash cow of the whole project because we rent the space for birthday parties or press conferences or yoga classes and um, this helps to pay back loans which they of course have to take for making all this renovation um, job. On three days uh, the house meetings can take place there as well so it's even open for the people living there. Uh, and then we had a nice garden. Uh, we took uh, the uh, courtyard away from the residents to transform it to a guest garden for the restaurant. Uh, but instead, or in uh, compensation for that, they got the roof terrace. Um, and we got the help of landscape architecture students to make this happen. So now there is a little bit uh, of urban gardening on this top, uh, on, on this um, terrace and the vegetable raised there finds, of course, the way to the kitchen and will be used in the restaurant. But uh, even for those who are not interested in urban gardening, it's a really beautiful recreation area in the middle of the city. Uh, for the working possibilities, we have uh, three workshops on the ground floor. Uh, they, can, they can also be used by refugees not living there. So this is a working opportunities, uh, a few hours a day, uh, which will give them a free meal and uh, free German language lessons. And the products they produce in these workshops, uh, they were given away for donations on markets. And uh, this even helps to keep the project economically alive. Um, another fact uh, is, uh, of course, uh, normally in a, in a project, uh, the manpower is the main cost factor. Um, in, in our case, it's uh, exactly the other way around because uh, we had a lot of uh, manpower for free. Uh, due to um, uh, volunteer workings, as so people. And um, 
but uh, the, the main cost factor is actually the material. So the material has to be cheap, but then um, the work can be quite expensive because it's for free. So um, as big parts of the project were financed through donations, it was of course necessary to keep costs down as much as possible. Uh, so uh, through the help of many volunteers, we could afford time consuming interior ideas like the ceiling uh, uh, and part of the walls were covered with thousands of recycled wood sheets from formal fruit crates. These fruit crates are leftovers from fruit markets. It doesn't cost uh, anything. Um, but of course the work uh, takes uh, thousands of hours to, to put it on place. And the bar, as you see, was made of wooden beams. Uh, and these beams were from the old roof structure uh, which we pulled down. So we tried to recycle things we pulled down in the house um, uh, to, to build it up in a new way. Uh, the restaurant in the basement um, uh, is uh, also here to generate work for the inhabitants. So the, the inhabitants of the house can work there, uh, but it's an offer as it's not a must. You can live there even without working there. And uh, the guests coming to this restaurant um, may consume, but they don't have to. And today, eight years later, you, can, you can't actually see any difference between people living or, and working there or visiting guests. So this restaurant really functions as a link between the social project and the neighborhood. Um, it's involving the neighborhood and it's getting a really nice um, meeting place. Um, this project is, of course, uh, many years uh, uh, ago. So uh, now I want to introduce our new um, project, which uh, started uh, actually in 2019, but then um, uh, the, the pandemic year comes, so it was... Um, actually um, closed down for half a year, a year. And uh, we faced several lockdowns, uh, but this showed us again, how extremely necessary uh, these uh, shelter projects are, because where two homeless people should go when everybody uh, is said to stay at home. Um, we, we found out it's even in this uh, period of time, it's um, really, really necessary that everybody's getting a shelter over its head. Um, uh, we had um, this, this uh, new project called Winzi Rast am Land, also Winzi Rast uh, on, on the countryside, is located not in Vienna, but in uh, Aust uh, Lower Austria, uh, close to Meierling. And uh, it should be a place where formerly homeless people will find a home in community with meaningful work. <laughs> As a working soil with your own hands, sowing seeds, planting plants, or catching up on the harvest and experiencing how something big grows and thrives strengthens self-esteem. So many homeless people went to big cities to flee from shame and defamation, but we found out not everybody is actually succeeding there. And um, uh, in, in, in many discussions, we found out that um, some of them would like to go back to the countryside again, where they actually feel more at home. Um, here again, uh, private sponsorship made it possible to reuse a formerly hotel, an awarding-winning restaurant, which won't, uh, the restaurant actually went bankrupt in 2016 and stood empty for a few years. So here there are 3,600 square meters usable area and the ground is even larger. It's 27,000 square meter ground. So the main idea was to change a place which was actually um, created for uh, very wealthy people um, to reuse it uh, as a starting point for poor people who are on their way back to a self-determined life. The property uh, dates from different periods. Uh, it uh, started with a wooden house from the early 30s. In the beginning, they were just offering refreshments to hikers or pilgrims. The first extension, a guest house, 
dates from 1972, followed by the big hotel complex from the late 80s with seminar rooms and the luxury restaurant extension from the 90s. It's a very inhomogeneous building stock, as you can see, and this was quite a challenge for us to deal with this project. Um, uh, here again, we tried to offer, uh, uh, we, as actually we are right doing this project, we, um, to make uh, different type of working possibilities and to address as many different people as possible. The former hotel provides us with a perfect commercial kitchen and really plenty of different spaces. So in the first ideas, we thought we can actually offer everything from, from living over vacations, over catering things or workshops, uh, permaculture, uh, having glass houses or greenhouses so, and uh, some, some animals there. Um, and the Raum uh, program, as we called it, was of course developed together with the association St. Stephen again. Um, and uh, the, the, the fields around it should uh, not just uh, provide the inhabitants or the summer guests with food, but even the restaurants, Vintirast Mittendrin, which uh, I mentioned in the former project there, they have just a very small kitchen. So with this new big restaurant kitchen, uh, we can um, offer a lot more than uh, the caterings they are able to do now. Uh, the, we can also make vegetable crates, uh, which uh, they can bought directly from the farm as well as fresh products from the goats. And the chicken we will have there will not just uh, supply eggs, but their dung is really necessary to fertilize the fields. And so um, the cycle closes. Uh, we will have a farm shop uh, that should offer homemade products. Um, and uh, also give an opportunity to local farmers to sell their products. It's always very necessary to um, bring the surrounding into the project. It's not something it, which stays on its own, uh, but we really try to get as many people involved as possible. Um, this uh, farm shop, and, and maybe a little uh, refreshment store there, will hopefully not attract just the guests from the surroundings, but also tempting by Nice uh, people for a sunning out. The shelves, um, are, even in this project, we try to, to, to get as many donations as possible. So the shelves we will use in this farmer shop uh, were originally used in an exhibition, uh, actually uh, art exhibitions, and uh, now they are donated to us so we can build up a new uh, shop design with it. Uh, there are a lot of hotel rooms, of course, and uh, they have very different sizes. Uh, so we can host formerly homeless people who are, will work in the fields and with the hotel guests uh, and people living there and working there, as well as these short time guests. Uh, what are we thinking of? We are thinking about um, single parents or social disadvantaged groups who would otherwise find it quite difficult to afford a holiday. So um, they are welcome uh, and maybe helping and making the breakfast or working a few hours in the fields or in the kitchen. So uh, it, uh, as it's not just holiday, but they also should be part of, of, of this agriculture project. Seminar rooms can be hired with the possibility to stay overnight. And uh, People with very different backgrounds will meet and participate in this project and uh, to different conditions and, of course, different room rates according to their possibilities to pay. Uh, on the top floor, uh, we had the former flat of the owner. Uh, this is located under the roof, so um, we can use it, for instance, for pupils or uh, on class trips. We think about shared room concepts there. 
So the pupils uh, should come into contact with, with uh, alternative agriculture methods or learn how to cook a healthy meal. Uh, and uh, on the other side, there is a pilgrim path from Heiligenkreuz to Mariazell, which is actually passes uh, passing by uh, there. So we will also offer pilgrims um, uh, a bed over the night. Uh, for, for the concept, uh, the, the different facades and building styles are too expensive to, to change, so we decided on making them just invisible. The concept of uh, facade greening underlines the farming concept, and it makes us forget the aesthetic shortcomings. Um, there are uh, flat roofs located over the, the most recent edition of these buildings, and they're right now not used. So we are in contact with the University of Natural Resources and Life Science in Vienna, and we want to start uh, test fields there, um, just to look what is possible to, uh, as a growing methods on, on, on flat roofs. Uh, we hope this will be a nice project with the university there. And all these ideas need financing. Also the renovation of the main building is actually paid by the owner. But the adaptation to the needs for the tenants, also this association St. Stephen, has to find supporters and sponsoring. So uh, last year, um, we tried to promote the project and we start uh, with the pumpkin festival there. It was held on the site. And uh, we also started crowdfunding campaign, uh, which was actually quite um, successfully done so that's good um, to, to spread uh, information was the best way to get all kind of donations and um, donations even in very different sizes not just uh, money uh, like this uh, old barn for example uh, so what we do with an old barn uh, being on a whole uh, hill as so on another place we, we um, could uh, establish a cooperation with teachers and pupils from a technical high school. And these pupils um, dissembled the barn. They marked every single piece of the wood uh, and then they rebuilt it on our site. So this was a very nice project for the pupils to find out about the building and construction uh, done uh, in former times and then uh, how to rebuild this old barn here. Um, and of course, uh, some of the pieces uh, broke, but uh, the missing wood panels were replaced by new ones. Uh, and uh, the barn itself attracted another donator who wanted to show uh, its new uh, system of uh, solar panels. Uh, so in, uh, we we just put the, the sonal panels on this old barn. And now new technology meets old craftsmanship in a very nice uh, way. Uh, today, this barn accommodates 200 chicken and uh, they are really necessary to supply the perma aquaculture with uh, fertilizer. Another donation was the greenhouse. Uh, it was also empty and should be thrown down. So uh, with the help of volunteers, we could find a new place here. So they demolished it there and, and rebuild it on our site. Uh, and um, beside of, of uh, the needs for, for, for agriculture, we will reserve a part of it to a rent space. Uh, you remember the, the top floor of the old project and now we would like to do the same here, but in the, in the farming house. So hopefully this will also gain an income to the project. Uh, and then we rebuild the dorm for the formerly staff to new guest rooms. So in the end, uh, we will have 77 people living here, also living here also, or have the possibility to stay overnight or will be our guests. And of course, like always in these old projects, uh, we had to replace almost all house technique, uh, electrics, uh, electrics and the energy supplying system, which was uh, oil actually. So the old 
oil tank was demolished and uh, replaced by a wood chip heating system. And we also, as you see in the picture, we add a cistern to collect the rainwater, which we will use in the fields. Uh, this summer, uh, the construction work is starting up now after this pandemic a year. Uh, we, we lost actually a year, but now in the, in the, um, as a few months ago, we could start with the, with the working. And uh, even uh, the first groups of volunteers and future residents are planting the fields. Uh, which is really nice because we think um, a building project doesn't start with cutting some ribbon on the opening, uh, but it's really a process. So uh, many people will be involved in this process, in this project. They will share time and hopefully experiences and different perspectives uh, with each other under this uh, coming up time of the project. And it will be a place of exchanging ideas and the meeting point for people, and this is really important, people who otherwise will never have met. Uh, we all live in our bubbles. So it's a lack of places where people of, with different backgrounds can meet. And we hope that this will lead to more empathy in the long, long run, because just if you meet in an analog way, you really, um, can gain some empathy. Uh, and I will close this with uh, uh, Hilary Silver. Uh, she thinks uh, it's not the conventional roof of our, over our heads that gives us the belonging. It's the social structures that support us. And, and we will re really underline this. Um, because as, a, as architects, of course, we can't save the world as we often like to do, but um, we have a lot of skills and we have a lot of tools. And with that, we can contribute through suitable and social sustainable architecture. Um, yes, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Lizzie. And I think that's uh, the most important uh, uh, lesson. I mean, that's what we learned in the pandemic. During the pandemic, it's what we kept us close with the social uh, mm -hmm. relationship, not where, not where the houses were, or what kind of house uh, we were, we had. Um, the presentation was very interesting once again, and um, I, I wouldn't. I, I, I do have a few questions. I actually have many questions. We can talk about it like for hours. Seriously. Um, Yesterday I had uh, we had this uh, architectural tour and um, we're talking about um, the summer houses in Nagin Island basically and I had very something very interesting and so accurate that architecture is not innocent and uh, architecture has a responsibility um, mm -hmm. ethical responsibility um, creating you know social structures uh, overcoming uh, social problems. Um, now I understand like most, both like, you, you know, like in Greece, we also have lots of um, uh, many people who live on the edges from uh, refugees, uh, immigrants, uh, homeless people. And um, unfortunately, my, in my opinion, I think that uh, the approach is not that sensitive. How easy is uh, as an architect not to get involved with the politics uh, of those social issues? Because uh, it, it can become quite political after a point. As actually, I think uh, architecture is very political, and of course, every architect has to to um, put these questions into mind. And uh, if if uh, as a, for sure, I think I think the, the most probable it's it's pro it's uh, it's difficult because um, we are as a, even even in Austria we are very uh, used to to just to relate on our our. Um, about politicians or, or that the social structure of the, of the country will solve every problem. But then we see actually uh, you, you, they, they take a lot, but sometimes you really have to, inter to interfere. Um, uh, and uh, it's, it's really important that you um, also create your own projects as well. As you can't wait that somebody is doing something for you. 
but uh, start the whole process of your own and find people who are thinking in the same way and, 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 and start in your surrounding. As, as I said, you can't save the world, but you can really start in, 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 in the surrounding of yourself and try to, to, to yeah, make um, projects which, which are really um, necessary. There's so many unnecessary stuff um, being built. So uh, yes, you know what I mean. <laughs> but it's also what uh, Mrs. Herman said that you you need to change your micro scale in order to have an impact, you know, to the larger scale. And it's so true. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's we also started in a very small a small community. point, you know. We, we, we started also with very uh, small things on, 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 on the side, which we really uh, did uh, without getting any money. And then these things uh, grow, of course, because you, you get more and more people, you get more and more people to know that you're doing such things. Mm -hmm. And then you start with this donation things and, and, and things grow. And from something we, we, you just do on, on the side a few hours a day, it, it, it is really getting uh, our profession now. And um, yeah, yeah it takes, it takes years, but uh, uh, I thought it, it's making more sense and doing um, these competitions for, for nothing. Mm -hmm to invest the time and, and the effort in such project. Yes. I totally agree. We have a question for I, I, yeah. I'm joining in. I'm joining in, first of all, to say hi to Rike. Yeah, hey, Elias. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. How are you? Good to see you. Yeah, yeah, same. Thank you. <laughs> Good to see you. Uh, how is the weather? In, I'm asking every speaker, actually. I'm asking, what's the weather like in Austria? <laughs> yeah, as, uh, as the Hungarian uh, speaker said before, uh, it's uh, autumn, uh, but uh, right now in Vienna, the sun is shining, um, but it's colder, so it's a lot colder than it should, should be in August, actually, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Um, I, I was again fascinated by your lecture, and I'm really glad that you're tackling those issues, because the architects tend to look at the you know the star architects as the models, and not to look at the as the community or the or the or the city mm -hmm. or the neighborhood as the resource for creativity, and and that reminds me something that uh, when I was a student, I, I went to see Hassan Fatri in Cairo, and one mm -hmm. thing that he said is that young architects should look for inspiration in their neighborhood, yes. you know, in, from the problem of the neighborhood, and not to try to look at the, the magazines to find inspiration. Yeah. And, and I think that really connects with what you said and about how young architects can find the first commission. You know, they can actually create it on their own. They don't have to wait for somebody to call them up. They just create something out of nothing by just looking at the problems around them. Yeah. And I think that's a beautiful uh, lesson that you're bringing. And uh, it's very meaningful and it's very powerful because there's so many problems. <laughs> and there's so many problems today. Yes, and, and also when, when you're creating uh, your own projects, you are allowed to, um, to, to, to say what it, should, uh, what it should be about. Because often in these competitions, you get the room program and you are not allowed to, to add something or to leave something and, and you can't contrib contrib contribute with, with your, your own ideas. So I, I think the whole process that you and, and actually the people living there or, or the people are paying for that, working in a, in a very close together and making the program is the most important thing to create things which are a little bit out of the main road. Okay. I mean, the competitions that you mentioned are definitely, Sometimes it's a waste of time, but sometimes you do find architects diverting from the program, but we never learn about this until the architect actually presents their own projects. Mm. We never find a competition saying, you know what, this was the mainstream, this is the winning uh, uh, project, yeah. but we yeah. had some very interesting, you know, out of the box solutions and we'd like to speak about them. Nobody says that, you know, we never hear yeah. about them. Yeah. And, and also the thing about these competitions is that it's always just the winner. I mean, I think if, if there are, let's say, 100 different firms uh, thinking about one thing, if you would take together all these 100 firms to, to one project, think what, what, uh, what uh, a rich uh, project it could be. And then you mm. put away 99 of these and just put one. So I, I don't, I, not that the winner is not good. I will not say that. But you could gain so much more. 
for the project if you could involve the other uh, others as well as well for the yes. main attractive ideas of, of such a competition so i i don't know i have no better ideas for competitions but uh, yeah maybe <laughs> it will get come into a different uh, way sometimes Mm. Um, Desperately, you said there was a question from yeah, the audience? Some questions. Yeah, we can uh, raise them up a bit, uh, answer a bit quick because we're running out of time. So the first question is, uh, first of all, great lecture. Could we have some more details regarding the financial sustainability of the project for students, homeless and refugees? Mm -hmm. And um, then Ileana uh, says that uh, the idea of reuse an old and unuseful talent, transform it into a place for the homeless, is really altruistic and incredible. I would like to ask how the people living near the hotel thought about this transformation, considering that racism is always something that exists. Also, a hotel brings to, uh, many, to a place many income from the tourists, but also because people can work there, and those who experience that tend to have the need to revive it. So I believe that this is a really risky idea and can bring many objections. How can an architect exceed this objection and convince people with their design? Okay, there are a lot of uh, um, questions. I don't know if I can uh, answer it in a very uh, short way. Uh, but uh, financing, of course, a big, a big deal of our uh, financing is actually um, uh, donations. Um, or it's uh, from this philanthropist who is who's paying a lot of money to these projects. And uh, of course, it's very hard to say for young people, find a philanthropist and, and, and maybe he is uh, financing your projects. But in our case, we were lucky to find somebody who, who was doing that. And, and then the rest uh, is making this, this uh, financial com campaigns. And a lot of uh, as attracting people who are working for free of course, and attract, uh, attracting the building uh, industry, uh, industry to um, donate um, material. Uh, so this as well is getting the costs down. And the second question was, I can't remember, to, to how, how to get uh, the surroundings uh, involved. That's a, that's a hard thing. Yeah, also in, in, in this law, in the last project, everybody, nobody is living around. So this was uh, not, not so hard. And um, as we said, we will, want, will uh, even uh, provide uh, things for, for the community. As it's not that we take, uh, take things to the project, but we will also give, give away. So there, there will be this uh, uh, refreshment thing. There will be things which the community around also can uh, take uh, advantage of. Uh, a small uh, practical thing is we had, of course, a, a, a laundry there for the hotel thing. There was a laundry and then there was an, an, an uh, old people home close by and they said uh, well uh, it's so so um, can you wash our our clothes or or our you know our textiles and then we said yeah of course we have the laundry uh, this is actually some work for people living there and and we we can make the laundry so uh, this type of project is even uh, getting more people involved uh, live, living in the surroundings and, and giving actually things back as well Mm -hmm. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Again. Uh, okay. Yes, yeah, so we'll, we'll be in touch for the book as well. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much once again. Yeah. Um, and uh, Mrs. Herman and the Austrian Embassy. Um, coming up next, I would like to invite uh, Evzina Architecture, Zagora Kiryafini, and Fotini uh, Liberiado, and uh, we apologize for the small delay. Um, Zina, uh, Theodore Kiliafini and Fotini Liberiado are coming from Greece. Um, is an Evzina Architecture is an international award-winning architecture office in the grading landscape, natural laws and human needs in a sustainable way. The core team uh, consists of Theodore Kiliafini, Fotini Liberiado, Androniki Liberiado, and Kostadinos Despotidis, and uh, Adonia Thiniado, I hope I haven't forgotten anyone, so apologies. Uh, the company holds a Class D professional license degree for public buildings in categories six, building architectural design and seven, special architectural design. 
Uh, Zen Architecture aims through bioclimatic, ecological, holistic, innovative design to create spaces that act positively on the use of psychology, offer wellness, enhance health and joy. The company's philosophy is to build with nature in a human scale, to embrace its user following principles of green and low energy design with low maintenance. As an architecture specializes, among others, in high quality resorts, spa, and holistic wellness centers. Uh, Theodora and Fotigny are also not new in the Apple family. We have been working with them closely uh, for many, many years uh, now. And um, today's topic is uh, building with nature, uh, resorts through the eyes of sustainability. Thank you so much, and welcome, Theodora and Fotigny. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, so, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, so, thank you very much uh, for inviting us. And um, this time it's, it is online. Uh, hello from me as well. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, for me, yes, we can hear you. Okay, Welcome. hello from me as well. It's very nice to be with everyone here online. Okay, uh, sorry, I, I, I'm, um, um, so our presentation is about building with nature and uh, about results uh, through the eyes of sustainability. Nature is our basis for everything. Every project, initiative, intervention should first focus on nature and then profit. The old model of separation, competition and conflict still prevails today. According to this model, we behave separated from the earth and the natural environment. This is a mentality that has penetrated deeply into our society and uh, the global economy, contributing to climate change and the um, economic crisis. Circular economy practices and sustainable design solutions support our reconnection with the natural environment. Ecological design and building with nature is the only way for our survival on planet Earth. According to the World Building uh, Green Council, sustainable green growth focuses not only on energy efficiency, but also on human health, in wellness and in harmony with nature. So what is building with nature? It is architecture which answers to the deep human need to become one with nature, because we are one with nature. It is architecture which understands the ecosystem. It means to respect nature and natural forces, to integrate nature into design, to follow bioclimatic principles, to understand the bios, the life of each different place and build according to its climate. To get advantage of the sun, the winds, the natural conditions, the indigenous plants, the social life. It means to include local communities to build with local ecological natural materials. Okay, now... I will share my screen. Okay. Um, the United Nations, can you hear my, can you see my screen? Okay. Okay. The United Nations uh, supports that sustainable tourism is based on local social inclusiveness, on ethical employment and economic growth, 
poverty reduction and environmental protection. That's how it can be sustainable from both sides, from the hotel businesses and from the local communities. Uh, in this uh, first example that we're seeing here, it is, um, it is a sustainable hotel in uh, Mexico, which has um, created local plant systems that allow them to harvest their own bioconstruction materials from sites and uh, use local labor to build and uh, support the local community. They use natural techniques of bear construction, which seeks to integrate infrastructure into the environment, the ecosystem, and draw wisdom from the local resources and uh, tradition. You can see the bump. We lost what you mean. Yeah, I thought uh, it was my problem. But... Okay. Uh, maybe I will share screen. Yeah, well, we can wait for her to reconnect. It's, uh, it's yes, we lost her connection. Sorry for that. Those are uh, the joys of technology. <laughs> uh, sorry, I will. It will come, I hope, uh, with a moment. Σε φωτεινή σε χάσαμε από τα μπαμπού και μετά σε χάσαμε. Δεν έφυγε, ξαναμπε μέσα. Οκ. Until Fotini comes, I'll share screen. With um, an experience uh, from hot spring resorts in Japan, uh, where thermal bath means relaxation, company, clinic, body, and mind. Uh, the spaces are in integrated in the natural environment. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, okay. Uh, natural, okay. I'll, uh, sorry, sorry, I uh, sorry for wrong connection again. Okay, spaces are integrated in the natural environment. Natural habitats are often created in dense urban areas in a way it is difficult to recognize that it is a human intervention. The design follows the philosophy of unity and connection. Passages between rocks, waterfalls, streams, natural gardens transform the bathic process into a ceremony and pleasant adventure. In Japan, spa tourism is a place for business. People from all ages are attracted throughout the year, mainly for rejuvenation, for socializing and entertainment, and secondarily for cure of diseases. 
Sorry uh, for the knee is trying uh, to call me. Ne, συνδέσου, συνέχισα με την Ιαπωνία και τα δικά μας παραδείγματα και μετά έλα εσύ. So, uh, what are the principles of uh, bioclimatic architecture and building with nature? Uh, here are some examples for our work to explain how bioclimatic design works, taking care of local climate and tradition. Uh, this could be a result, but it is the European School in Crete, designed with a holistic approach, incorporates principles of ancient and vernacular local architecture. Nature enters in into the courtyards and to, into the interiors. Through the building program, uh, though the building program was uh, big, scale and volumes, I kept small, respecting the environment and responding to basic human needs. There is a microclimate improvement through tree planting shading, green roofs, pergolas. Summer temperature decreases. In winter, thermal comfort conditions are achieved with reduced wind speed. The largest side of all the buildings is 100% south facing in order to achieve maximum thermal gains in the winter and ensure an easy sun protection in the summer. Passive thermal gains are achieved through southern glass facades. Thermal gains are achieved through winter gardens as well. An additional passive thermal system is the thermal wall and here uh, particularly the trump wall. Thermal comfort is achieved through good natural insulation and thermal mass materials. Natural cooling uh, happens through shading the elevations with timber arcades and their green roofs or timber blinds. Green walls, wooden pergolas, uh, trees and vegetation, protect the western and eastern elevations, as well as vertical blinds. Natural cooling is achieved as well through vertical ventilation in the buildings, the well-known stack effect. The operation of the openings is connected to the energy management system. Atriums uh, and passages cool the building complex as well. They are aligned to the summer breezes in order to cool the courtyards. Within the courtyard, natural cooling is achieved in the summer and thermal comfort in the winter. Courtyards are surrounded by buildings and their arcades. All spaces have ample natural lighting due to the small width of the buildings. Reflectors provide visual comfort. Rainwater is collected in underground reservoirs and streams. Materials are recyclable and of low embodied energy. They are biodegradable. Latent breathing of the building shell is ensured so that the humidity of the interior air will be vented to the outside. The complex consumes at least possible energy, the least possible energy, only with passive design. Here 
Here is a building complex in Panorama, Thessaloniki, where the sculptural shapes, the small volumes and the carves of the buildings are purely the result of designing with bioclimatic principles. All rooms face uh, with big glass windows uh, and thermal mass to the south. The northern side has very small windows. The western and eastern side have smaller openings to protect the interior from overheating in the summer. The macroclimate is improved through green roofs and through shading and planting the empty plot with trees and bushes in uh, targeted areas. Here you see big southern glass surfaces and small northern openings and vertical blinds for western and eastern openings. Um, with uh, the red ve vectors, uh, we show the mass walls on the southern facades with openings for ventilation in the summer. Pergola shelters protect the southern glass surfaces. And the indication, the inclination of uh, these uh, timber blinds uh, in pergolas is the winter sun rays inclination to enable plenty of winter sun penetrating the interiors. Laminated timber roof construction, local stone and marble are used with supplementary geothermal energy and a few photovoltaics, the complex consumes zero energy. A summer vacation complex in Halkidiki next to the seaside. Local stone and hydraulic earthen plasters in the local traditional way are used as well as uh, wood wool insulation, pine wood timber, and 40 centimeter thick walls for thermal mass. The heavy ground floor is designed as a continuation and extension of the rocks. The upper floor is a response to the sea waves and the pine trees of the area. The idea of this touristic complex uh, in Nea Peramos of Cavalla is to design a small ecological retreat made 100% with natural materials as an extension of the surrounding hill landscape. Little dome shelters are covered with soil and plantation. The only visible architectural elements are the big southern glass facades. Little openings on the northern side enable the summer breezes cooling the interiors. The supporting construction is laminated timber. Thermal insulation is made of straw. The wall fillings and plaster are of earth. Skylights on the top of the roof enable natural cooling and ambient natural lighting. This is a, the master plan for thermal and wellness spa in Fermi, Thessaloniki, with a care and a rehabilitation center, hotel complex, and congress center. The building complex is on the area of the old thermal springs, which are abandoned and do not work today.
The big building program is broken in small volumes integrated in the natural environment. Southern orientation for thermal gains and natural cooling. Courtyards with the concept of uh, a traditional village, openings to the summer breezes for cooling. Microclimate improvement with plantation, pergola, streams, green roofs. Natural local materials are used. The old indoor spa is renovated. There are small outdoor and indoor pools following the small scale philosophy. I will try to connect now uh, for the knee. Okay. I'll do the share of the screen. Okay. Yes, for me. Okay. Okay. Hello again. Sorry for before. So, and, we're going uh, back. Um, what? And, and slideshow. Yeah. Compound slide. We're going back to Mexico again now to see a few examples of um, resorts from other architects that they, um, they integrate sustainability in all its forms and the buildings and how it affects the local economy and community. So this one in Mexico, I wanted to go back, is they use natural materials as cob in the walls, wattle and wap, dab um, in the construction. As you can see on the right, they leave some truth windows as they're called so that the guests can see how the walls are made and uh, they, don't, they don't leave any waste in the area. Uh, okay. They use, uh, through the regenerative, this hotel, they seek to remind all the team members, the community and the guests, the value of the local knowledge of working with their hands together as a community and turning what some people consider the, as a waste into tasteful walls, common spaces, and roofs. They have set up as well a trust, a regenerative trust that uh, includes a 2% fee in the total bill of the guest as a contribution to the environment and the local community. This fund goes directly to impact efforts to support health, education, and economic opportunities. Uh, this resort is 100% off-grid, its energy comes entirely from solar, and water comes from an on-site well. They have, uh, regarding the, the farm and reforestation, they tend to, to the land in regenerative ways to create opportunities for exploring the very diverse ecosystem, to, and to get valuable and shareable knowledge and ensure that the guests will get something and make an impact in their own communities when they leave from there. Uh, there is a water and energy and reforestation station in the area. And as well, they support the local turtle sanctuary, which is run by volunteers. Uh, they enrich not only the environment, but also the well-being of the local community, which is an integral part of uh, the resort and they improve the education, the health and their economies. Um, this is another example in um, Thailand. It's a six-star hotel resort, very different from what you know, people consider as a six-star uh, resort. Um, which is uh, on, built on the hillsides and they use traditional pitch roofs there. The angles of the roofs are steep and this is owed to the high rainfall. The hillside villas are set back hidden from the resort access road and certain parts are cantilevered on the platforms to protect the terrain. 
And all the guest rooms follow exactly the traditional Thai houses design. They use natural materials like uh, plantation eucalyptus and pine for the structure, bamboo for structure and cladding, and earth added to the interior renders. Some roofs are green and the openings allow natural light and wind to circulate. And uh, the large trees, they are all undisturbed and they kept in their own locations. Here you can see some of the bioclimatic principles and passive cooling systems that they have used throughout the resorts. This is an ecological children activity and education center that they built on the site, particularly for the children of the guests and for the local children. Uh, the buildings were designed as a series of pavilions in the landscape and they draw exactly from the knowledge of the tradition and the technologies and they're very simple to assemble and appropriate to the climate. You can see here this is a traditional village, it looks almost the same. And there is a foundation that they've set up for, for the same uh, reasons to support the local community. Because it's quite a remote area, they designed these modules which were developed for bathing, sleeping, lounging and outdoor living areas, which they can be rearranged to achieve the desired size villa. So for future expansion of the resort, accommodation can be easily achieved by reusing and reconfiguring these common elements. The buildings fit within the natural topography of the steepest sloping sides, and they avoid any removal of trees and any impacts on the hillside. This is another example um, in Vietnam. It's a farm which hosts families who learn about uh, nature, permaculture, hor horse riding and sustainable construction. It is a cost-effective structure which uses locally sourced materials and bioclimatic design principles to stay natural, cool, and comfortable all year round. The bioclimatic design facilitates the sun orientation and the wind direction, both during the dry season, in order to get the maximum benefits of the natural airflow, but also during the rainy season to protect the facade from water. The building has a simple steel structure, tailor-made near the sides. They use local bricks for the walls and natural lime plastering mixed with local red sand. The most, the most interesting thing is that the insulation that they use in the roof is from a Vietnamese rice mix. Uh, plus, uh, the atomicus earth, which is um, helps from preventing uh, insects to grow in the rice. Because the rice is full of uh, silicate, this resists well to the humidity of the, tropic, of the tropical climate of the area and is also low cost and biodegradable. The doors and the windows are solid wood with bamboo weaving. All six, all six have push buttons for water saving and awareness. They use tri toilet toilet systems. The handrails and pergolas are made with water resistant uh, wood from Vietnam. And all the plants around the building are local species. They, they require very low maintenance and they help the microclimate around the area. Um, this is a completely different example in Tasmania in uh, Australia. It's a very remote uh, resort. And the landscape prior to the construction was extremely damaged. So as part of the project, they wanted to heal the surrounding landscape. So the buildings were located to retain all of the existing vegetation and trees. They created protection zones for establishing uh, 
for for uh, during the construction period, and they did extensive uh, replanting for in the landscape design. Another issue in the area is the water usage because uh, it's a typically drought affected area. So they created lots, uh, they created rainwater collection and storage infrastructure off site. And the last example we're going to see, it's uh, in the borders between Utah and Arizona in the United States. Uh, this area is full of rocks near the Grand Canyon. Here, the landscape and the lights were the principal sources of inspiration. To capture the desert landscape, strong symbol geometries backdrop the rough texture rock, allowing the natural contours to inform the nature and the man-made construct. The exposed materials are wood, water, and light. They use that as a material as well, and concrete which is mixed with a local soil to match the neutral orange hues and help to capture these unique uh, desert features in the area. The way the resort blends, blends with the landscape. Um, the 34 suites uh, are wrapped around uh, a rock formation, which is surrounded by the pool and uh, this way, every room faces the desert or the, lock, the rock formation, and the guests have the feeling that they are coming out. This architecture is quite strong, but private as well, and it is inspired by the quality of light and the purity of water from the river Colorado, which is near the canyon. Um, did you speak oh. about the baths before? Yes. Okay. So... That was, uh, these were the examples that show uh, who, sustainabilities. Who, 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 who spoke about that? Yeah. Uh, okay. Great, thank you very much. No, I cannot uh, turn on my video, Despina. Okay. Uh, have a look. Sorry for, hey, hey, for the sorry, oh, sorry yeah. about that. I, I made you a co-host so you can uh, this is matter. Uh, do uh, you, you can turn on your video now. I fixed okay, that. thank you. Because you got off uh, offline and then online again and you lost the okay, okay. the uh, definition, sorry. <laughs> and uh, take this opportunity to say hi to Dora and uh, Fatimi. Thank you for joining. Yeah. Thank you. So it's great you. to see your uh, your work, and uh, and it was great that you're connecting the, um, the lecture with the workshop because uh, the thermal uh, uh, baths are also yeah. not, not only something uh, uh, important and in interesting on its own, but it's also connected to the workshop you're doing in Egina. So yes, that's the lecture very, uh, was especially very for, for the. the <laughs> Super, thank you. Okay. Um, I would like to make a question to the both of you. Um, you. You have a very sensitive approach, and we have seen that in the, we can see your references. We have also seen like your amazing project with the school, among others. Um, we, I don't know in what kind of state the school is now, and uh, but I was wondering how. How easy is for architects in Greece to have this kind of approach to try to incorporate the sustainability in their design? Because we all know that uh, you know most of the principles are not laws. Mr. Law is going to explain to us later also. Uh, but somewhere like uh, throughout the year, they kind of forgot the, the basic principles. Um, so my main question is basically: Do you think that the legislation is actually enough? Or protects this kind of approach uh, in the design. Do you have any issues uh, in your projects because of the legislation or the bureaucracy in Greece? Uh, yes, Fotini? Yeah, I would say that the, whatever we design is according to the legislation. 
there is no uh, we take the rules of the legislation and we try to, to to design around them i mean although sometimes they're quite uh, they're they're very limited um we try to work uh, we try to work around them Laura, do you want to say something about it? Yes, uh, and uh, sometimes the effort to combine um, so new ideas, uh, creativity, and the requirements of the clients and the climate, climate and the um, surrounding environment and the legislation uh, brings two interesting uh, mm. results. Uh, so all you have seen is actually a result of this uh, combination. Yeah. Uh, and uh, sometimes it's interesting to <laughs> to work on it. It's a, a sort of creativity as well. Okay, it's this a challenge. Is, uh, it's a challenge many times. It's a challenge. Yeah, yeah. Then the result is more uh, is more interesting at the end. It is not easy uh, during the, the world, but uh, okay, as Fotini said, it is a challenge. I think uh, the, the most interesting process that comes to you know, challenges, challenging processes anyway. Uh, that's a beauty, I guess, because <laughs> uh, you, you try to think uh, in a more like in a different way, you know, try, trying to work around it. and. Uh, Fantastic. Thank you so much. Well, really looking forward to see the results of the workshop and uh, especially for the thermal baths. For me personally, it's a very, it's a topic that I have never explored. So I'm really interested in the workshop. Um, and uh, I would like to invite now Mr. Mr. Floros, um, which uh, he has been with us since the morning. So really thank you for bearing with us and waiting and uh, being with us today. Um, Christos Flor is an architect in the Health Facility Planner in Greece. He founded his architectural studio in Athens in 1977. Um, has built uh, architectural projects including hospitals, university buildings, research laboratories, museums, cultural buildings, commercial buildings, housing, among, the, among others. Several of the above projects have been presented in architectural magazines. He's awarded with 10 prizes in architectural competitions. He's a member of the National Committee that created the Greek Building Regulations, author of three books, has published 52 papers, and he has also an academic experience both in Greece and the UK. And he's the author of the book, The Ecological Goal in Developmental Policy and the, I'm sorry, in Regional Planning. Uh, of Athens 1973. Uh, today's lecture will present us um, a lesson that uh, um, we can learn from the Greek traditional climatic architecture. Uh, the stage is yours, Mr. Floros. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, Mr. Flores, are you with us? No, not happening. Uh, Mr. Flores? No, I, I don't know what happened. Um, okay, maybe, maybe. Oh. Christos, his microphone is on. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Mr. Floro? Hello? Hello, yes. Hello. There he is. Hello, nice to see you. Okay. Thank you for being with us today. Έχετε πρόβλημα με το με το να μοιράσετε την οθόνη; Να δείξετε την οθόνη σας; 
Πες όχι. 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 Το, το πρόβλημά μου είναι μετά πώς θα βάλω κάποιες φωτογραφίες που έχω πάνω στην οθόνη μου. Άμα μπορείτε να τις ανοίξετε μία-μία, οπότε στην ουσία όταν τις ανοίγετε θα τις βλέπουμε εμεί. Μάλιστα. Ή μπορώ να τις βάλω εγώ να τις ανοίξουμε. Απλά δεν ξέρω την ροή που της, ε, θα θέλει να μιλήσει η φωτογραφία. Καλά. Ε, τώρα αν τις πατήσω θα βγουνε. Ναι, θα βγουνε. Ναι. Πρέ, πρέπει να γίνει share screen για να τις ναι. δούμε. Δεν μπορεί να γίνει... Ναι. Από το κουμπί κάτω εκείνο το πράσινο. Ναι, να το πάτσε το share screen. Ναι. Ηλία, μήπως πρέπει να δώσω εσύ άδεια. Σε να πάω. Όχι, όχι μπορούν. Απλά πρέπει να διαλέξετε την οθόνη που εμφανίζεται που βλέπετε αυτό που θέλετε να δείξετε. Ναι. Στο παραθυράκι που θέλετε να δείξετε. Αυτό είναι. Να το πατήσω. Ωραία. Βλέπουμε. Τώρα τις φωτογραφίες πρέπει να τις ανοίγετε μία-μία, μάλλον, για να τις δούμε. Όταν είναι. Να τις... Πατάχω έτσι και τα πατάω όταν είναι, έτσι. Ωραία, ναι. Ωραία, ωραία, ωραία. Okay. Σας ακούω. Ε... Ναι. Ωραία. Okay. Μπορείτε να ξεκινήσετε. Βλέπουμε δηλαδή την οθόνη. Αν θέλετε δηλαδή, να δείχνετε τι φωτογραφίε, μπορείτε να ξεκινήσετε. Ναι, να αρχίσω. Ναι, ναι, πάρα πολύ. Ναι. Lessons to be learned from the Greek traditional bioclimatic architecture. The know-how of the Greek traditional architecture can be utilized creatively in contemporary bioclimatic architecture. Bioclimatic architecture of the 21st century resets the goal of human living in harmony with the natural environment. Fascinated by the technological achievements of the 20th century, we built our limits with the illusion that nature cannot punish us. Now that we understood that we must build ecologically, it is useful to investigate our traditional architecture that was integrated in the ecosystem. We examined how each one of the basic components of contemporary bioclimatic architecture was realized in Greek traditional architecture, and we present characteristic paradigms from various Greek areas. This investigation is useful in promoting understanding of Greek traditional architecture through an ecological approach and enriching the contemporary bioclimatic architecture know-how so that it can be creatively utilized. Let us see the major components of Greek traditional bioclimatic architecture. One, minimizing the consumption of energy that is not derived from renewable sources. 1A. Minimization of energy consumption for buildings, materials, transportation. Through a disturbed ecological approach, we often choose materials that are friendly to the environment, but are imported from remote areas. For example, wood imported in Greece from Indonesia. Energy consumed for transportation of materials is one of the major factors that are responsible for environmental degradation. The modern movement of architecture neglected localism and caused to increase this degradation. Use of local building materials in traditional architecture was, used, was due to limited transportation potential. Nevertheless, ecologically was a perfect choice and contributed substantially to the morphological wealth of Greek traditional architecture. When building materials with special properties were required, they searched out to import them from the nearest of the areas where they could be found. Minimization of energy consumptions for heating buildings. 
It can be attained through proper design, minimizing heat loss. Thick stone or brick walls had a great thermal mass. Living spaces, particularly those used during winter, had small external openings. There was often extensive earth contact, not only in semi-buried buildings, but also in buildings where some of their walls were in contact to sloping ground. The basement of some houses was used as animal shelter. Animal here warmed human living spaces on the above story as the heat transparent wood floor separated them. 1C, use of water mills and windmills. Water mills and windmills are some of the most interesting buildings of Greek traditional architecture. Designed with special expertise in the use of renewable energy sources, they are landmarks of the traditional settlements. With water mills, waterfall dynamic energy was used to operate machines for grain miling, powder miling, tannery, ice production, and marble cutting. Water mills can be considered as ancestors of contemporary hydroelectric projects. Windmills built from the 12th to the 19th century used wind energy for grinding grain. They were mostly built on islands that do not have waterfalls while they have strong winds. Some windmills were built in the mainland too. Water saving. Cisterns. Water saving in traditional buildings in areas with no rivers and water springs is realized by collecting rainwater in cisterns. Cisterns were constructed in the basement of the building or in outdoor area near the building. Outdoor cisterns are roofed. Rainwater is mostly gathered on flat roofs. From the roof is driven to the cistern through vertical clay gutters. In some cases, rainwater falling on sloping or vaulted roofs is driven to the cistern through sophisticated constructions. Traditional building technology makes more cisterns absolutely watertight. Now, to be building surroundings. In building surroundings, the ground is not paved where it's not urgently needed. Consequently, rainwater enriches the aquifer and the hydrological cycle functions properly. This is a sketch of how this cycle works. Then we go to anti-heat provisions. Bioclimatic building design. Almost all components of the contemporary bioclimatic architecture existed in Greek traditional building design. Minimizing direct solar gain, avoiding excessive glazing. There is no extensive glazing in traditional Greek buildings. Locating window openings with climatic criteria. Since antiquity, builders were interested in locating window openings with climatic criteria. In general, they prefer to locate the larger openings on the southern and eastern walls. They try to avoid openings on the northern and western walls. Nevertheless, 
they created small openings on the northern walls to attain natural cooling during the warm periods. Arrangements differ upon the microclimate of each area. Thermal insulation. There was no special provision for thermal insulation. However, flat and vaulted roofs provided some thermal insulation. Under sloping roofs, wooden false ceilings were constructed, creating a vacant space that helped to insulate the functional spaces underneath. Passive radiative cooling. In cyclonic areas in the GMC, building cells are painted absolutely white. Consequently, the greatest percentage of long wave sun radiation is reflected and does not warm the buildings. Recent research worldwide concludes that we must paint white at least the roofs of buildings or apply white coverings. Scientists, scientists refer to the successful white painting of buildings applied in the Cycladic Islands and in other Mediterranean areas. External shading. External shading is attained with projecting canopies, arbors, trees, and climbing plants planted in proper places. Lodges shade window openings behind them. Wonder window shutters, either solid or French type, regulated entrance of sunlight in building interiors. Natural cooling, natural ventilation. Main window openings were placed, if possible, at the southern or eastern external walls of the building, and small openings were created at the top of external walls opposite to the main openings and preferably on the northern walls. During summer Titian winds, they left the windows open and wind flow entering from the small northern windows ran through the building, cooling it. During summer nights, when external temperature is lower than the temperature inside the building, hot air flows out through the small top windows and through the chimneys. You can see it here. Ground cooling. Passive ground cooling is provided during the warm periods in semi-buried buildings and in buildings where some of their walls are in contact to sloping ground. There are many semi-buried buildings in Sandorini Island where excavation of, of volcanic earth is easy. Outdoor living. A famous Greek author wrote that Greek living is outdoor living, particularly south of the 39th parallel the climate is so friendly that people avoid most of the year the internal built spaces, preferring to live in roofed spaces that leave at least one of their sides open to the natural environment. This is the traditional house of the 19th century, early 19th century, of Hajiyani Mexi in Spetses. Designing sepi open air spaces with appropriate orientation was a critical bioclimatic option as it created pleasant and healthy living when the weather was not bad without need for expensive constructions and without energy consumption. It's astonishing 
that semi-open air spaces exist in Greece continuously from ancient times till now. This is a house with such semi-open air spaces, which I designed in 1973. It was actually my first design. Then, designing different spaces for winter and summer. In North Greece, there is a great difference in temperatures from winter to summer. So as there were no active systems for controlling building temperature, they had different living rooms for winter and summer. Winter living rooms were positioned on the lower stories behind thick external walls with small openings. Summer living rooms were positioned in the upper story behind thin external walls with large openings and had proper orientation. Overheating was, av was avoided through cross ventilation and by the building envelopes that had small thermal mass. Now, let's see bioclimatic design of building surroundings. First, the landscape. Limited pavement area to the minimum avoided overheating. This also contributes to the proper functioning of the hydrological cycle. In cycladic islands, the perimeter of its paving slab and their joints are whitewashed. This is a great percentage of the total pavement and heat absorption is limited. Now let's go to natural ventilation routes. Aristotle, Hippodamus, Xenophon, Vitruvius, and other great men have investigated the building's layouts in settlements. One of the criteria is cheating the layout, sorry, one of the criteria is creating the layout of Greek traditional settlements, is the protection from the wind or the utilization of the wind for cooling and cleaning the settlement, depending upon local characteristics. In warm areas, traditional settlements have layouts that permit the undisturbed wind flow, so as to create natural ventilation of the streets and to promote natural ventilation of the buildings. This is a very characteristic case in the castle of Sifnos. The serpentine layout of the narrow streets of the traditional settlement of Mykonos is a characteristic example as it fully utilizes the Etesian summer winds to cool both the settlement and its building and also to remove atmospheric polluters. Then we go to appropriate tree planting. It is obvious that they selected planting belonging to the ecosystem of each area. They use trees, arbors, and other planting to create sadhu. Deciduous trees were used to create sadhu during summer without disturbing sun penetration during winter. They never disturbed with planting the wind flow that was required for cooling. And finally, the selection of building materials and techniques with ecological criteria. Building materials and techniques used in Greek traditional architecture did not release great quantities of carbon dioxide, did not destroy ozone in atmosphere, did not require great consumption of not renewable energy. Materials in particular were recyclable, were users friendly, and their extraction 
did not, did not damage the natural environment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting. We also have a comment from a, a, a colleague in Pakistan. He says, such a nice presentation. We need the strategies in Peshawar, having temperature 45 degrees with hot, humid and electricity shortfall must go for passive cooling. Um, from uh, your experience, um, what would you, what's your advice to young architects? Sorry, I didn't understand. The question. What is your advice to young architects, to young designers? Mm -hmm. um, because, uh, like, uh, I think it's very interesting. Um, all those different movements, bringing different ideas, different materials, different techniques, and somewhere in the process we lost our principles that uh, they might be very simple, but these are the ones that used to work for centuries. And uh, we try to come back to those uh, principles again. Yes. Well, there is a great mistake. We believe that we invented bioclimatic architecture. And uh, we try to promote high tech solutions. Uh, that are very exciting and the young people of course tend to apply them without always examining them some of modern solutions that are supposed to be ecological are ecological in one sense but anti ecological in other senses and so they must be very careful um, for example, there are some materials which are considered ecological because they can be easily recycled, but at the same time, they need enormous amounts of energy uh, to be produced. So this material is ecological through one respect, one respect of ecological aspects, but not through others. On the other hand, we see that Greek architecture developed through the centuries, through experience at a time where they were very near the natural ecosystem. And they used their wisdom to avoid losing, uh, consuming energy and things of the sort. So they developed in a very ecological way. The thing is that when we look back at traditional architecture, we must not focus only on its morphology, on the elevation or on the architectural styles and rhythms, but go deeper and see the essence of it and learn from the essence, not from the, uh, not from the uh, elevation, but from the essence of architecture. So it's so true. So um, um, we have another uh, question from uh, Tariq from Pesawar. Uh, he's an architect. And he basically says that uh, it is so difficult to convince my client on using low cost passive strategies. They believe that people can afford their condition and other state of the art solution to hit. Why we should go for passive cooling? Many of, the cli of his clients say that. And sometimes they say why my house, why the house basically should save uh, the, all the climate. Um, what would you recommend, uh, Starek? Well, most people, when they make a new house, are interested to increase their prestige more than they are interested to live happily. I have an experience designing houses and other buildings for almost half a century. And really, you have to ask them how do you like to live? What will make you happy? And if they ask 
if, if they reply to this question, then you can proceed helping them. But if they want just their prestige, then things are difficult because they might uh, choose something which is not uh, healthy and, and sustainable. And we must not also focus on one particular aspect. For example, uh, you built a vacation house to see the sea because you can't live all the year in Athens and you want to go near the sea and have a house from which you can see all the horizon that is the sea in front of you. And then one might tell them, well, this, this part of the house is Western. So you must not make an opening because climatically is not correct. Well, yes, but this is not my everyday house. This is a house which I chose just to see the sea. So you cannot tell me to, uh, to put insulation above all. I mean, one has to be flexible. Mm -hmm. uh, take, take the principles and not be dogmatic. So young people must be investigating things and not learn by heart mm -hmm. things which are, you know. Yeah. It is guidelines, but it's not uh, the Bible, let's say. You, you need to adjust in every situation, of course. I will also jump in and uh, first of all, thank you for the lecture. Mr. Floros, uh, it was really very, very interesting. I really like your house, the first house you did. Mm -hmm. It has a lot of uh, Kostadinidis inspiration, yes, if yes. I'm not mistaken. Yes. And I, I really like the inside outside that you created where you're combining the internal and external spaces under the same roof. So, so that the house may be open or closed uh, depending where you decide to sit but it's although, all kind of one, one unit. Although Aris Kostadinidis was not uh, a teacher of mine, uh, he was actually my real teacher through his paradigm. So mm -hmm. actually I, I was under his influence in this first house of mine, uh, where I used, you know, uh, the stones from the same side, from the side, they were there. And reinforced concrete, of course. Beautiful, yeah, yeah, it's very nice. I, th I think just a comment to make, I think what you said about uh, uh, combining the internal and the, the inside and the outside of the building, um, I think the, the, the currently because of the air conditioning, this is not so much possible because uh, when somebody designs a house, they want to close all the windows so that the air conditioning can cool the house. So they're missing the opportunity to just step out for a second, even to drink a cup of coffee or read a newspaper, or to look at the sea and, and then go back again when the house is always open. You know, like the old pictures we see of Kosadinidis' uh, house, we see the house of, uh, of Kazadzakis here in Egina. You know, you can see always the doors and windows are open. And now what you see in houses, everything is closed because of air conditioning. And we're losing this connection of the inside and outside. And I think it's very important that you raise it because uh, we're forgetting it. We, we must not be extremely dependent on air conditioning. I mean, some of the regulations for insulation come from Northern countries. And in Greece, we take them and we copy them, forgetting that they were mating they were made for Northern America or Northern Europe. Uh, here, it's not so important to fix all of the surrounding. Letting air going in and out, it's okay. And if you feel cold, well, wear a pullover. <laughs> don't, don't. That's all. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank I mean, we can keep on discussing this. These issues are so important. 
you know, Tobazis used to say that first of all, you have to solve the, the bioclimatic design and then you have to bring in the systems, which means that first of all, you design the house properly. You can save a lot of energy. And then if you need a little bit, 10%, 5%, you can add some a mechanical way. But, uh, yes. the, but the, the good passive, design is the number the passive, one. The passive bioclimatic design is the most important, as you say. Yes, oh. yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank Thank you. you very much. And um, right now, I would like to invite uh, Maria Luisa Palumbo. Um, Malu, welcome, and uh, we're sorry for the delay. Um, Maria Luisa Palumbo is an architect and senior fellow of the McLuhan Program in Culture and Technology of Toronto University. Uh, since 2003, she's a member of the Italian National Institute of Architecture in Rome. Her research focuses on architectural theory as a practice of social engagement to question and promote notions of justice, ecology, and democracy. She is the author of New Wombs, Electronic Bodies and Architectural Disorder, and Passerzi Sensibili, uh, Architetute, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm Italian is very poor, as a Stono della Vita, and uh, the editor of several collective books. In 2021, she curated the online event Wars Intersexual Justice and Building Structures of Oppression, Making Space for Inclusive, Empowering, and Reparative Practices, the fourth of a series of online events celebrating 15 years of activities of Echo Week. And back in 2012, she curated Remade in Italy, the final section of the Italian pavilion at the 2012 Venice Biennale of Architecture with Luca Zeppi as a main curator of the exhibition Italian Architecture from Mandiano Olivetti to the Green Economy. And she's currently a PhD student in the History of Architecture and Urban De Development Program at Cornell University. Uh, Maria Luisa, welcome back. Uh, uh, we're very glad to have you. Uh, just to uh, let the uh, attendees know that uh, we're probably going to make a, a shorter uh, break because of uh, the small delay. Uh, the stage is all yours. Thank you so much. Hello, and thank you so much for inviting me. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here again in Echo Week. Let's see if I can share my screen. Can you hear me well? Yes, yes, yes. Perfect. And do you see my, yes. my screen? Yes, we can. Uh, yes, I don't know why I don't. Um, no, where is it? Sorry. I think if you also press control L, I think it might work. Okay. So I'd like to start with a, with a question because I think my presentation, let's go back here. Um, do you see me? Yes, yes, we can okay. see. Okay. Sorry, I don't know what I'm doing. Okay. <laughs> so I think my presentation in a way changes a little bit the, the conversation since I'm going to speak about history uh, really has uh, the study of the past. Um, so I'm not going to talk so much about design, but I'm really trying to um, think about uh, history and tourism and architecture. And so I'd like to ask, I mean, do we really need to study um, and think about history to think about a sustainable future? And my uh, answer um, is that yes, um, if we really want to change paradigm or to change our um, way of living, of inhibiting the herd, um, we really need to step back. We really need uh, to think about modernity, for example, uh, modernity in general and modernity in architecture. So I still hear so much, I mean, students work so much on, you know, Le Corbusier and this kind of um, masters that of course are still masters, but we should question them in a new, um, in a new way. We have to understand that modernity has been told us as mainly an history of progress, but, but, but maybe uh, there was something more there, there was something hidden in a way. And so what I will try to do today is um, 
to go behind, behind and look for something which I think has been hidden. And I will do it um, telling the history of what I like to call um, the history of the central Mediterranean route. So using uh, an expression which usually um, is related to the migration crisis and refugees crossing the Mediterranean. Uh, my point is that uh, exactly this route, this connection between uh, in particular the Libyan coast, so Libya and um, Italy, uh, in the case of the central Mediterranean route, this route has been opened uh, many years ago. Uh, and it has been opened actually by Italy uh, together with many other um, European countries going to Africa, landing to Africa and um, and also planning, uh, planning a sort of uh, migration over there. Um, so we will look at this um, history in, in, in three uh, chapters, let's say. The first one uh, starts with looking at um, Libya itinerary, which is a 1935 um, travel guide um, realized by uh, drawn by the Commissariato per il Turismo in Libya, so the agency that was um, uh, promoting tourism uh, in Libya since 1934. And this guide is uh, wonderful, as you can see, both in the um, graphical representation and, of course, in the place that um, place and people that are shown. And so what was happening? At the beginning of the 30s, Libya was made available for tourists um, from Europe. The, 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 the guide, as you can see, was written, uh, well, I choose just pages in uh, English, but it was written in four languages, Italian, English, uh, French, and German. Uh, so the idea was really inviting um, all sorts of tourists from Europe um, to travel to Libya. And um, so suddenly this um, African landscape was open, was made available to European um, travelers. Uh, and it, travelers who could find there at the same time enough, let's say, uh, similarities and differences from uh, Europe. What I mean is that um, on one side, they could find cities which look almost European, um, comfortable hotels, um, private, private roads and uh, electric lighting and so on, but at the same time, uh, they could find something very different, like this Berber castle, uh, or like um, ancient uh, Roman ruins mixed with different landscape, and um, and for example, uh, they could you know experiment excursion on camels, uh, visit to the desert, to the dunes, and even. Um, uh, they could even travel um, farther away from the coast. So Kufra, uh, for example, uh, we don't have it in this map because Kufra is really down into the desert, into the Sahara, a landscape that um, was almost unknown at the time and really a few Europeans had been uh, there. But, uh, and that's the point, is that, um, since actually the uh, late 19th century, uh, European powers had started to conquer uh, more and more land uh, in areas in, uh, in Africa. And since the late uh, 19th century, so since the very beginning of Italian history as a unified um, nation, um, Italy had um, decided to 
to move south. Uh, why was that? Um, on one side, it was exactly because other European powers were um, extending themselves uh, south. So Italy, as a new nation, wanted to, um, to show its power and uh, you know, its presence as a European nation. Uh, on the other side, there was something very specific about Italy, which was uh, the poverty of uh, the Italian South, the so-called Southern question. Um, the South of Italy, but not just the South, actually most of the um, countryside was really, really poor. And at the same time, um, there was a booming population. Um, so since the early, the first liberal government, uh, unified Italy, liberal Italy decided that they wanted, uh, they were going to solve, let's say, the southern question, the population issue, instead of doing a serious agrarian reform, exactly going south and acquiring new uh, lands for their, um, for the Italian people. So it was the Horn of Africa before, Eritrea, then Somalia, and, and um, early in uh, 1911, they decide to go uh, on the northern coast of the Mediterranean. So they decided to conquer uh, Libya. In 1911, they declared, uh, they claimed to have control on, on Tripolitania, what was called at the time Tripolitania, Cyrenaica, and Fezzan, the three areas uh, which constitute Libya. But the reality was very different. So what we see here, it's a sort of time frame of what has been called the Reconquista, the Reconquist. So uh, after 10 years, let's say, of presence of the Italians in Libya, but in a status of continuous war because uh, the local people uh, were not happy, of course, to be conquered and they uh, resisted uh, in a very um, significant way. Um, so in 1922, actually, uh, really at the moment of passage between the liberal and the fascist government, um, Italians decided that it was time to reconquer the, 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 the territory. And they started the, um, a sort of uh, continuous war uh, which in 1929 uh, was still uh, very much uh, unresolved. So what you can see is that most of the uh, most of the landscape, besides some main areas like the area of Tripoli or really the two main cities, so Tripoli and Benghazi in, in Cyrenaica, most of the land was not under the Italian control, effective control. Uh, at one point, in 1920, at the end of the 20s, Mussolini was really uh, fed up with the situation and he asked for a final, um, a final action to solve the situation. And uh, it's interesting that we don't think about this, but the strategies that the Italian uh, put in place were actually very, um, very much special strategies to to wage war and to win the war in this case. So now I'm, I'm going to bring you, I am moving from one primary source, which was the uh, travel guide of the 1935 to some documents that uh, the Italian state keep in its foreign office, because this is an, in the archive, the historical archive of the foreign office, office, because the problem is that this is an history that is not so well known. Um, we don't really study it at school and the Italian government still uh, has some trouble in, let's say, sharing these documents and make them available and make this history uh, well known. So I, what I'm showing you are um, documents that I found this summer working in the archives. I don't know if I'm really supposed to show them, so I, I should be quick. But these images that this image that is not so clear probably for you, but it's an amazing image that I had never seen before uh, that shows uh, 
la colonna, it means the columns going to Soluk. Soluk uh, was going to become uh, one of the main concentration camp that the Italian built in 1929 and that lasted at least for four years, but <clears throat> probably longer. So basically what they did um, was to ask the, uh, to force all the population, the nomadic and semi-nomadic population of Cyrenaica to leave their lands, to take their um, all the properties and to move uh, towards this concentration camp. We now move to another archive. <coughs> this is one of the few pictures we have. Uh, of this concentration camp. We can clearly see that it is a camp because it is um, enclosed by barbed wires. And you can clearly see this is a, a sort of Roman um, plan uh, of these encampments, which is made by uh, the same tents of the Bedouins, but um, they are, um, uh, it's not just, a camp, it is actually a concentration camp. Here again, we can see the barbed wire and uh, the poor condition of these tents, which usually, I mean, are supposed to have space around, but in this situation, they are extremely concentrated. <clears throat> this is one document of uh, May 1931, which show us, uh, and it is sent by the, government of Cyrenaica and it talks about and it describes really well uh, what they call the, the um, displacement of the population and also it goes in detail further uh, talking about the different camps. So look was the biggest one. It, it, uh, it kept inside 20,000 people for several years and the camps were built mainly in, the, in a desert area, in the Sirtica region, which is uh, a very uh, extreme um, place. So what the document tells us is, for example, that at a certain point, they bought, um, oh my God, telai, I don't remember the word in English, but it's the, 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 what you use it to, um, to produce texture. And basically they, 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 they brought uh, this machine to women to make the, them work and to sell uh, what they could produce. Um, also, what the document says, and this is also something really interesting because I had never seen the picture again that I will show you. Uh, um, it talks about the fact that they, they had realized 20 hectares of vegetable garden into the desert, uh, making clear that these, even this area, which is a desertic area, could be used for valorizzazione agricola, so to um, agricultural valorization. Uh, sorry for the bad quality of this picture, but I was like taking picture quickly. These are some of the camps. You can see Soluk, uh, 20,000 uh, people inside. They talk about a total of more or less um, uh, 85,000 um, yeah, people in the camps, but you have to think that um, a thousand of people died during the displacement from, um, from the, the original location to these camps. And inside the camps, um, almost one third of the population uh, will die of you know, lack of food, uh, of basic medical uh, stuff and violence of every kind. But the document, what is saying is that this sort of concentration camp, what they are doing is to prepare a more uh, docile, docile uh, population used to work, used to work. So the concentration camp are not just places where people is kept uh, enclosed to live there, but they are also places that actually uh, use these people um, as workers. This is essential because we often don't think about how the, the buildings, the streets, everything we see is built. 
And uh, in colonial um, situation, uh, the way things were built often uh, was through the use of enslaved uh, uh, local labor, especially the most um, uh, tiring works like working in the desert. Uh, so again, beyond this picture, what we can read is that Italy basically educated um, the indigenous people uh, to a pleasure, the passion for work. This is another incredible picture which uh, show us um, kids, Bambini, um, working inside another camp, which is a gala. And this is the um, vegetable garden of Soluk. Uh, it is an impressive picture because it's seen a system of intensive agriculture of today into the desert, but it's not. This is a system of intensive agriculture made through enslaved uh, labor. And this again, it's an important picture because show us uh, how they used to move the uh, detenuti, so the, the, mm -hmm. the people inside the camps to the uh, construction site. And this is another picture which shows uh, these people working on the construction of roads. Italian are famous to have built an incredible number of roads in Libya, in the desert landscape of uh, Libya. And uh, so it is really crucial to look beyond what has been built. And often it is said, oh, you know, but colonialism was also a positive force because we have done so much for the country. We have built so much. We, uh, we brought their streets and the possibility you know, to, to move quickly with cars from one place and, uh, to the other and so on. But all of this was built with, with this at this human cost. So what is interesting going uh, now to 1932 is that as soon as the main resistance was won, uh, especially in 1931, uh, the leader of um, Libyan resistance um, was uh, captured and um, killed and hanged in the um, Soluk camp. Um, Omar al-Mukhtar uh, was angered in Soluk in 1931. And after his death, uh, the resistance was, um, was uh, almost win and won. And so in 1932, Italy um, created a, an agency for the colonization. So, which was not just going there, let's say, having um, some Italian presence in Libya, but in and especially in Cyrenaica, which was one of the main um, Mediterranean region. Uh, but it was really about bringing thousands and possibly millions of Italian to live and work uh, in uh, Libya and to have their new land over there. So this is, I think, a beautiful image of Tripoli, which shows the famous, you know, Passeggiata Mare, the waterfront with uh, the ancient castle and the new buildings and beautiful uh, gardens. So we have this beautiful gar um, landscape. And this night picture, uh, I think, is really useful because it shows, I mean, it's a, it was a way to show how modern um, this um, colony had become through the Italian presence. Again, an image that talked about modernity, the possibility of pleasure, tourism, um, seaside uh, architecture. The next step was, uh, was bringing there thousands and thousands and possibly millions of agrarian colonies. So what was done uh, was, um, exactly in the same areas that had been cleared from the resistance and uh, from uh, Libyan population to build new villages, the so-called uh, villaggi agricoli, which had some sort of um, main centers, let's say, with uh, the uh, usually the church, the Casa del Fascio, uh, the market, uh, and 
all these main public buildings around a central piazza, so a sort of recreation of the Italian uh, villages, and the colonists' houses were um, scattered around in the landscape because they were uh, supposed to be exactly on the land that the, the family had to cultivate. So Italy organized a um, state migration, the most famous of which, of which happened in 1938. Um, the state organized to move altogether 20,000 people from Italy with more or less 10 um, ships that moved from Genova and Naples and arrived in uh, um, Tripoli and Benghazi. And from there, they were uh, these cars waiting to bring each colonist, each family, because they were prioritizing families. And they gave a new house and the land to be uh, farmed. The ante colonizzazione della Libia was uh, this um, agency that was taking care of this mass migration. Uh, I really think it is important to know this history because when we look at uh, migrants today, uh, it seems something you know new and unidirectional that goes just uh, from south to north. But we really have to know that this is a route that has been opened by Europe uh, more or less 100 years ago with um, they going to Africa. So what's left, what shall we do? What, why uh, all this is so important and crucial for today? I think um, more and more that we should talk about and think about sustainability in architecture as an act of repair, to so an attempt to, um, you know, to, to care, to curate, to repair what has been uh, broken. Uh, and, um, this is just a, a final picture because it's one of the most famous um, objects that has been stolen by uh, Italy. Let's say they, 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 um, uh, they did a lot of archaeological work, always with enslaved la labor. And uh, this wonderful Venus of Sirene uh, was brought to Italy a few years ago. Uh, there was um, sorry, a few years ago um, um, there was a long discussion between Italy and Libya about um, because Libya was asking for the restitution of its um, manufacturer objects and so on. Uh, and as you know, again, this is a, a, a bigger, a much bigger discussion. All the European uh, countries are, um, and especially like uh, colonial empire, like uh, the British ones so England, France, their museum uh, are full of uh, objects like the famous uh, Parthenone marbles in uh, London that comes from uh, places that have been conquered. And uh, a big question is about, I mean, countries are asking for restitution. This is of course a basic act of repair, which even if problematic, because for example, the Venus uh, now, it seems to be lost. Um, and this is one of the argument that uh, um, the, the major museum are, um, putting forward, you know that they are the ones able to protect these, um, these precious uh, things. Uh, but there is no, I mean, from, um, um, from a, a social and environmental justice point of view, it is clear that uh, to restitute uh, what was taken, what was stolen is the first act of repair that uh, Europe should do. Uh, but the next thing I think, and what is maybe more crucial to me, is really to uh, acknowledge what has happened, acknowledge this history of violence, acknowledge that uh, what we see and what even what we see as beautiful uh, architecture, for example, the architecture of the um, villaggi agricoli, 
has been often called like metaphysical architecture. There is an incredible beauty there, uh, but beyond this beauty, there is something else. There is the violence that came with colonization. To acknowledge, it, acknowledge this history and to learn as architect uh, to uh, look at building, not just as building, but also as traces of a larger, broader history, and to give back voices to those like the workers who um, who died uh, in the process of this uh, violent building, I think is what is more crucial today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Maria Luisa. Um, I'm very impressed once again, and uh, that you, you touched many things that uh, it was quite interesting because uh, recently I had, uh, I've been to Parthenon actually two days ago, I haven't been there for ages. And, uh, you know, even um, buildings, you know, even like, a, like the, the, the main purpose wasn't touristic back then, but now it's a, like huge touristic attraction and uh, uh, with uh, lots of history and heritage. You, you know, well, I had this discussion that like all this kind of built uh, by slaves, basically. And we tend to forget those, uh, we tend to forget this people. We used to praise it, but we tend to forget what happened. And especially in terms of tourists, it's, um, you know, if you think how tourism started because of rich people, you know, trying to show their power and money and, you know, of course, who was building all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I think um, I don't really have any question. It's more, you know, general comments that you, you can see that the form, the format, and uh, of course, it's very important to understand the history because if you forget your his history, you know, it's the same that you're probably uh, being doomed to repeat it. You know, your your and yeah, uh, yeah, and I think it's really crucial to learn to ask this question, like who did build this and how. Yes. So even today, you know, with Exactly. for six exactly. stars, hotel, resorts, and so on. Um, every time it's important to understand, okay, what is the process behind it? And um, how, um, what about the workers? How did it work? And, um, and who is, I mean, whose property is this? Who is uh, um, gaining money and for whom? That's yeah. a crucial question. <laughs> and I think the most recent uh, example at least in terms of uh, tourism and uh, it was actually failed itself due to the pandemic was uh, airbnb especially mm -hmm. like in city center so it's a different kind of form but um it keeps pushing like the locals it you know it creates yeah, it's uh, a big question yeah and uh, you, you could see during pandemic no one was using the facility so the whole city started to think a bit different about this kind of uh, format yeah. Uh, I don't know, Elias, if you want to add anything. Yeah, I'm joining, first of all, to say hi to Malou. <laughs> Good to <laughs> see you. Such a pleasure. <laughs> yeah, same here. <laughs> Good to see you. Wow, it's, it's really amazing. You're digging out always, you know, new stuff coming in, you know, all these questions about colonization, about modernity, about uh, designers' uh, responsibility. Um, it's, it's amazing. I mean, it's amazing how how the world is developing and and but still i mean I, what, what i was really touched about what you said was that europe actually opened the channels to to uh, the the colonized world which was which is now the developing world to come back to europe in a way like first of all the europeans went to these countries to take resources take people take slavery take whatever they could and now they opened this channel and now the other people who are back there and and who who need a better lifestyle because that's what they see on tv or you know in the magazines sure. they come now to europe on their own and and they're changing they're changing the composition of europe and the composition of america uh, in in a, in a very very profound way and 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 you're questioning now what's going on i mean the europeans colonized the developing world, and now the developing world is colonizing uh, the developed world. Not exactly. How do you <laughs> see this? Exactly. I mean, this is a... <laughs> not exactly. Yeah, and as, especially we 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 never 
think about this, about the fact that we did go there and, and that, I mean, it was exactly for the same reason, the Italian South, and, but also the North, because area of, of the whole area of uh, Veneto, for example, these were really poor places where people were so happy to live. And if they were just given the opportunity, the possibility to have a new house and lands to uh, farm, uh, thousands of people applied to this um, program, you know, the colonization, the, uh, the agency for colonization made a public call and they received thousands and thousands of applications of people, families that wanted to leave and go and move south, uh, hoping for a better life. And this is what is happening today. And, uh, and so, I mean, we should really change you know our... Way of thinking, yeah. Tell me, do you know how many how many of these people remained in uh, in in Libya, or they all left? Are they still there? Are they still communities of European Italian? No, European when when the data, uh, there is, there still there is still, there? I think there is there is still a, um, a small community. But basically, what happened was that uh, half of them left when the Italian lost uh, the colony in. Um, before the end of the war in 1943. Um, and um, then when Gaddafi made his coup in uh, 1969, um, he, after one year, basically, he decided that um, all the Italians had to leave. Uh, and even this, I mean, in a way was a violent process because I, Again, people were there since at least one or two generations. They had left everything in Italy. Most of the people who went to Libya, they had to sell all their stuff in Italy to be able to have some money for the trip. And then, so the, and then they built up their new life in Libya. So when they were kicked out from Gaddafi, uh, it was a terrible process again. They were the first migrants to arrive in Italy. The Italians coming back from Libya and uh, the Horn of Africa. So in the early 70s. Of course, it's always the people who suffer. <laughs> That's it. Uh, yeah. Even now, even now <laughs> in, uh, in every aspect. And, you know. But uh, let's be positive. Uh, wow. Thank I you. try. I try to be positive. You know, <laughs> yes. And we have faith course, in humanity. Personal. Uh, sometimes it keeps disappointing us, but uh, let's stay positive and uh, let's try to be a bit more conscious, you know, through our work and uh, try to absolutely get more questions and you know try to be a bit more. Uh, Despina, just wanted to ask one question before Malou okay, leaves. Okay. I just wanted to ask. You, you said that the Venus of Kirinia is was lost the, the yeah. statue has been lost uh yes that's what i read that so and then italy uh, gave it back i think mm -hmm. 2016 um, 16. uh and it seems that now with all the war and so on um i read that it is lost but i didn't dig into this so i'm i'm mm -hmm. not completely sure It was a long process. This restitution was a very long process because, but as you know, it is a conversation that is going on again all over Europe with all, I mean, there is there are so much uh, archaeological things that have been uh, taken away and brought to Paris and, uh, and London especially. Munich, Paris, everywhere. <laughs> London. Berlin. Yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah, Okay. okay. Thank you very much, Maria Luisa. Once again, good luck, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, be in touch. Absolutely. Yes. Um, and uh, I would like to thank all the speakers of the second panel uh, for their amazing contribution. Uh, we're going to have a very short break, and we'll be back at uh, three o'clock with um, our last speaker, um, Ethan Kent. Uh, the executive director of Place Making Next uh, from the uh, United States of America. Uh, he's a pioneer on, uh, in place making and uh, 
do not miss it and uh, we'll be back shortly. Um, and by the end of, uh, of the session, we're going to give some instructions for the workshops. Um, so we'll see you, see you in a bit. Thank you.
Uh, hello again. Um, we are going to wait for a few more minutes as it seems that, uh, it seems that there, is, uh, there are some technical problems and uh, we'll connect shortly. Thank you for your understanding.
Uh, we apologize for this delay. Uh, there are some technical problems, so we'll uh, carry on with the uh, the instructions of the workshops. In the meantime, if uh, Ethan will manage to connect, uh, we will uh, um, will be able to um, to, uh, to to attend uh, his presentation. Uh, so, as you all, you all know, uh, first uh, first of all. Um, as you all know, like uh, from tomorrow, Tuesday, until Friday, we're going to have uh, for a, to have the uh, sustainable design workshops um, with uh, a messer, Theodore and Fotini, Little Architecture, and um, uh, Little Architecture and Vivian Duba uh, with, uh, focusing on placemaking. Um, so um, please have a look on all of the instructions that we have given to you. Uh, all the works will take place on the Microsoft Teams platform. Uh, and uh, but uh, we we suggest uh, we as but as we suggested to the workshop leaders, if you think that it's not very comfortable for you, you are, you are all very you are free to discuss it with the workshop leaders, and you can choose your own platform. Um, the the schedule we have proposed. Uh, is optional feel free like the workshops lead the workshop leaders and your tutors uh will also discuss uh discuss to you discuss uh uh the topic with you to to find uh, what's the most suitable uh working hours for both for, for the tutors and the students and um um by the end of uh, of uh, of this week and uh more specifically on saturday we're going to have the presentations and uh these presentations uh, also uh, gonna take place uh, on the Zoom platform. We're going to send you the link uh, a day prior to the event, uh, so on Friday. And uh, um, please read the instructions for deliverables. If you have any questions, do not hesitate to uh, contact us. Um, the deadline is at seven o'clock, uh, seven o'clock in the evening um, on Friday um it's not entirely strict but we would appreciate it to receive everything before the presentation uh because uh definitely before before the presentations uh, every presentation is gonna last 10 to 15 minutes and then we're gonna have a, a few questions um you please upload all of the material both the deliverables and the raw material to the drive folder because we always use this material uh, in order to advertise and publish your work in uh, future events. Um, and we're available throughout the week. We're going to, to we will try to connect uh, the Microsoft uh, Teams platform to check that everything's okay. In case there's any problem uh, or technical uh, problem, you can also contact our uh, support uh, group. And um, Yes, uh, I think it will be very interesting to see the results. As uh, we all said, uh, the, this, the workshops are focused in, uh, in the in the Aden Island, and uh, all the results are going to be um, presented and are going to be delivered to uh, the local authorities. Uh, in the case, uh, they will be interested to develop them further. And uh, for those ones who are in uh, Aegina, uh, we still have a few uh, in situ activities. Uh, we, tonight we're having the public participation uh, process with uh, Dr. Ioannis Papas, Papas and uh, we're going to talk about um, uh, touristic destination, basically um, destination, touristic destination assessments and how we can make, uh, uh, how we can assess the features of Asia in order to make the island a tourist destination that will empower the local, uh, the local and uh, the visitors, and that will bring them together. Uh, so that will take place at eight o'clock in the evening at the yard of uh, Folklore and Archaeological Museum. The entrance is for free, and uh, you're all invited. And um, then uh, on Friday uh, in the evening at eight o'clock again. We do have uh, an in-situ event. Uh, it's a global initiative uh, cooperation between Eco Week and Pan Embassy and Geo Pan Embassy. And we're going to talk about the marvels of Parthenon and how we will be able to uh, get a sustainable solution on, uh, 
on, on the global issue of the platform models. Uh, the address is also for free and uh, you're more than welcome to join to not join us in case you are here or you would like to visit us throughout the week. Um, now, Ethan, I can see he hasn't connected, uh, but um, so unfortunately, we'll have to um, we'll have to skip this uh, lecture. Uh, we'll try to reach him, and um, if there, it's not going to be a problem, we'll, we might ask him to record the lecture so that will be available to you. Um, Please do let us know if you have any questions. So please, you know, use the Q and A or, or the chat uh, button um, if you'd like to raise any topic or if you'd like to discuss anything further. Uh, we think that there was a very interesting session. We traced up. Uh, it wasn't entirely like focused on Ireland, but I think we raised uh, the island of Fagin, but it was raised many. Uh, interesting topics that are more relevant uh, that today are more relevant than ever. And um, Ethan is with us. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yep. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Yeah. Sorry, we we had uh, we thought there was there was a technical uh, issue, so we proceeded with the uh, instructions of uh, the workshop. Uh, welcome. Very nice to have you. And you. Uh, can you can you share your screen or yes? Yeah, no, I can. No, I can. Hello. Yes. <laughs> how, how are you? Good, good. Yeah, sorry. I, I uh, somehow thought it was an hour later. That uh, that's all right. Morning. That's this all is, right. This is fine, though. That's um, all right. Well, it's uh, also quite a difference. Uh, what time is it there now? Um, so it's it's just it's 8 a.m. here. Oh, so right, I, yeah, yeah. I thought it was start or 8. Yeah. Quite I different. Was, I calculated the time to be started. That, that's all right, um, not a problem at all. Thank, thank you so much for being here. We've been trying to have you for many years now. Yeah, so yeah. we finally made it. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. yeah, so I will make an introduction to, uh, to, the, to the attendees so they will, let, they will get to know you a bit better. Um, so Ethan Kent uh, is the Executive Director of Placemaking Act from the United States of America. Ethan works to support placemaking organizations, projects, in the cities around the world to grow the global placemaking movement and build systemic changes toward place-led uh, place organization. In 2019, he co-founded Placemaking X to network and accelerate placemaking for global impact. Ethan has more than two decades of experience working on public spaces and placemaking campaigns with projects for, pub, for, for public spaces, traveling to more than 1,000 cities and towns in 60 countries. Ethan has been integral to the development of placemaking as a transformative approach to economic development, environmentalism, transportation, planning, governance, resilience, social equity, design, digital space, and innovation. Major projects that uh, Ethan has led have included Times Square, an Aston Place in New York, Parramatta Square in Sydney, Congress Square in Portland, Kennedy Plaza in Providence, uh, Pombe Square in Nassau, Bahamas, Garden Place in Hamilton, New Zealand, uh, among others. And he has also worked with some of the most high-profile developments in the world to help maximize public space outcomes in Hong Kong, Las Vegas, San Francisco, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Oakland, and Sao Paulo. And today, um, he's going to uh, present uh, principles of place making for its narrative stories. Uh, the state is yours, Isan. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Despoina. Um, so, real pleasure to get to be part of this. I've I've followed this effort and had you know conversations with um, you know some of the leaders, Spiros and and, and others, um, for a while now, and. This topic of placemaking and uh, and tourism and, and sustainability, and the nexus of these issues are a real passion of mine, and and one I haven't actually gotten to to present on in this way. So I'm excited for this for this opportunity to start this conversation. Hope to hope we can build it further um, throughout this event and potentially in, in subsequent years. Um, but um, I'm going to share my screen. Just here we go. Um, Let's 
that's where the So, um, so you know, the topic of tourism obviously is, is you know, has been a building of building importance, you know, over tourism, um, the extractive tourism, you know, the, the, the uh, limitations of, of, uh, of who gets to be a tourist and uh, the equitable issues around it have been have been growing for years. And of course, um, with the pandemic now, it, it has given us an opportunity to step back and think about how we can reinvent tourism and how we participate in our in our communities and our cities, um, and and how we can you know, address our bigger goals, sustainability goals, um, but also our, our uh, you know our other other goals that communities have as well. And we increasingly are seeing that connecting the conversations around place making, tourism, and sustainability. Can yield a whole new paradigm in how we think about each of them, um, and the sort of regenerative model, moving from just sustainable tourism to about impacting less to actually models that that create value on the terms of local communities and invite people in in ways that contribute to that value, um, those local values, um, is a, is an opportunity. Um, and an opportunity that the pandemic is allowing us to have um, that we wouldn't otherwise. Um, so we're seeing many different causes coming to the, the, the focus of place. Um, my, my background really is in environmentalism and sustainability. Uh, and actually my father um, organized the first Earth Day in New York in 1970. Uh, and I grew up around a lot of the founders of the environmental movement. So this, this, you know, this Eco Week focus is something close to my heart um, and but we've long seen uh, place and public spaces as a means to bring in new partners to those larger goals of environmentalism um, but also many other causes from local food to health to equity to economic development arts we're seeing how they how when these sometimes isolated causes focus on place and placemaking they can leverage their resources more systemically ad um, uh, address and um, their their issues and uh, attain you know um, deeper uh, uh, change and um, realize their opportunity. Um, so you know, but what we find is often these conversations are in their own silos, and these disciplines are sort of speaking to them themselves. And so we use place and public space as a way to ground the conversation on every scale in something more common sense and something more connected to communities um, to make the language more accessible as well uh, and to make it actionable, to make the conversations ground, grounded. And we think the best places in the world actually bring together a whole range of skills and resources from these, you know, range of these disciplines and others. Um, but right now, the, the future of cities is not being defined around places. The conversation is still around various solutions, uh, just object architecture or um, you know, technology or even sustainability as, a, as an end point rather than as, as, a, as a tool or sustainable technologies for as an example. Um, so we think if you lead with design and development, you get more design and development. And it's the same the tourism industry has been defined by designing objects to attract people or or, de or developments um, that extract from place rather than co-create or build place but or regenerate place um, and you know examples like the Guggenheim Bilbao in Spain have perpetuated an idea that we just need a piece of iconic architecture or a big institution or big museum often spending you know millions or hundreds of millions of dollars on an object that um, has a re decreasing returns to scale. Every other city tries to do the same thing. Um, it's not about that place, that culture. Um, the, I took this picture of these two men right after um, I was there on my honeymoon, uh, and these these men mugged a couple right after I took the picture. Um, I took the picture to illustrate an idea. Uh, William White, our mentor, said that uh, blank walls proclaim that the power of the institution, the inconsequence of the individual for whom they are clearly meant to put down, if not intimidate. Yet, 
you know, we continue to build these kinds of iconic buildings that don't create places. Um, and of course, cars and traffic, how we get to places, how we um, is, is actually degrading places, how, how we build transportation through communities rather than to them. Uh, and it was not about being against the car, but, but we have to start to think about, um, you know, how we can be for places. This is the experience of much of America right now that um, this is not a, uh, you know, a, a place that regenerates itself, let alone the people that participate in it. Um, and Times Square was a, a, a project that I've worked on at several different phases um and we really advocated just for not being against the car but being for experimenting with how it could serve people better through these sort of lighter quicker cheaper tactical interventions um and of course you know the the best place making is very informal often and that's what we found in times square just putting out temporary seating um but in in some of the lowest income parts of the world uh, more informal parts of the world people naturally know how to do place making um, we've had placemaking weeks all over the world. This was one was in Nairobi, where you know if they'd said let's close this road to cars, they wouldn't have succeeded. Um, but they did these temporary experiments and showed all the positive potential of it. And now they are closing it to cars. Um, in Detroit, Michigan, a city where we've worked the most in, um, the there's a whole new narrative uh, through these sort of lighter, quicker, cheaper approaches that is inviting people to be co-creators, regenerators of their city, uh, people that have lived there forever, but also new people are being challenged, supported to help co-create um, the future of the city through these small types of interventions um, in the sort of entrepreneurial spirit. Um, the innovative spirit is, is, is growing from that, that inclusive uh, and, and co-creative energy. Um, in, in Mexico City, uh, there's a Fundacion um, Placemaking Mexico that uh, is is working all over the country to see this kind of place governance, which I'll talk about. Um, and and this this actually particular location helped build resilience for the earthquake. It built the social connections that um, that then were very valuable um, for the recovery of an earthquake they had in, in this neighborhood in Mexico City. So William White, again, our mentor I mentioned, it says it's hard to create a space that will not attract people. What's remarkable is how often this has been accomplished. Uh, we don't learn from the processes and informal and formal governance mechanisms that create the great public spaces that frankly draw tourists uh, and draw tourists most sustainably. In great places like this, people conform to their, to their use. Um, uh, yet we, when we try to design these spaces, we just copy the design. We don't copy the management and process of, of them. And uh, people still have this experience when they go to many downtowns or when they're a tourist, they're not likely to come back. Um, the fear that they, they remember the fear of, of having to cross a street there. And I know, you know, many parts of, of Greece still have, have um, you know, are overtaken by, by automobile traffic. Yeah, we're seeing a huge shift. Um, this is the same place actually in Sydney. Uh, we, we took these both these pictures uh, there right before the pandemic. Um, they've finally taken cars off of that, that street. So there's a real shift happening. This is in Auckland where they're um, also removing cars from the center of their, of their street as part of the whole place making campaign there. And then during the pandemic, we're seeing you know greater momentum towards this, as I'm sure you all are as well. Uh, this is my neighborhood in Brooklyn. Um, we have these open streets all the time. And the neighborhoods, the parts of the city that uh, organize somewhat informally, uh, sometimes there's business improvement districts that support it, um, to take back the street, to, to create comfort for pedestrians. These are the places that are thriving now and frankly are more lively than ever before. The areas that didn't organize that the, the central business districts, the, um, the, the, the streets that, that are dominated by one building or, one, or big box stores, they, they're, not, they're losing out. Um, so it's the smaller scale, cooperative, humans, you know, human activity driven businesses that, that are really succeeding. And the volunteerism, the, the community spirits sustaining and driving the success of this. People are wanting to connect more with their neighbors, with their public spaces again, uh, and are using public spaces in ways that previously weren't weren't possible. But we 
are also very much common sense. We're learning how to be part of public, our, our community again. And this is in Dumbo, you know, one, one of the most touristy neighborhoods in, in New York. Um, the street should have been closed to traffic a long time ago. And now, you know, it's, they're making it permanent, um, you know, because, because of the pandemic and it's becoming even you know, more of a tourist destination, but a sustainable one, one that, that uh, the locals go to more now um, that can accommodate a whole range of uses and user groups. Um, and it's safer. Tourists used to stand in the middle of the street to take these pictures all the time. And now, of course, it's safer for them. Chinatown as well uh, is is taken been uh, taken back their streets and, and and done it in a way that creates lots of life, and then the nightlife has taken off more than ever as well and and been more inclusive and accessible to all. Where you don't just have to you don't have to go inside and spend a lot of money at a restaurant. You can be out you can be out in the street, listen to music. There's bands um, walking the streets now in the ways that there were not before. So. So what is placemaking? Um, it, placemaking we see is a, is a collaborative process by which we shape our public realm in order to maximize shared value. Um, it's, it's also strengthening the connection between people and the places they share. So we, there was an MIT study that found that the biggest benefit of placemaking wasn't actually the improved place, but the improved social capital and the improved capacity that's built through the process of placemaking. Um, so even if you know what you need or the expert, you, you believe the experts, it's, it's really important that the process builds that, that capacity to, to manage and grow um, and appreciate um, the projects, the public spaces. So Placemaking X is an organization we founded a little over um, two years ago to network um, the, the placemaking leadership around the world and and um, network the learning, the advocacy, and and grow the impact, the collective impact of people practicing placemaking around the world. Uh, building on the work we've done at Project for Public Spaces to sort of seed a movement, uh, and that organization is still, you know, leading on on a range of parts of placemaking. Um, but we're seeing leadership from, on placemaking from all over, and that's the idea of placemaking X isn't to. Uh, compete with it, it's to highlight and connect all these collaborative and innovative ways that people are, are leading. So, uh, so a little bit of history about the movement, it really has roots with Jane Jacobs and William White. Um, my father worked with them in the early 70s and uh, uh, he founded Project for Public Spaces in 1975. Um, and then he started calling, uh, we started calling this placemaking in the late 90s when we really realized that um, it's not us that's the experts, but the community. And uh, pre previously, the previous 20 years was really doing a lot of user analysis and observation and interviewing of people to draw out their expertise. Um, but we, in the 90s, we developed tools to help the community be those experts uh, and use those same tools to, um, to realize how much they know and how much they can do themselves in, in, a, in a community. So we started to see the placemaking movement become global um, in 2006 or so, and, and really started to organize, to, to, to structure and support it uh, in 2013 with some conferences uh, in Stockholm with UN Habitat and one in Detroit. Um, and uh, they've continued to run dozens of conferences around the world in collaboration with local partners to shape and learn about local placemaking conversations. Um, one was, was in Wuhan, China, actually in 2018. Um, we launched Placemaking X in Valencia, Spain with our Placemaking Europe partners, um, including Vivian Dumpa, who's part of this conference in 2019. Um, but really the you know, core to the movement is this idea that uh, we've led with is that everyone has the right to live in a great place. More importantly, everyone has the right to contribute to making the place where they already live great. Um, and uh, these are some of the conferences that have really helped shape the movement globally and there's you know each of them has reports that you can you draw on from the placemaking x website uh, but there's you know many more planned there's one placemaking europe has just announced a, a conference um in barcelona actually uh the october 3rd through 5th we have another one in flint michigan um coming up uh, in, in september um so placemaking is a word that is constantly debated and 
uh, you know, in, in sort of redefined and, but it's used quite um, broadly across the world in slightly different ways. And we think collectively it, it sort of balances each other out. We wanna make sure that placemaking is not dominated by any one group, um, that it's really an ongoing question of who, what it means uh, to a community and who gets to do it and how inclusive is it. Um, and uh, that, it, that we always think that it's not about pushing away what one type of leader, but always attracting other people to be part of it. So if it's led by the development sector or the government or the community, let, whichever we have to make sure the other groups that are not included um, are participating and, and leading as well. So some of the, uh, the regional networks we've helped launch and supported around the world, um, all of them are, are innovating, leading in various ways and have, have resources to connect to uh, in, in social media um, to follow and be part of as well. Uh, so the mission of Placemaking X is to be a global network of leaders who together will accelerate placemaking as a way to create healthy, inclusive and beloved communities our vision is to make the spaces we live in the places we love to create a thriving, equitable, and sustainable world through the convergence of values, passion, and action around our public spaces. And we work at sort of there's sort of three stools, um, or three um, sort of foundations to how how we work. And one is to advocate for systemic change to make sure we're not just perpetuating the status quo by just improving some spaces alone. Um, uh, to amplify the leadership that is in every community and the ideas that are there. Um, and then to make sure we're you know, really accelerating impact because we need to create change faster than we are to be able to sustain human life on this planet. Um, and Cecilia Martinez was one of the leaders um, at UN Habitat that helped, uh, helped, that worked with us to make public space and place making part of the new urban agenda and the sustainable development goals. Um, it says that we're creating a global movement to shape spaces into places. Uh, so just public space is not enough. It has to have place is a space with purpose and meaning, and it drives more investment in public space that that works for those communities, that, that shares value, that drives um, cultural, economic, social outcomes as well. So the sustainable development goals 11.7 we advocated for to include public space, um, and then the, the uh, New Urban Agenda, we actually got uh, 10 different mentions of, of public space in there based on some conferences that we were partners in. Um, and then uh, something we weren't part of actually, but it was really relevant is these Quito papers that Dr. Klos and Saskia Sass and Richard, uh, Ricky Burdett and Richard Sennett did um, that really concluded that cities and public spaces need to be incomplete, more porous and more complex. Um, and they said public spaces need to have multiple uses, be more flexible and have more informality. Um, things we'd all been advocating for, but they really see as core to the success of cities in the future and the ability of cities to um, allow people without power to help shape them to have a role to, um, to uh, you know, really drive their innovation and creativity as well. So we showed that, that you know we're again we're we're seeing this convergence of different issues around place and we're working with the leaders of many different movements um, to support their focus on place and collaboration with other other movements. Um, but one tool we do this with at every scale and I think is relevant to you know I'm excited about some of the workshops you guys are doing and you may be able to use this a little bit um, uh, as part of those workshops is this power of ten tool and we the idea is we think a great a great uh, a place has at least 10 reasons to be in it. Um, and it's good to, it's useful to start to focus on the uses rather than the design at first, the, the functions of a space. Um, and then perhaps a great um, public space or a great destination has uh, at least 10 places in it, each with 10 things to do in it. And then following on that, a great city uh, or region has at least 10 public destinations, each with 10 places, each with 10 things to do in it. So. To use New York as an example, um, we think it's, you know, it's improvement, it's transformation has really been led by these public destinations um, that, uh, you know, we're, we're really led first by community groups. They're often groups of people opposing something, opposing the teardown of the High Line or, you know, Washington Square Park, a uh, highway coming into it um, uh, by Robert Moses, uh, but they uh, have, all succeeded when the community became for something. Uh, but that, that oppositional energy, that negative energy was often useful for galvanizing some activity. 
uh, and then the challenge is the type of leadership to move from just being against it to being for something. And that, so a lot of the same people that were against things then became, you know, leading these efforts and the play, playing the, the place management role, um, which is the hardest part and the most important role for public spaces, how it's continually evolved, how you fundraise, how you continue to engage the community and taking ownership over these spaces. Um, so we think it's most important not to copy the form or the design of any of these spaces, uh, but to learn from the process and the management and governance of them, how that and the financial modeling as well. As well. Um, and then to learn from how they work at that human scale uh, rather than the big design scale. It's, it's at the scale at which you can make eye contact with people and connect with people that the magic really happens in all of these spaces. Um, and, it's a, it's, and it's actually quite simple. It's not so fancy or expensive, the type of design elements that really enable that kind of contact and connection in place. And, you know, and the idea is that when, when you have that, this, these 10 reasons or so to be in a place that no one use or user group can dominate it. Um, tourists can be one of the uses, um, you know, uh, but they're not dominating the space, you know, in the different age groups, different demographics feel welcome in it and have different things, different activities that they can connect to, but then actually enjoy often and unintentionally some of the sort of serendipitous activities that will occur because of the, the, the layering of different groups of people. Um, so it's the triangulation that gets people to be start to open up, to be more informal, to make eye contact, to talk, to have, strike up a conversation with somebody. Um, those are the things that lead to the real memories for tourists um, and allow locals to really feel like these places are, are are for them as well. So we've done these exercises all over the world, this power 10 exercises um, this is in Melbourne, Australia, uh, a city that's very livable, but we've been pushing them after ever since we did this exercise and revealed they don't have that many lovable places that they need to be focused on lovability. And our theory has been that if you focus on lovable places, place attachment, places that you feel connected to and want to keep coming back to, you actually can achieve livability more inclusively um, and more quickly and more cheaply. Uh, and I think it's definitely carries over even more so for, um, for the tourism industry and how do you create places that are lovable, tourists will respect them, um, they'll come back to them, they'll spend money and time in ways that contribute to those spaces. Uh, also even more true in informal settlements or low income communities. Um, the same, we've walked through favelas in Rio and some of them are the most unsafe, unfriendly places. Some are, some with a very similar design can be very friendly and safe and um, you know, vibrant communities. Um, so again, it's more of a function of the governance and the process through which the spaces are shaped than about the form or design in these cases. And so you can do these participatory exercises like these are in Colombia, um, you know, and it's a really great way to have people connect and, and learn from each other. Um, so but process is key as well. And I'll just, we did, um, these diagrams are actually created out of some trainings we did in the Netherlands where we were surprised that they were hiring us to do trainings because they do such great public space design there. But they said that, that you know, traditional planning is you get some engagement, then you do design, then you hope it gets used. They see placemaking as actually drawing more appreciation and creativity for design professionals, but they have to let go. You can't lead with the design solution or design expertise. It's a constant, placemaking is a constant iterative process between use, engagement, design, um, all, all driving demand for each other. Um, but most designers, most experts are taught to have to have the expert, to have the solution and expertise um, to, that they effectively impose on a community. So <clears throat> diving further into the, the tourism discussion, um, we've been trying to advance this idea of place tourism. Uh, and I recently wrote an article on this um, in, re in regenerative tourism that the tourism industry should invest in, in places and and the tourists should also see themselves as investors in places that they go to um, so it's moving beyond being passive consumers of a place or extractive consumers of a place um, to actually participating in it and even contributing to it and that's what tourists want to feel like they're contributors and they want to feel like they have a deeper 
participatory experience um, that often aren't given that opportunity. And that's what the tourism industry needs to create more sustainable places. And then in strong public spaces and you know, the, the great public spaces around the world, um, you know, they actually absorb tourists actually behave better. Uh, they're, they blend in more. They uh, often conform unconsciously to local culture and identity um, of places and they have a much richer experience accordingly. Um, so if it's, but if it's a cheap place, if it's a, if it's a generic place, tourists misbehave, they dominate, they, they control. Um, in great places, people rise to the level of the shared experience and contribute to it. Um, they are often driven to connect deeper with, with people in, their, in that area and with the history and culture of that place. Um, and they even display their own personality more, their own culture. They, they bring something to it in a great place. Um, they smile more. They want to have an authentic experience. They want to spend money in ways that add to that, to that place. So a place we can approach to tourism development can not only help ensure economic success and manage impact, it can help build local capacity for continuing to manage, maintain, and evolve the destination. Um, so again, it's a, a focus on this on place management, governance, engagement process, um, dealing with the conflicts. The conflicts between different user groups can be useful, can create conversation, can 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 yield um, you know creative solutions, uh, and you know, but they, but they do have to be addressed through a facilitative process. And, and so place management can be key. The destination managers um, that often focus on marketing or, you know, booking hotel rooms or events, we, we can start, start to move those people and those skills into more facilitative placemaking role, um, creating the destinations that the tourism industry is meant to bring people to. So preserving the sense of local ownership is really key to maintaining success and authenticity for both locals and tourists. You know, we all know this, um, but a placemaking process is a, is, a, is a way to create all local authenticities to preserve it. Um, and, and also to focus on preservation is key, but often just preserving the form or the, um, the buildings uh, can, make, can be, make those uh, the, the, the preservation vulnerable in a way. So we think the best way to succeed with preservation is actually preserving use and life um, and, uh, and that create, creating more purpose to, to the, those buildings. Um, so, you know, so place making can drive preservation and the best way to prevent a neighborhood from changing for the worst. A lot of neighborhoods are, are people are scared of tourists or outside investment, but we say it's, it's, it's rather than just opposing it, actually have a vision for what you want your community to be like and invite people in on those terms and showcase your vision, your values in the public realm um, in ways that you're proud of and that challenge outsiders to, to respect your community and even support it. Um, so you know, sustainable places need to be constantly recreating and evolving themselves, keeping connections to local history, environment, culture, local ethnicities, while also being culturally creative um, you know, we can't just, you know, rest on, on the history, um, but often the best way to connect to the history is through continuing to grow um, culture that reflects and respects that, that history. Um, so just sort of starting to close out on um, sort of some key principles we recently developed for, um, you know, for regenerative tourism through placemaking is to, the first one is to create places um, not objects. So a place is a, is a space that you participate in, that you uh, that you experience in ways that you don't dominate um, and you don't just consume them. Uh, so so much of tourism is you know take a picture and check that off and leave. Um, next, to define tourism around locally driven uses rather than tourist infrastructure. Uh, and locally driven uses are simple functions of you know things people actually need. Uh, local businesses, local food, um, and tourists will want to feel like a local. And they'll want to participate in that local infrastructure, uh, and, and 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 learn about the local culture that's that's there. Um, support holistic, community-based place management and governance. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this actually right after this. But um, the uh, you know, we think there's a trajectory of, of governance and investment to the district or community scale and uh, how we manage you know, main streets and downtowns and squares and waterfronts 
uh, is really the sort of leading edge of, of urbanism um, and how the tourism industry is a catalyst for this and benefits from this is a key opportunity. Uh, we need to shift resources from marketing commercial destinations to creating public destinations. Um, I've had some people in the tourism industry suggest that they should, uh, what, you know, what if we relocated uh, 10, 20 percent of the tourism marketing budgets to placemaking, to actually creating the destinations that they're marketing uh, and how, how great destinations market themselves um, when they're authentic, when people take pictures in them, and share them, when they uh, contribute to them and when, you know, people, uh, the word of mouth um, starts to travel um, more authentically. Um, Place branding and marketing also when it is done though should start with participatory placemaking. So the best um, marketing is actually outreach, engagement, asking people what they like about a place, um, engaging the locals and engaging tourists in uh, in questioning what they, you know, what how they use the space, what's what, how's it working for them, how's it not, how could it work better for them. Uh, and starting these conversations and even some conflict, some debates around these spaces can yield deeper conversations and and good good press uh, and even some bad press can be can lead to good press or good good marketing um, uh, and then six support buildings that support places uh, simple idea but so many buildings are about supporting themselves they're, they're uh, one museum one iconic piece of, of architecture uh, um, you know stores and re retail frontages that don't add to the place so we want to get in the best public spaces in the best downtowns, each building's competing to contribute to the shared value, to the life of the street, to social life. Um, and uh, that you need to start that with the, with, you need to model that sometimes and then other buildings follow. And then lastly, lastly support businesses to support places. You know, businesses are the drivers you know, of good edges of public spaces a good retail um you know but again we often invest in getting chains and the same retail that's all around the world that's more about uh you know advertising in that in that space or um having a being extractive of footfall rather than driving it and contributing to the energy of, of the space so local businesses time and time again show that they drive you know more authenticity more um more local tax revenue and then the, the model of, of sort of big box or um, chain retail that can easily dominate and take over a, a, a place that doesn't have local authenticity. We've often worked with like retail consultants that say when when you know what the vision is for the place, then you can attract retail that's more local or challenge chains or, or bigger stores to adapt and contribute to the place. Um, so again, place led, leading with the place is the way to drive retail and development. Um, for a regenerative local economy, uh, and I think for regenerative tourism as well. So talking about regenerative tourism, but also this phrase community powered tourism, community powered placemaking is, is really what we do. Um, and, you know, Agena can lead a new paradigm of community powered tourism through these types of conversations, through being in this, in this key location. Um, and EcoWeek, I think, can further build this leadership um, convening tourism and placemaking leaders, you know, you know, I'd love to build on this conversation with you all and learn how it, this really hits on the ground in, you know, how this can be applied on the ground in, a, in Ahina. Um, one example, we're actually starting a partnership. We've, we've long been talking to um, Fair b and um, and they could be a partner in some of these conversations. Um, it's, a, it's a platform trying to, really trying to disrupt Airbnb um, supporting hosts that are up and by a local community that are not doing it just as an investment property, but are, are um, you know, share the values of that community, want to attract tourists on the locals terms, and then actually a percentage of the of the fees actually go back into community values, even often potentially placemaking projects in that community that further sustain and drive the a healthy tourism economy. So the, you know, supposedly it earned the costs are the same, but the because it's a cooperative and because of the, the values and because of the revenue going to the community, it's, it has a much more sort of virtuous cycle with local tourism goals. Um, so I'm not going to go much more into this, but this, but governance I mentioned, place-led governance is really where this needs to go. And, and we need um, tourism managers, place managers to make districts and destinations work. We can't have tourism be sort of an isolated silo in government or a department. 
um, or, but, we, but all the departments are often isolated in their goals and in their metrics of success. Increasingly place making, place management is connecting the, these different departments and their goals and their resources. Um, but eventually we want to, we see a trajectory towards place led governance um, that draws much more fluidly on a range of different departments and coordinates uh, a focus on place, on great places as, as a goal of government. Um, and even more importantly, on building the capacity of communities to further shape and sustain, to regenerate their places um, as, as, a, as, a, as a focus of governance. So no longer should the goal be, you know, how just safety or just events or just design or just recreation, but place. How do are we creating great places that we love that attach us to a community that um, that build our capacity to work together and, and address our goals. So going forward for a strategy can be uh, applying this at a very human scale right in front of our building, our store. Um, a place can have 10 things to do in it. A destination 10, has 10 places. You know, a city, this can, um, you, know, the, you know, the country of Greece can have 10 great place-led cities or, or regions, um, you know, that, that when people come, they go to, they travel to as many of those as possible and contribute to them. Uh, and then of course, being part of the, the larger placemaking Europe conversation and um, you know, having having these parts of um, Greece be the, uh, um, be on that, on that grand tour of, of great places. Um, so placemaking times regenerative tourism, I think is one of the greatest opportunities to have a big impact and really address our biggest sustainability equitable goals. This picture actually is Vivian Dumpa, or, or, um, who's part of this conference as well. She was a great leader, or is a great leader of placemaking Europe and led some, um, some of the conferences we've had uh, in, in the continent. Um, so you know, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. My father actually studied with Margaret Mead um, and I really believe that this, you know, conference, this this Ahina um, uh, place, gathering place, can be a, a catalyst for really reinventing the tourism and placemaking conversation. Um, you know, in Placemaking X, we're here to support you, to build on this, to connect you with other people around the world as, as you go, um, and hope you can stay in touch. You know. Um, you know, get involved with Placemaking X if, if, if it interests you um, and you can sign up as an advocate uh, and get involved with Placemaking Europe as well. Um, but I'm going to stop there and take any questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, you, you, raised up, uh, some, you, you raised up some points. Uh, it's very interesting because uh, since yesterday we had like a, a film screening and uh, even today throughout all the, the lectures we're talking about the um, the importance of scale, you know, starting from local level and then going larger and into much larger uh, level. And uh, it, it is very interesting because um, through all the topics that we have talked about, like I was place making, was it like, like climatic architecture, like everything had to do with this kind of factor of uh, people's involvement and that people will always want to have this kind of... Uh, involvement and are actually the ones that they know better than the experts most of the time. Um, and uh, especially now like in, in Greece, for example, um, especially after like financial crisis, you could see many small corporations and uh, many small like um, producers uh, gathering together, creating, you know, organizations that they could bring them together and having a bit uh, more fair, um, uh, way of, uh, of uh, producing and way of uh, trading and that brought life to places that they were quite abandoned. However, those places usually are the islands or back in mainland, uh, like uh, in uh, mainland Greece. And um, so basically my question is that we have those, those areas, those islands that um, they're crowded, they're full of tourists during the summer and uh, but then in the winter they're empty. There are many many few locals, and you can create. Of course, you can have you can uh, create places through the place making process. But how can this? Sometimes it is only being used as for touristic purposes or for advertisement. How is it possible to maintain this and bring the locals back? Because I know that obviously governance is a huge a major issue uh, and I can say that by experience also because um, in my work we are governance is the one that, that basically 
um, drive us in creating places. Mm -hmm. When the governance is not that strong in that kind of aspect, what can you do? Um, yeah, well, we would say it takes it takes a place to see the community and a community to say to see the place. And so it's always it's, a, it's an iterative building up of, and, you know, the community is the governance and the best places are self-governed and they're informally governed. Um, you know, you think about, um, you know, and, you know, an informal street, um, you know, where people all know each other and they sort of look out for each other and they all add to each other, they, you know, they all, they all know how to support each other informally a little bit. Um, and they're, and they design their homes in ways that add to each other's and, and so forth. Um, so it does start with seeding, you know, where, you know, as a person, a, a, a little element of the space, what is the, the small things that, that can be done um, to sort of seed that local governance and that, that gets the locals more engaged and, um, and often the time, the opportunity to do that is in the off season or um, in, you know, in, a, in during this pandemic right now to sort of really get locals to fall in love with and, and, and participate in their, in their city, not just as a, you know, not to see their home or there is a tourist experience that's defined for and by outsiders. Um, this is a key opportunity to do that. But, but I also think that, you know, part of the reason people love Greece so much is because there's, because it is wonderful and there's not enough of it. So, you, you know, it's also, you need, um, if tourists are just going to one place, they're dominating it. So you need to create more places, you know, it's part, part of the answer. You need to improve um, and, and disperse the tourists to have a deeper experience where they don't dominate as much and they can contribute. Um, so invite them to parts of the islands that they're not already going in ways that are more respectful and, you know, integrative. Part of the power 10 also though, is that you, you define their experience. You don't just have them disperse randomly over everything. You have them go to defined destinations, a plaza, a waterfront, you know, a, a main street, a market. And in those places, they're very well managed and, very well, uh, um, you know, they can, they can absorb heavy use and they can and benefit from it as well. Um, so it's, and, 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 and tourists can have a really a, a deeper experience, you know, markets, waterfronts, plazas, these are, you know, there's are areas that, you know, can, can be very crowded and still feel, um, and not feel so crowded. Uh, you know, they can, they can feel lively and comfortable, um, in good public spaces, people are much more comfortable being closer to each other. Um, and, and and again, if it has a strong culture, it's locally defined. The tourists will behave better, and they'll they'll have a better experience. Great, thank you. Is there any uh, example of um, of a tourist? Because obviously, part of the place making is a, a strong public participation. Is there any uh, example that tourists were involved in this kind of participation processes to reshape the local? Uh, yeah. communities and the local places um yeah i mean definitely we I mean, we we've always tried to engage um people you know the and you know so obviously you can interview the tourists that are there uh and you know we always ask people what their zip code is when you interview them so you know the percentage of people the local and tourists and um you know and part of it's just understanding what people their perceptions and who is there getting the data right because it's, it's sometimes the the problems are perceptions and not, you know, perceptions of safety, perceptions of who the tourists are. And when you actually get to know people, you know, you start to learn differently and, and, you know, and, and when people, you know, people are all human beings and they all, they all want the best for, for each other. Um, so engage, people always have really good ideas. I, I've, I've done workshops in so many places where tourists, even actually in refugees, and it's a different type of tourism, but, um, or tourists or refugees that are seen as the problem, when you actually in, engage them, they have really good ideas and they really don't want to be the problem. They want to be, yeah. you know, contributors to the space and they're just not given the means to, to do that. Um, you know, so just like anyway, everyone wants to behave well and be respected and, um, and respectful. Uh, but we, but placemaking is a, is, can be a process of, and a tool for giving the tourists or the people seen as a problem or an undesirable user of the desk of the area as a to, to you know enable them to be contributors um in the space so they can do these the power of 10 exercise we have something called the place game um they can you know they can participate in uh 
you know, sort of temporary activations uh, as a way to, to test things and see if they like it or not. Um, and then, but, but also just, you know, all, all great public spaces are place-making processes. You're, you're, te- you're just, you're observing what's working, what's not, you're engaging people in, in spaces just, you know, by watching the observers of, of, of these people. Um, so yeah, no, that's, but that's something we should, you know, engaging tourists, getting the data from them, uh, you know, especially if they re start to re-enter, um, I guess, you know, this summer has been busy in Greece, I know, but, um, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's an exciting opportunity to sort of, re, you know, relook at all this. Great. Thank you. And, um, uh, one last, uh, last question from me, from me. Uh, I will also uh, jump. Yeah. Yeah. That's gonna, I will also jump in. Yeah. First of all, say hi to Ethan. Hi, Ethan. Thanks for joining today. Cheers. Thank you. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, and I, I, first of all, your, your lecture was fascinating. And uh, I think placemaking is, is really one of the things that Greece started, starts to discover uh, through public participation, which has not been so popular until now. But it, it is happening and it is changing things. And, and I think that what you say about tourism, it, it really rings a bell in terms of how tourists could be a positive uh, um, generator in a place uh, rather than a negative generator. And, and in Greece, you have different types of tourism that some of them are contributing and some of them are not. For example, you have the, uh, the mass tourism that come into groups and those groups really have to uh, make sure they see 10 places within two hours. And, and so it's like very frantic uh, rhythms and, and they, they hardly stop to see, to speak, to listen, to smell, to anything. You just go to a place, take pictures and just run to the next one. I've seen this in Italy as well, by the way, and it's really crazy. Yeah. And, and they miss the whole experience. But then you also have the other tourists who come on their own, some of them, you know, go to Airbnb or to rent rent a house, and and they really go into that rhythm of the place. But I think that there's not the culture yet to make them more local, to make them more, to generate them, to to activate them as locals, as you say. And I think that could be an amazing uh, uh, trial in Greece to see how these people who are already feeling Greek, they can speak a little Greek, they can understand how you can actually bring them now to also contribute to the place, make the place better, you know, which I think it could be fascinating to check. And, and the third thing is, is the big massive chains where they come in and they take those beautiful places, like you say, you know, create new places and they take the new places and they make golf courses, they kill all nature, they kill all diversity and they create those five-star massive developments, which really block the, the sea, seaside to the locals they create a lot of waste, they, they take a lot of water, a lot of energy, and, and they're really only working about four or five months a year, and then the rest of it is just sitting there. So, so it's, it's a lot of, it's very diverse type of tourism. And I don't know if placemaking can be, can affect all these sort of market forces, which are very powerful. But, uh, but definitely it can help give people the tools to, to become more active and more vocal in, 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 in them putting, setting the vision basically, the basis for the vision for their place. I think that's probably the power that you're suggesting here, right? Yeah. No, I, th- I think it's, yeah, Elias, thank you for all, for all that. I think, yeah, I think this is, yeah, I think it's very powerful. I think you can, we can have a, a big paradigm shift globally in you know in what tourists expect and what you know locals um try to share and and when when communities start to sh- you know, i think it will start to go viral um this this idea of, of of going to places that you contribute to and then you know, the places that that succeed to to really be about themselves and to invite people in in ways that they can contribute those will be the ones that succeed most in the future um, you know, we've gone through an era where every place was trying to be the same, uh, where where um, you know every place was trying to attract the the type of tourism, frankly, that destroys it. You know, the the big the the, the type of tourism you're just des- you're describing, where it's very extractive, that you just check the boxes and um, 
you know, I think the pandemic has allowed us to slow down a little bit, reflect a little more, um, you know, want to connect deeper with our own communities, uh, be tourists in our own communities. Uh, and, but then, and then think about where we want to go more consciously, um, you know, coming out of this and, and connect in a, in a slower, deeper way. Um, but yeah, but we, you know, but there are mechanisms. We do need, you know, financial governance mechanisms to enable this, to scale this. We need to get the tourism, you know, the big forces in the tourism industry that are shaping the market, they're shaping the perception of it to invest in placemaking uh, and to see themselves as, as placemakers because they could really benefit from it. Um, and, you know, get those big, those big marketing efforts um, to, to start moving from cheapening extract and perpetuating extractive tourism to supporting regenerative tourism. Um, so, I mean, this is you know, something I'm really passionate about and I, you know, we haven't actually gotten to work that much with the tourism industry before. And um, so this, is, I, I really want to, you know, any opportunities to further explore this conversation. I have written one little article on it. Um, I, we are embarking on this this effort with Airbnb that hopefully will enable more conversations about this, and and they would, you know, offer to sort of help sponsor conferences and put people up and with the hosts, um, uh, if we, you know if we could go further. So I you know I really welcome this is the first event Definitely. on this topic I've gotten to do, and uh, um, I'd love to do more writing research, you know, discussions on this and get and really try to get investment in it. And of course Greece and you know, Hina and um, you guys, you know, could be a real hub for for this conversation and leadership going forward. So I hope I do hope to. I've, I've I've traveled all over the world, but I've never actually been to Greece. So you guys are it's top of my list. I'd love to get there. Next, <laughs> well, next it was year. quite hard this year, as yeah. you know, with the pandemic. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, definitely. If it wasn't for COVID, you wouldn't yeah. be probably yeah. in Greece right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I wish. I wish. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we, we definitely want to carry on with the conversation. Um, because you mentioned about tourism, I, I wanted to ask you, because you mentioned refugees also, and I wanted to ask, and, because this is a matter very sensitive to me. Have you worked in uh, refugee camps with placemaking? Because this is a place that it comes, placemaking is spontaneously happening. So do, yeah. do you have any, I would love to connect to you, with you about this issue, to be honest, uh, maybe yeah. later, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 mean, I wouldn't say I'm an expert in that topic, but I, I yeah. we, we're, there's a lot of people around the world that are working on refugee placemaking that we, yep. we're learning a lot from. Um, actually, and my, my wife is one, my wife works with the International okay. Rescue Committee on on, right. on placemaking with um, with refugees as well in the, in the US, um, mm -hmm. connecting urban agriculture and uh, refugees with agricultural experience and, and markets. They set and but again, it's the social capital building, the social integration that that it enables that's so valuable for the refugees. Um, but but I but you know I had one of the examples is I, I worked in um, actually in Israel uh, in an area that was um, one of the was dominated by Sudanese refugees, mm -hmm. and we simply interviewed. The refugees, the, the city architect had never talked to them, even though it was perceived as one of the biggest problems in the city. And these yeah. Sudanese refugees, you know, they were perceived as loiterers, you know, had great ideas, you know, were yeah. open to any feedback, um, you know, were, uh, it was it was a wonderful constructive conversation. And um, so obviously, you know, refugees have bring with them great, you know, values. And, you know, it, it, we do have to respect tourists of all kinds and, and especially refugees for what they, you know, what assets and knowledge they can bring to, co to okay. communities and, um, and uh, you know, challenge them and support them to, uh, to be co-creators of a space, to add to a space, to not dominate, um, to not privatize. You know, we don't want any user group to privatize space. We want oh. to lead with public values and, and actions that contribute to each other's experience in, in a space. Uh, obviously people need private homes and such. You need a full spectrum of public to private experiences, but we're talking about leading with the most public spaces that are most welcoming to all um, as ways to enable, um, you know, everyone's yeah. welcoming and availability and oh, viability sure. in, a, in a space. Um, but yeah, that's, I, you know, I'd love to explore that. I know, you Definitely. know, there's a lot of creativity in Greece. Um, I have a friend, Mike Zuckerman, that's been working with with refugees in, um, and I know, and I know Vivian Dumpa also has been working yeah. in Thessaloniki and others. Um, so I'd love to learn more about that and and connect those conversations more globally. With Placemaking X, we're trying to connect, um, create, create sort of leadership groups on different topics. So placemaking mm -hmm. in tourism, placemaking in refugees, placemaking in indigenous knowledge. You know, they're, they're trying to get the people that are most leading on this around the world yeah. to connect and create collective agendas 
um, messaging on, on these topics. Perfect. Yeah, we'll, we'll be in to contact. We'll be in yeah. contact. I can definitely share my findings on this topic with you and with awesome. Vivian. Yeah. yeah. Terrific. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, I don't know if there are any other questions by from the public uh, or from uh, the rest of the speakers who are still with us. Um, <coughs> it has been uh, otherwise, uh, yeah, it has been a great uh, presentation and all the presentations that we have actually watched uh, today. So we really thank you, Ethan, for being with us once again. And um, if there are no more questions, then maybe we can proceed with conclusions. Uh, yes, what do you think? Yeah. Um, yes, absolutely. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, Ethan. I mean, we'll try to uh, to uh, take your uh, your uh, ideas and suggestions and see if we can uh, do something actually in Greece and uh, maybe in Israel as well. We can. Uh, it's definitely intriguing and uh, and there's a lot of potential there for interventions. I mean, you probably <laughs> you, you you were probably. Uh, uh, you saw that in Israel, actually, public participation is very developed. I mean, Israel is a very opinionated, and I want to make sure everybody knows about it. <laughs> but yeah. uh, you're right about the refugee community. They, now they're opening up, actually. The uh, uh, Southern Tel Aviv is uh, really doing a lot of uh, work with them, a lot of work. Interesting. So oh. it's been changing. Oh, good, good. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, we have a great yeah. network of, of placemakers in around Israel, and um, you know, there's a real learning network. You know, I've been a couple times there, uh, and then, you know, and then, you know, separately, we also have a there's an Amakin placemaking network, which is placemaking network for the Arab world. Um, you know, are active in in Lebanon and all, you know, all over. Um, so, and they, you know, are very interested in the refugee placemaking conversation as well from from the, the those communities. You know, Lebanon obviously is dealing with refugees themselves. Um, and how to integrate them into cities. It's a huge percentage of the population there. Um, so yeah, we'd we'll love to, to network that conversation in that in that part of the world if, if we could. Fantastic. Sure. Great. So shall we uh, try to wrap it up? Yeah. <laughs> wow, it's been, a, it's been a very intense day. <laughs> very intense and interesting day. Uh, I took down some notes actually as as we went along, and I think there's certain points that I would take with me. So I, I will share them so that if somebody would like to take some notes, um, first of all about tourism and regenerative tourism and how uh, we can bring a, or we can maintain public value in space uh, and not uh, give space to uh, private interests so that people can still be part of the public space and and also influence the public space in positive ways, of course. Uh, then we have um, Malua Thing spoke a lot about uh, people movement, uh, whether internally or externally from Italy to, to uh, Africa, and how does architecture actually come into this uh, equation, which may often be very violent and very exploitive. exploitive. Um, um, we spoke about indoor and outdoor or spaces and about happiness in, in architecture, which I think it's something that we don't like to speak about a lot. It was, it came up also in the lecture of uh, Ethan and in other lectures about loving space and, and about happy space and people being happy in a space. And uh, we, these are almost the taboo words for architects who like to speak in more sort of higher terms, but I think these are important words to to, to mention in, in, in a discussion about architecture. Um, then we have the um, ethical responsibility of architecture. And uh, that was uh, when Enrique spoke about social uh, design and social architecture where students are actually trying to find solutions in their own community, which is also something that I heard from uh, Hassan Fatri back, back in the nineties, uh, where uh, uh, he spoke and he wrote a lot about uh, how uh, communities and architects can work in their own communities before they start looking outside. Um, then uh, Arthur uh, brought us uh, to different places in the desert, in the in the space, and through parametric uh, design and production, which uh, like producing energy locally, the same way we can uh, basically transfer uh, code and knowledge 
instead of trans, uh, transporting materials, and then materials can be created locally or produced or printed or however. Uh, Emese uh, spoke about how uh, uh, innovation can actually lead uh, processes in reducing waste, in about making things more fun and more game-like, and so people can get more activated and involved. And I like this idea of people be, not being, and this also connects with Ethan's lecture about tourism, about tourists, that they're not only consumers of tourism, but they're actually becoming more active participants in the making of the place. And, and I think that's a great lesson to remember. And, and of course, uh, little architects uh, started out with uh, learning spaces and about uh, how schools can uh, function indoors or outdoors and how those two can actually connect, not only when crisis happens, but in, in everyday functioning of those uh, institutions that uh, children can experience outdoors sometimes with very simple means. Um, the, uh, the public space can be also inviting and safe for kids um, with very simple means sometimes. Um, this, these are more or less the things that I wrote down. That's been, I don't know if you want to add something. <laughs> There's so, so many ideas in one day. Um. I think no, it's. Uh, I think I, I wouldn't add anything uh, further because exactly there were so many ideas. So I think everyone needs a bit of time to process everything. Uh, just I, I would like to thank uh, once again all of our speakers and uh, all of you being with us the whole day, our partners and uh, our media partners, and of course uh, the, the Echo Week team for making this event happen. Uh, I know now that some of the tutors have uh, asked from. Uh, uh, the students to meet with them uh, this evening so they can start uh, coordinating and working uh, together uh, with the workshop topic. So uh, please uh, follow the, your tutor instructions and uh, uh, the meeting, meeting hours that uh, your tutor has suggested. And um, we're really, really looking forward to the wor workshops tomorrow with uh, Vivian, Iris, uh, Fotonik Theodora, Little Architects, and a message, and uh, you are free to join us in the institute events in case you are in Aegina. Um, and uh, the lectures are going to be available, they, they've been live streamed on YouTube, uh, so they have been recorded, and we will share uh, the link with you, so you can also have it for your archive along with some photographs. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much, it was a great session. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Vespina. Thank you to our speakers and uh, everybody who joined us from near and far. I don't know if the Chinese uh, attendance is still uh, <laughs> still awake or sleeping already. <laughs> Actually, it's not that late. It's uh, it's about nine o'clock and no ten o'clock in China, so it's okay. Um, so tomorrow the workshops start. Uh, we will uh, be visiting some of the workshops to see how you're doing, if you have any needs or any questions or technical issues, etc. cetera. Uh, connect directly with your workshop leaders, with your groups, uh, have fun for the rest of the week, enjoy the workshops, make the most out of them and uh, try to learn from each other and uh, share knowledge, ideas, skills, etc. cetera. Um, make the most out of it. And uh, we'll uh, be together again. Um, tonight in Egina, Friday in Egina, and Saturday morning for the workshop presentations. That's it. Thank you all very much. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs>